coming to our last day of the second GCC conference, I would like to welcome you to an exciting set of lectures and research sessions today. Our first lecture would be on updates of catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome, and then it would be followed by a research session on systemic lupus, where colleagues from the GCC will be presenting their oral research presentations. This would be followed by another exciting session on updates in COVID and rheumatic disease as a lecture. And then later on, this would be followed by a research session in COVID and its research in the GCC. And then we'll move on to another exciting session where we'll have a lecture that would uh, cover updates of ANCA vasculitis, current treatment and management. This would be followed by research session with oral presentations. And then another session uh, would be an exciting session about updates in systemic sclerosis ILD. This session would be followed by a research session where colleagues from the Gulf will present the research in connective tissue disease. We'll end up a day with an exciting lecture on pregnancy and rheumatic disease. And then we'll end up the conference with its closing ceremony, as well as we'll announce awards. Thank you so much for attending the second GCC Rheumatology Conference, and I hope you a lot of excitement to come. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome to the third day of the second GCC conference. And uh, I think I would like uh, to say it's very uh, great to have all of you as uh, speaker and delegates. Uh, today, in, we will start with uh, Prof. Mundar Hamashta. I don't think how much he needs introduction to all of us. Uh, probably he's known to all of us. Uh, Prof. Hamashta is recently retired. He was a professor, consultant physician, and director of the Lubas Research at St. Thomas Hospital. He joined the Lubas UK 30 years ago, and he was very instrumental in developing uh, the Lubas unit to be received, uh, uh, to be received recognition in UK and internationally as well, because at least I know many of our patients from the GCC they used to visit him there. He took sabbatical leave in May 2015 to April 2019, sitting with the Lubas surface in Dubai Hospital, uh, which I would say, uh, which I would say, congratulate to them. He joined GSK as global medical expert in 2020. He published extensively in basically huge syndrome, Lubas, and related uh, disease in more than 700 papers. He served editorial board in many journals, Lubas, Clinical and Experimental Rheumatology and Nature Review, uh, sorry, and Current Rheumatology Review. He's a founding member of the Lubas Academy and he received several international awards for his work, including the European, the ULAR, and also the, uh, the ILAR. I think uh, I would uh, leave the floor uh, for uh, Prof. Hamashta to entertain us about what is the latest on catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome? Brief, please, Munder. The floor. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I am delighted to address the Oman Society of Rheumatology Congress 2022. Sorry, we couldn't make it uh, face to face and has to be virtual because of the Omicron. 
I am Professor Mundur Kamashta. I used to work in England, as you know, for many years in the Lipus unit. And since about two years ago, I joined GSK as a medical expert in Lipus. And this is my, like, declare my conflict of interest. The organizers asked me to update you about the best clinical practice in practices in managing a patient with, with anti catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome. It's a very rare complication of antiphospholipid syndrome, but once you see a case, you will never forget that because it's a dramatic. And the catastrophic comes from there because the manifestations are really, really severe. And most of these patients end up in intensive care. And unfortunately, about one third of these patients will die in a very short period of time. And this is the, the quote was given by Professor uh, Ron Asherson, late Ron Asherson, when he was working with us in London, that he observed a small number of patients, very small number, they have catastrophic presentation, i.e. very acute manifestations of severe thrombosis uh, at different levels in a very short period of time. And we choose to call it catastrophic because of uh, to to give uh, you know the uh, the 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 physician to act quickly because if you don't act quickly in this situation uh, the patient will die in a space of one week and this is where I think uh, collecting the first fifty patients between 1992 and 1998 showed evidence that this syndrome require an emergency uh, attention and most of these patients end up in intensive care. Fortunately, the syndrome is extremely rare. In our collection of patients across Europe, uh, with 1,000 patients that we followed up for more than 10 years, only eight patients have catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome, so less than 1%, which is fortunate because this syndrome, if it was more frequent than that, that, than that would be really, really catastrophic because you'll see later most of these patients end up in intensive care and many of them would die. This is a, a manifestation. This is a, a patient with, uh, with, with catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome. And as you can see, the, 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 the organs involved in the skin, the, 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 the heart, the brain, the kidney are involved in a very short period of time. And these patients end up in intensive care. And as I said before, many of them dying. But the major factor in this catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome is microthrombosis, thrombotic microangiopathy. And this is characteristic of this syndrome to distinguish it from the classic antiphospholipid syndrome, which is mainly a large vessel disease, deep vein thrombosis, stroke, heart attacks, and so on. So in about uh, 20 years back, we decided in one of the international meeting to have a consensus, you know, based in, in, in observation more than anything else, between the experts, how we classify these patients as catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome. And as you can see, we agreed to be a definite catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome. You have at least to have three organs involved. The manifestation should occur in a very short period of time, less than one week. The histopathology of small vessel disease, which is characteristic of this syndrome in at least one organ, and the confirmation of the presence of antiphospholipid antibodies. If you have these four criteria, they are, you are classified of definite antiphospholipid syndrome. However, you have probable antiphospholipid syndrome if you have one, two, and four, i.e. without histology, because many of these patients, they don't have time, we don't have time to carry on histology, for these patients, or one, three, and four, providing that the manifestation occur despite anticoagulation in less than one month. So that, that these are agreed classification criteria for the diagnosis, quick diagnosis of antiphospholipid syndrome. This criteria has been validated as well by Cervera and his group in Barcelona, who is leading this uh, part of medicine. He published it extensively in, in, in the syndrome and his real leader in this uh, um, picture of the antiphospholipid syndrome. He has collected more than 500 patients, which I show you a little bit later, his registry. And as a record with the, with the number of 147 patients, he was able 
to show that these classification criteria we established for this syndrome are sensitive enough and quite specific. Specificity was 100%. As I mentioned, Ricardo Cervera in a hospital clinic in Barcelona, he is controlling this registry. is an open registry for, for any, any, any doctor around the world to come to the internet, go to open to this web page and include patients. And this is the only way to learn about this disease. And so far, he has more than 500 patients with this syndrome from around the world. And I, when you asked me to, <clears throat> to brief you about the syndrome, I contacted Ricard for the latest update about his registry. And I'm going to share with you some data before we go into treatment. So as you can see with more than 100, 500 patients already in the registry, the age is about average age, the mean age is about 38 years. But we have you know, young children with the disease and very elderly with the disease as well, for, ranging from 7 to 74. The majority of the patients, of these five, more than 500 patients in the registry, are females, but one third of the patients are males. If you look at the underlying disease, you know, about 46% of the patients have primary form of the syndrome, primary antiphosphatase syndrome. About 42% have lupus associated with you know, underlying disease and uh, uh, about 8% have other conditions including rheumatoid arthritis, scleroderma and lupus-like illness. When you look at the previous manifestation before they have the catastrophic APS, only 20% have deep vein thrombosis, about 14% have obstetric manifestation and 13% have thrombocytopenia and uh, less than 10% have cerebral vascular disease. Please note that mean, in other words, 53% of the patient with catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome known to have medical problems with, related to APS. But the other 47, the catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome was the presentation of the disease. Please bear this into account. Could be the first manifestation of that patient is Catastrophe, catastrophic manifestation in less than one week, you have thrombosis at different levels and different organs. This is the first important message from this registry. Second, many patients have precipitating factors and the most important precipitating factor in catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome are infections. 20% preceded the onset of, of manifestation to suggest catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome have mild infections sometimes, just chest or urine tract infection, and other times much more severe infections. Surgery. Surgery, sometimes you have to stop anticoagulation, and this might be the reason for clicking the manifestation of antiphospholipid syndrome. Or, or neoplasm, the, the, the cancer, the patient developing cancer might be the trigger for antiphospholipid syndrome as well. Please note, we have trigger in about 58 to 60% of the patients, but in about 40% of the patients, there is no clear trigger to precipitate clinical manifestation to suggest catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome. But bear in mind that infection is the most important trigger. What are the clinical manifestations of these, uh, this large cohort of patients, more than 500? 70% have renal manifestations. The most frequent organ involved is renal, followed by lung and followed by cerebral. So the brain, the lungs and, uh, and, and, the, and the renal system are the three organ more, most involved. But the heart also is involved in catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome in 50% of the time. So heart, lungs, brain and renal are the four organs as a target of catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome. When you look at the antibodies, the most frequently found in these patients, usually high levels of anticardiolipin IgG. IgM in, in less, half of the patient have IgM, and about three quarters of the patient have lupus anticoagulant positive. Triple positive, what we call triple positive, beta-2 glycoprotein-1 positive, cardiolipin positive, and lupus anticoagulant positive is about 50% of the patients. What about hematological manifestations? 
So thrombocytopenia, about two thirds of the patients have thrombocytopenia. Autoimmune hemolytic anemia, about one third of the patients. And uh, DIC, about 20% uh, of the patients. Thrombotic microangiopathy th uh, is about 12% of the patients. And that take us to the differential diagnosis. And this is as, 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 as an art more than anything else and skill, because really these manifestations overlap. TTP, uh, uh, hemolytic economic syndrome, help in pregnancy and after pregnancy, and catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome. You know, the manifestations are quite similar, although there is some distinguishing factors. For example, ADAMS-13 activity, you expect it to be very, very low in TTP. It's, it's, it's not known in the catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome, but occasionally you might find it low as well. So it's very difficult to use that as a unique marker. The thrombocytopenia is common in TTP, but is very common as well in the catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome. When it comes to therapy, you will see later, anticoagulation steroid, plexma exchange, and IVIG all have been uh, used as, uh, as a useful, have been shown as a useful treatment in this condition. And the value of these measures in the different situation is not that, that clear other than plasma exchange in all of them. So when it comes to CNS involvement, for example, you expect it to happen in TTP and catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome, but not in the other two, and, and so on. So the differential diagnosis is not always clear, but we are lucky, for example, plasma exchange, when you are in doubt, is useful for all of these situations. When we looked at these 500 patients, how they were treated, how the treating physician, this is not a randomized control trial, this is a registry, and was obviously up to the physician who was treating these patients to decide how to treat these patients. So 84% of patients classified as catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome, they received initially heparin, and that was followed by uh, oral anticoagulants with comedin. 80% received steroids, some, some of them very high dose, intravenous steroids, cyclophosphamide about one third, and plasma exchange in 20%. IVIG was again around 19, 20%. This is when analyzing the whole registry. Now, when you look at those patients who survived and those patients who recovered, they are lucky to recover from catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome. Originally, recovery rate was only 50%, i.e. one in two chance to die with this in less than a week. And now, you, when you analyze it clearly, you show that if you combine oral anticoagulant, steroid, plasma exchange, or IVIG, 70% of the patients recover, only die 30%. And this is why this combination or triple treatment is now considered, considered the standard of care in patients suspected to have catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome, because the chance of survival with this combination is much higher of any of these treatments in isolation. So when you treat or when, when you think your patient have catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome, you have to treat at three levels. Level A, level A is anticoagulation because you have storm of clotting problems at different organs at the same time. There is as well cytokine storm and this cytokine storm with, you treat with high dose steroids, usually pulse steroids, followed by oral steroids and obviously the plasma exchange or intravenous immunoglobulin to treat the culprit, which is the antiphospholipid antibodies that we think they are the culprit of this syndrome. And this is where that triple therapy is quite important here to tackle these three elements at the same time. As I mentioned before, uh, the mortality in the early, uh, late 90s was one in two. 50% of patients with catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome, they're going to die. But we, when we look over the years, because we have been following this over years, the mortality now improved over the last 20 years. And what's the major factor of the improvement of mortality? Now, mortality only one third. Instead of 50%, only one third of the patient die with catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome. And 
the evidence uh, analyzing the data, and this has been published by Ricard Cervera and his group, showing that triple therapy in, was the reason for reducing in mortality more than 45%. And triple therapy is the only factor and the quick diagnosis, obviously, and establishing this kind of triple therapy was the only factor behind this improvement. And this was, you know, that this has become the standard of care. Frequent question comes to mind that family of that patients who are lucky to survive or uh, the doctors who are treating this patient, what's the chance for this patient to have recurrent catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome? In our experience, with this registry is very, very, very low. And the majority of patients with catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome are followed up in long term with more than two thirds have symptom free and lucky to survive it. Obviously with treatment, with anticoagulation in the long term, they remain symptom free. Small number of patients might have recurrent thrombosis, but the risk is low because they have intense anticoagulation, but Catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome, recurrent catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome, quiet and usual, which is very good news with a follow up for around six years in this publication. Now, do we have evidence based medicine? Until here, everything what I told you is eminence based, is expert opinion, and nothing based in literature review, a intense, a, you know, scrutiny and agreement between experts with voting system like you usually do for evidence-based medicine. Ricardo Cervera and his group and our group obviously with, with, with our support, we managed to achieve international grants from the European community to form a working group with the support of many people, including the great um, with a, a McMaster University and we managed to establish guidelines. And this is to show you, we had a meeting, full day meeting to discuss the catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome it was in Barcelona. And we decided to review in depth the literature and apply the evidence-based uh, medicine, trying to come up with, 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 with some suggestions about the syndrome to see if they divert from what we have been doing over the last few years. We published that. As you can see, in about uh, three years back, in uh, journal thrombosis and hemostasis, and these are our conclusions. There is not diverted very much from what we have been doing. For patients suspecting of having caps, the panel suggests using the preliminary criteria for classification of catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome for diagnosis of caps. As you, as I told you, we established these classification criteria about 20 years ago. And after review and evidence-based medicine review, we didn't divert from these criteria at all. For first-line treatment of patients with CAPS, the panel suggested combination therapy with glucocorticosteroids, heparin and plasma pharesis, or IVIG over a single agent or other combination of therapies. So again, this is what we have been producing, what we have been doing, and we showed over the years by applying the stripper therapy you might minimize the death due to catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome. When you look at the strength of recommendation, this obviously is very, very poor, because we don't have major studies. We have anecdotal publication, and we have to accept that. This is what we have, and the grade of recommendation is very poor. When we came to the EULAR as well, the EULAR, we have a, a big, big review of management of antiphospholipid syndrome in general, and we have small, uh, paragraph as well about catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome. Again, uh, it's an emphasized the importance of treating infection in these patients quickly and to be careful when you reduce the INR as recommended by, because of uh, procedure or whatever, this might trigger the antiphospholipid syndrome. And also, again, uh, some recommendation about those who have uh, refractory or symptoms despite treatment uh, what to use, and they suggested rituximab or ecolizumab. Ecolizumab is extremely expensive drug. We wanted to do a randomized control trial using ecolizumab, but we faced problem with recruitment and the trial ceased and stopped prematurely, unfortunately. We started the trial, but we lack of patients. We had to stop, but it's very 
good treatment, quite expensive. Rituximab again is if 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 you have uh, no response to the standard of care, which is the usual triple therapy, heparin followed by uh, warfarin, steroids, and IVIG, you might consider that uh, or plasma exchange. Obviously, you might consider that in a very uh, uh, anecdotal cases that you don't respond. Most patients in our experience respond to the first line therapy. This is my summary and my slide, my last slide. I shared with you our experience with more than 500 patients with catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome registered so far. What they have in common, acute onset, multiple vascular thrombosis, less than one week. The most organ involved are kidney, lungs, and brain. Usually they have high titer of anticardiolipin antibodies and usually lupus anticoagulant positive and more than 50% of the patient have triple positivity. 20% of the patient have precipitating factors uh, as infection, and this is important to tackle infection. Don't ignore infection in patients with antiphospholipid syndrome because these patients might uh, develop uh, catastrophic manifestations. Prognosis has improved, still poor. Obviously, we lose one third of the patients, but improved compared to to previously um, with, uh, with no guidelines about treatment. Therapy, long-term anticoagulation with intensity of anticoagulation, I would suggest around three. Steroids, plasma exchange in acute phase, including uh, and or IVIG. In very difficult cases to treat, you might try rituximab and if you have a lot of money, eclusimab will be a fantastic drug to try but obviously extremely expensive drug. Thank you very much, and I will be happy to take any question you might have. Good morning again uh, for people who joined us late. Uh, we will leave the question and answer uh, for the four speakers at the end of uh, the session of the LUBAS, uh, so we can have more of a uh, bigger discussion. And I think we will proceed with our next speaker. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Nasra al -Adubi. She is a consultant rheumatologist and head of the rheumatology unit at the Royal Hospital uh, Muscat. She graduated from Sultan Qaboos University College of Medicine, and she did her internal medicine residency training at the Oman Medical Specialty Board. Uh, she went to Royal London and parts, and she did her fellowship in rheumatology there. And she worked there and she did as well a certification in musculoskeletal ultrasound. She has special interest in connective tissue disease and specifically in systemic low arrhythmias. She's a member of the National and International uh, Medical and Rheumatological Society and she has several publications in dermatology. Uh, Dr. Nasra, she will give us her experience today about lupus in Oman, our uh, cohort. And uh, please, Dr. Nasra, the floor is yours. 
Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thanks for the introduction and thanks for the organizer to invite uh, me to share with you the result of our uh, Oman Lupus uh, study. I have uh, no disclosure. As all of you know that uh, lupus is a multi-systemic uh, disease and it can be associated with significant morbidity and uh, mortality. And actually the incidence and prevalence of lupus varies, I mean, according to where the patient uh, stay and according to their geographical uh, distribution. There is several uh, study about the clinical and serological uh, features of lupus worldwide and uh, in uh, Arab uh, country. But uh, unfortunately in Oman, we had really very limited uh, data about uh, this. Therefore, we aimed to do this uh, study in order to know the nature and the characteristic of our patient in Oman. Uh, the importance of this study that it is the first multi-center uh, study in the region and uh, we aim to know the prevalence of uh, lupus and the mortality and survival rate uh, of lupus population in uh, Oman. We hope to do this so that we can get a better understanding of our uh, patient and we wanted uh, uh, to compare our outcomes in comparison to other uh, international uh, data. So what we did, we collect all the data of uh, all adult and uh, pediatric uh, patients who fulfill either the ACR uh, 1997 criteria or the SLIC uh, criteria. And we collected the data from 2006 till February 2020. What we got from the study, we have found that uh, as it is expected that there is a female predominance of uh, seven uh, to one. And we have found that uh, the mean age group is around uh, 33 and uh, around almost 33% of our patient came from Muscat region. And this is expected because Muscat is our uh, capital and it is heavily populated uh, with uh, people. And we had around almost 42 uh, coming from all different other regions from Oman. The second region that was also, I mean, he uh, heavily, I mean, uh, populated with lupus patient, Al Batna. Again, this is just reflect a population distribution rather than any other uh, factor. And this is the table that is showing the patient characteristic. I don't want you to strain your eyes and try to see what is there. I'm going to share with you uh, uh, all the important findings that uh, uh, we have found in the coming uh, slides. So as I have told you that we have found a rate of seven to one uh, between female and uh, male. This is usually, I mean, not the expected rate. Uh, the expected rate is usually nine to one, but we are not the only cohort that we have found this uh, uh, ratio. There is several other cohort they have found similar uh, ratio. And uh, actually there is some cohort like the one in uh, Brazil, the, I mean, uh, the percentage of uh, uh, male patient to have uh, lupus was around almost uh, 33%. Uh, and we have found a prevalence uh, rate of around 38. This is an average, but you could see here that uh, uh, for a pediatric uh, age group, it was just around uh, five. And when they are reaching adolescence, I mean, the prevalence jumped to 31. And as it can be uh, seen and expected that the highest uh, prevalence was between uh, the age group 30 to 49, in which the prevalence here was around 63 per 100,000 uh, uh, inhabitants. Uh, in addition of that, we had a good number of uh, lupus uh, patient in uh, uh, elderly uh, patient who are above uh, 50 years, in which here the prevalence was around uh, 39. Uh, we have compared our data with the data from uh, nearby uh, country in the GCC, and we have found that uh, a paper coming from Saudi Arabia, they got a prevalence of 19, and another one from uh, UAE, they have recorded a prevalence of 103. And uh, a recent data, which was uh, published coming from Egypt, they have reported a prevalence of around uh, six. Our prevalence was more or less like uh, Western countries in which it was in that uh, uh, 
range. Uh, and uh, actually, one of the countries that had the highest prevalence, uh, prevalence rate of lupus was Spain, in which they have reported almost around 210 per, uh, per 100,000 inhabitants. Now we will go on to the most important uh, other finding that uh, we got. We have found that our patient, uh, I mean, didn't have uh, uh, a high uh, frequency of uh, getting discoid rash. We found it to be only in 8% uh, of the patient. This is in comparison to a report, for example, published by Marwan et al., in which they have found a rate uh, I mean, ranging between 2.5 to 20 with an average rate of, of around uh, uh, 12.7. Uh, Another finding is regarding the anti row antibodies. We reported it in only 39% of our patient, but reports coming from uh, Saudi Arabia. Arabia and the UAE, they have reported a higher percentage of anti uh, antibodies, I mean, around 53 to 55%. Uh, now, coming to another point, an interesting point, it is which is about the overlapping syndrome. We have found that uh, rheumatoid arthritis and Sjogren are the commonest overlap uh, disease. And we had a scleroderma overlapping with SLE in around 22% of uh, the patient. But I mean, this group, I mean, of patient, uh, I mean, who are having scleroderma overlapping with the uh, lupus, we have found them to have a higher mortality rate. And it, it gave a significant rate of P-score of 0 0.002. Uh, same thing, I mean, there was a cohort uh, studied by uh, Al Harbi et al. They have uh, reported scleroderma in around 6.8% of uh, lupus patients. So our cohort had actually higher uh, frequency of having uh, an overlap with scleroderma. Now, coming to uh, the mortality uh, rate, usually lupus patients uh, worldwide reported to have a, a mortality rate ranging between 1.4 to 5. Uh, percent. We had a mortality rate of around uh, 5 percent, and we have found that our cohort, uh, I mean, had uh, 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 several factors which are associated with this, uh, with, with having actually a mortality rate, and the commonest causes were mainly sepsis to start uh, with, and followed by renal, lung, neurological, and cardiovascular uh, disease. Another interesting finding that we have found our male patient had a higher mortality rate uh, rather than uh, female. And uh, we have explained this because we have found in our cohort that male patient had higher uh, organ, uh, internal organ involvement in comparison uh, to female. So they had a higher renal cardiovascular, pulmonary, and spleen and liver uh, infarction. In addition to that, our male patient had a higher uh, uh, significant uh, association with the antiphospholipid antibody, especially beta-2 glycoprotein and the uh, lupus anticoagulant. Uh, 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 moving on to the survival rate. Uh, so survival rate had improved throughout uh, the year. I mean, from uh, early 19s, in which the survival rate was just around 60 to 90 to late now, uh, 20th century, in which the survival rate had improved even to uh, a higher percentage, reaching 97%. Uh, and all this because of the uh, improvement in the care of lupus patient and uh, the new uh, modality of treatment that we are having for this uh, disease. So we have found that our five-year survival rate was around uh, almost 100. We have compared it to other cohort from UAE, UAE and uh, Saudi Arabia, in which uh, UAE they had 94 and Saudi Arabia 92. This is, doesn't uh, say anything that we are treating patients better than uh, those other countries, but it just showing that I mean, the time where the study was done, we, the, our study is a recent one, and those study were done before, I mean, far before our study. And we know that while the time is going on, we have a better treatment for SLE, so we are expecting to have a better survival uh, rate. We were able to, call, uh, uh, to calculate uh, a 40-year survival rate in this uh, cohort, and we found it to be uh, 90%. And uh, for the 20 years, it was 
was almost 99 percent so this that actually for us it was really re uh, assuring that uh, now we are having a better survival rate in comparison uh, to uh, before this uh, Kaplan Mia survival uh, showing us we have compared patient with positive ANA, our lupus patient with positive ANA, and our lupus patient with negative uh, ANA. And we have seen actually that a patient with negative uh, ANA had a slightly lower survival rate in comparison to patient with positive uh, ANA. And uh, this probably may be explained that patient with negative ANA, probably they are presenting uh, uh, late to our uh, uh, health service. And another thing that usually uh, till they are diagnosed to have lupus, since the ANA is uh, negative, probably they have several uh, internal organ involvement. Further study need to, to clarify uh, this uh, point, and we have, uh, uh, I mean, to take this study, the Oman lupus study, as a, our uh, baseline, and we will move on and do uh, more study in this uh, group. So this is, in general, what I wanted to share you, the most important uh, point regarding uh, this uh, study, that actually really had helped us to know the prevalence of uh, this disease. It gave us the mortality uh, rate, and it had shown us some special characteristic of the, uh, this patient, uh, and some of them that I have told you that our male had a higher mortality rate, and uh, the overlap with the systemic sclerosis had a significant uh, uh, death in comparison to, uh, to other overlap, and uh, the 40 years uh, survival rate in our lupus patient was reaching up to 90%, uh, percent, and and the last point that I have already told you that our negative ANA had a slightly lower survival uh, rate. I hope that was uh, really clear for you. And uh, we will be there later on to answer if you have any uh, query or any question. Thank you very much for uh, listening to me. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. in Prince Sultan Military Medical City in Riyadh. Uh, he's Deputy Director of uh, Rheumatology Fellowship Program and Supervisor of Academic uh, Activities in the Department of Rheumatology. He is the active researcher and has a number of publications. Uh, Dr. Mufaddal will present uh, on just to get the slides right. Um, um,
Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. I'm very happy to be here with you today. I wish we could have physically have done it in Muscat, but uh, um, hopefully we get better luck next time and hope everyone is safe. So I would present an abstract for our study about the outcome of rituximab therapy in patients with systemic lupus erythematosus. My name is Mufaddal al Aythan. I am a rheumatology consultant from Prince Sultan Military Medical City in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. So a bit of introduction. Um, SLE, as we know, is a multi-system autoimmune disease with variable manifestations and uh, uh, as we call it the 1000 phase disease. Now, multiple immune dysregulations have been described extensively in the literature, including abnormalities in B cells. Now, B cell depletion therapy has been a very interesting target throughout time, and large trials have failed to meet their primary endpoints. Despite that, multiple small cohorts and uh, studies have shown positive evidence, along with the positive evidence uh, that we anecdotally get from ourselves and colleagues. So we aim in our study to discover the response to rituximab in the Saudi patients with SLE. So what we've done is we looked into patients diagnosed with SLE between January 2004 till July 2020, and we've included two large centers in Saudi Arabia, that is Prince Sultan Military Medical City in Riyadh and King Faisal Specialist Hospital in Jeddah. So this was a retrospective descriptive study in design that, and we've included patients who had fulfilled the slick criteria for SLE and had received rituximab at the discretion of their primary rheumatologist for SLE. So uh, data regarding the activity had to be available for the patients. So we could, so we've looked into this lead eye, the double trans, the complement C3 and C4. We also assessed the, the uh, CBC, creatinine, and uh, we looked into these at baseline three, six, and 12 months post rituximab. We also looked into the 24-hour urine protein at baseline and 12 months, and we assessed the steroid dose at baseline and six and 12 months as well post rituximab. So we had a total of 40 patients that have been included in our study and 85% of these patients were females and only 15% were males, which is consistent with international cohorts. Now, the mean age in years was 39 years and the mean age at diagnosis was 29 years. So on average, these patients spent about 10 years uh, 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 with, with with their disease. Now, 70% uh, of these patients had skin rash and a, over 80% had arthritis and uh, over 60% did not have alopecia at diagnosis. So we have a multiple indications for which they have uh, received a rituximab and uh, the, a, we have a total of 37.5% of the patients received it for lupus nephritis and this can, uh, is a, a total of 15 patients. Now 40 patients or 40, sorry, 40% 40 of the patients had arthritis and the rest, as you can see, we do have multiple uh, uh, um, or heterogeneity with different indications for rituximab in our patient's population. Now, looking into the nephritis uh, uh, patients, we have uh, class four uh, patients with lupus nephritis, class four or class four overlapping with five was the most common uh, indication for nephritis. This is followed by patients without a biopsy receiving rituximab for nephritis and uh, then patients with class three over and class three overlapped with class five. 
Now, we look into the results and we see patients had a significant improvement in their sleep eye score with a median baseline value of nine that improved to four and two at six and 12 months respectively, and p-value was greatly significant. Now, when we look at the DNA binding or the anti-double strand antibody titer, we see a, an improvement from over 600 to around 250 and then 180 at six and 12 months uh, respectively with a significant p-value. Again, we see a significant improvements in the complement C3 and C level comparing baseline to 6 and 12 months values with a significant p-value. And we see again a significant reduction of their steroid dose from a baseline median of 10 milligrams of prednisone or equivalent to a 6 and 12 months, uh, 5 and 5 milligrams respectively with a very significant uh, p-value. Now, the creatinine level, we didn't include it here, but it was not associated with a significant improvement. The 24-hour urine protein had a baseline median value of 1.47, and it improved significantly at 12 months to 0.24, with p-value also statistically significant. Here, I would like to comment that we have done a subgroup analysis for patients that had received rituximab for lupus nephritis as an indication because the other patients had normal proteinuria at baseline. So we see a graphic present representation of our results and we see on top two uh, a significant uh, uh, upward trend of the complement C3 and C4 level after the treatment and uh, we see at the, the top right uh, a significant reduction of the double strand DNA titer from baseline to six and 12 months. We see the majority of the effect happened at six months on uh, actually. Now we see a significant reduction in the SLE dye score and the big part of it happened at six months as well as a significant steroid sparing effect and the big part of it also happened from baseline to six Six months with a, a, a significant improvement in the baseline to 12 months levels of proteinuria. Now, in terms of safety, we have assessed the uh, culture results and we found 78 uh, blood cultures in total, 15 urine cultures and 38 sputum cultures, and out of which 12% were positive for the blood cultures, 13% positive urine cultures and 26% positive sputum cultures. One patient had a stool positive for C. diff, and one patient had a COVID-19 positive swab. Now, only one patient had severe allergic reactions. We had two other patients that had mild to moderate reactions that did not interfere with the treatment. Now, in conclusion, rituximab seems to be effective in our patients with SLE. It was effective in reducing the double strands, improving the slick score, the SLEE dye score, and it was effective in reducing the proteinuria. Now, there seems to be no significant effect on the renal function. However, majority of our patients had normal renal functions to start with. Now, our analysis for infections might be limited because we have looked into the cultures, uh, whereas the outpa outpatient uh, uh, infections or infections that have been treated as an outpatient were uh, probably had not uh, 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 culture results uh, for these patients because of the milder nature of such infections. We see in our patients a good steroid sparing effect, and we recommend that larger trials to be uh, uh, um, carried out to further qualify the effect and the population of patients that could benefit from such therapy. With that, I conclude and thank you very much. Nice. Uh...
presentation for the abstract, and I think we're going to stimulate a lot of discussion uh, with Rotiximab and the, its role in lupus. We keep the discussion later. I encourage the audience, please put your questions related to the subject in the platform, and we'll take it there. Now we're moving to the next speaker, Dr. Hajar Azuhari. She's a consultant uh, and a fellow in rheumatology in Imam Abdurrahman Ben Faisal University Hospital Riyadh. Um, she will talk about um, an abstract on virtual versus actual clinical assessment effect on systemic lupus rheumatoid disease during the COVID pandemic. Without further ado, Dr. The, the floor is yours, Dr. Hajar. Assalamu alaikum, I'm Dr. Hajar Zahir, and I will present my uh, uh, presentation today uh, is about virtual vs. actual clinical assessment effect on systemic lupus erythematous disease during pandemic of COVID-19. It was supervised by Dr. Ibrahim al maghlouth the cons rheumatology consultant. I will start, start my presentation with introduction. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has posed numerous obstacles for uh, health and care services around the world. It has dramatically altered everything since many hospitals have become almost entirely dedicated to COVID-19 patients. Access to outpatient clinics has been severely restricted, leading to the difficulty in providing correct management and follow-up of chronic disease patients. The ability of digital health technologies to safeguard patients, professionals, and the public from exposure has been widely recognized, which has accelerated the adoption of these technologies in ways never uh, seen before. SLE is an autoimmune disease uh, that can affect a variety of organs and has a diverse clinical history. SLE is diagnosed by looking for specific clinical signs and symptoms in the skin, joints, kidneys, and TNS, as well as serological markers such as ANA antibodies to double strand DNA and etc. The virtual assessment of several diseases may be mistaken, especially the disease with complicated symptoms like COVID-19. For instance, some of the SLE symptoms are fever, fatigue, and kidney problems. Those symptoms could be observed in patients with COVID-19. In this case, the traditional diagnosis may provide better results. Our study aims to compare between the virtual and traditional methods of SLE assessment and the effect on disease activity amongst adult SLE patients. Study design was case crossover design nested with the national cohort of SLE, where patients suffering from SLE disease were included in the study from March 2020 to March 2021. Their research was implemented at King Khalid University Hospital in Riyadh. Sample size and sample population, uh, a total of 92 patients with SLE were enrolled over a 12-month period from King Khalid University Hospital in Riyadh. Inclusion criteria, patient diagnosed with SLE who fil fulfilled the criteria of diagnosing SLE and currently enrolled in the Saudi prospective cohort of SLE at King Khalid University Hospital in Riyadh, at least 18 years old at the time of diagnosis, and patients is living in Saudi Arabia. Exclusion criteria, patients under 18 years old and patients with overlap disease. Primary outcome was proportion of patients with active disease measured by slid I to K more than or equal to 4 at 6 months from baseline, virtual versus in person. Secondary outcome was disease activity at 6 months interval after the actual visit. Collected variables, uh, socio-demographic data, patient medical uh, number, uh, record number, date of birth, gender, nationality, SLIC, SLE classification criteria, which is the criteria that our patient diagnosed based on. SLIC ACR damage index, the baseline complication and damage that has been developed in our patient as a consequence of their disease. And the last is the SLIDI 2K, uh, which is the tool that has been used to measure disease activity in our study. We defined active disease if SLIDI 2K was more than or equal to 4. A data collection process data were collected during the period between March 2020 to March 2021. The data collection were done on three phases. Virtual assessment, which defined as contacting the patients by phone and assessing their disease using SLIDI 2K. Uh, then after six months, in-person assessment for disease activity was done, evaluating disease activity after the virtual assessment. 
After six months, another in-person assessment measuring disease activity after the previous in-person visits. Laboratory workup was taken from all patients in each phase to measure the disease activity. All data were uh, recorded on soft copies via Google uh, Forms, then transferred into spreadsheet in Google Drive. Ethics consideration, a generic uh, ethical approval form for the proposed research was done verbally by all included patients before the start of the research. Statistical analysis, uh, descriptive statistical analysis was made by I IBM SPSS Statics. Six, significance between virtual and, and cl actual clinical assessment was done using person G square uh, for categorized data with p-value less than 0 0.05 was considered statistically significant. Results, uh, a total of 92 patients with SLE were enrolled over a 12-month period according to, the, to these demographic data. Our patient was, uh, uh, their main age was around 36. Um, most of them were female with 88%, 95% uh, were Saudis and uh, non-smoker were 95.7%. Uh, most of our patients were non-drinker with 98.9%. Uh, uh, most of the, our, um, there is 27.2% uh, were having previous miscarriages. This is the slick classification criteria of SLE, uh, which our patient was classified as having SLE. Um, around 48.8 of our patients having acute or subacute cutaneous lupus, around 80% having joint disease, 44% uh, having abnormal urine findings uh, defined as proteinuria or RBC cast, some of them having neurological involvement with 13%, uh, biopsy proven lupus nephritis was 42%, and some having positive anti phospholipid antibodies with 15%. This is the damage index, with, which is slick ACR damage index, uh, which showed the baseline um, damage uh, that happens as a consequence of SLE. Uh, number of patients who had damage of one or more organ at baseline period was around 44%. Uh, some of them having cataract with 3.3%, 3, 3 uh, having some of them with 6.5 having cerebral vascular accident, around 15% having proteinuria of 3.5 uh, uh, gram uh, per 24 hours. Uh, some of our patients having a uh, pulmonary infarction with 5%. Uh, uh, so this is the comparison between the virtual and actual clinical assessment and disease activity uh, of SLE by using SLIDI 2K score. We found that there is decrease in number of patients with active disease activity from 64% at baseline to 43% at six months follow up by virtual assessment to 39% uh, follow up by actual clinical assessment with significant p-value of 0 0.009. Uh, most of the activity at the baseline was uh, headache going down uh, during the actual clinical assessment. Arthritis was 31% uh, uh, at the baseline virtual assessment, decreased it to 19%, then to 5% after the clinical, actual clinical assessment. Some of, of our patients having uh, mucosal ulceration with 9, 10% uh, goes down to 5%. 0.4% after virtual assessment and up to 2% after the actual clinical assessment. So there is decrease in SLIDI 2K score in, in the mean SLIDI score from 5.2 uh, at baseline to 3.6 at six months follow up by virtual assessment to 3.3 at six months follow up by actual clinical assess assessment with significant p value. So in our study, we found that disease activity was higher after virtual assessment compared to clinical assessment, and this method of care could be applicable for stable patients, giving a chance and additional clinic slots for more complicated SLE patients. Also, a high proportion of patients was active during virtual assessment, and this could be related to that some of symptoms could be overestimated by patients and need physician assessment to confirm it.
So despite widespread advocacy during this epidem epidemic, the evidence supporting the use of virtual clinic and rheumatology in comparison to the traditional person has been lacking. A systemic study published in 2017 concluded that there is insufficient evidence to justify the use of virtual clinics to manage rheumatological illnesses. One study conducted during the early phase of COVID-19 found that virtual clinic was generally well accepted as a mode of care for patients with conductive tissue disease. However, no data on the clinical results of virtual clinics follow-up in patients with lupus are available. So the study faced some limitations, like a small number of patients being a single center study. Other confounders that have, haven't been measured in our study leading to high proportion of patients having disease activity during virtual assessment, like lack of adherence to medication due to fear of COVID infection or inability to reach the hospital to get their home medication. Although the virtual assessment are, so this is the conclusion, although the virtual assessment are widely used during pandemic of COVID-19 to limit, this, limit the spread of viral infection and supported some effectiveness in assessing of SLE activity, still the actual clinical assessment is the best method in the assessing, assessing SLE activity, complications and the efficacy of treatment. So virtual assessment could lead also to overestimate of disease activity, which may lead to unnecessary treatment. Thank you. Thank you. We meet again, and now um, the Q and A Q and A session is open. So please put your question in the platform regard in relation to the abstract. I will kick start with the first speaker, Dr. Nasra. The question here, um, um, in I mean, this is excellent work, and I like that you kind of compiled all the work in Oman into one group, and you come with a kind of a very decent number. Now, my question to you, uh, were there predictors of the mortality in your study? Did, did you look into it? Because I didn't see it in the lecture. I mean, did you look into that? Yeah, that's what I have uh, mentioned that we have. I'm sorry. That, uh, yeah, I have mentioned it that uh, we have uh, several factors that predict uh, mortality, including uh, sepsis and internal organ uh, involvement, all uh, uh, respiratory, neurological, mm. cardiovascular involvement, renal involvement, were all, I mean, uh, predictor of mortality. May I ask the, this, this kind of uh, feature were at baseline or at the time of death? At time of death. So, okay. um, I mean, we have, uh, when we... Uh, uh, As a cause. Our data, yeah, what were the cause of uh, death and what the patient had at that time. I mean, what was... Uh, uh, involvement, the organ involvement that they had. Very good. Uh, no, just the reason for that, because, uh, I mean, we are all share the same character and there was always the delay of patient presenting with lupus nephritis or hypertension. And we found that in our cohort and other colleagues in Saudi Arabia found it as well. And uh, Northern Africa, it's always seen that delay is their one reason or hypertension at baseline. I don't know if did you come across this in your, in your thing? 
we didn't, uh, I mean, uh, study this factor uh, specifically, I mean, whether the patient was uh, delayed in uh, diagnosis or no, but uh, I think one of our variable was I mean, in, uh, how long the patient was uh, diagnosed from the time that of the onset of their uh, illness. But as I have, I mean, you have uh, mentioned, yeah, this is, we are encountering it, it even ourselves in our clinical uh, practice. And uh, probably uh, this is one of uh, the reasons that uh, uh, we had a higher mortality in patients who are uh, ANA negative. Spot on, spot on. I was trying to say that. You mentioned how somehow ANA positive, those who have high in the couple of miles short nicely. Now, I mean, I don't have any question from my side. Uh, Victor Hamed, do you have any question regarding the first? Yeah, there are uh, plenty of questions here from the from the audience. So I think uh, probably there is a question about, do you believe in seronegative lupus? I don't know whether that's to Mundir or to Nasra, but I'll keep it for discussion. And there is another uh, question for Mundir in the same regard about not zero negative lupus. I think Munder touched on it. That can you diagnose? Sorry, not zero negative ABS. Can you diagnose catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome without having the immunology? Because the immunology usually take time. Okay. I don't know. Yeah, who so then it, start first. Yeah, I, I'll start. I'll start, and then uh, first let me tackle ANA negative. Just let me remind you about 20, 30 years back. One in five patients were ANA negative for lupus. And the reason for that is technology. The technology changed. We didn't change patients. When I joined St. Thomas's Hospital in 1986, about 25% of the patients were ANA negative. And the reason for that, we used to use tissue from rats to test for antinuclear antibodies. We moved on from the year 2000 onwards. We use HEP2. And the, that overnight disappeared the ANA negative become rare because HEP2 pick up more antinuclear antibodies, especially those with raw antibodies, okay? So what we change, not the patient, the technique we change, okay? So ANA negative lupus today is less than 4%. And this is based on the study that I did with the SLIC inception cohort with a more than 1,500 patients recently diagnosed with lupus from international cohort, less than 4%. So it occurred, it's very rare. Is it true? Do you have ANA negative? Should we exclude these patients? As you know, the new classification criteria now demanded for the first time, you have to be antinuclear antibody positive, at least one in 80. So you still have small number of patients who are persistently ANA negative. So we should exclude them? No, as clinician, you shouldn't. You shouldn't include them in clinical studies because perhaps these are biasing the the research and the Dr. Nasra mentioned that at least in her cohort, those seronegative, or let's call them ANA negative, did very worse than those who are positive and, uh, and, and definite lupus. Regarding anti catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome, you shouldn't wait for the antibodies. The antibodies might take one to two weeks. You don't have time to wait for the antibodies. You treat accordingly. If you suspect the patient have catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome from clinical point of view, you treat quickly, because if you don't treat quickly, then the patient is going to die. So later on, you might reassess the patient and might exclude the diagnosis of catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome, but you cannot delay the treatment. Yeah. Can I comment as well? Yeah, please. Yeah. yeah. So in our cohort, we had around 3.5%. Uh, uh, they are uh, uh, ANA uh, negative. Yeah. Of course, we didn't use the new, uh, this one, ACR ULAR uh, criteria that mandate uh, the presence of uh, the ANA. But what I would uh, mention, yes, I do believe definitely that there is an ANA negative. Actually, we have a, uh, a group of uh, patients uh, in our cohort with lupus nephritis, biopsy proven uh, lupus nephritis, and they are ANA uh, negative. That is one. Great. Another thing, I mean, there is something called, uh, called a prozone phenomena. There is something called a zero conversion. Patients may be at certain uh, a period of time, right. they are negative, but if you follow them, Okay, later on, they may seroconvert and they may have uh, ANA positive. And then ourselves, we had it in clinical uh, practice, patient coming right. uh, negative ANA, but they are fully blown uh, with pericardial effusion, skin rash, musculoskeletal uh, manifestation, thrombocytopenia, 
We treated uh, them. Later on in the course of the illness, they progress, they develop lupus uh, nephritis. Later on, they turn to be ANA positive, not only ANA positive, even anti-Smith positive. Mm-hmm. Okay, so mm-hmm. we should depend on our clinical uh, uh, examination, our clinical uh, experience. To we follow up uh, this patient, and we mind you that the classification criteria they are classification. They are not diagnostic uh, criteria. We use them to have a homogeneous group while we are doing a uh, study. Mm-hmm. It helps us. Uh, we we I mean we do agree in our clinical practice to make uh, the diagnosis, but we shouldn't use them solely for diagnosis if we think that these patients are really, uh, they are lupus. It is better to label them as a query lupus and follow them rather than you miss such uh, patients. Great. Thank you very much. We Can I move to the film further because uh, there's a couple of questions and I promise you, I mean, I talked to you in the presentation that there will be discussion. Rutuximab is a story. Sorry, Dr. Hamid, I'm just uh, taking this. Uh, Rutuximab is a story. Uh, rituximab is a story, it's like um, it's been always off label use and it's always successful. Okay. Now, and mo- I will never say always, but it's most of the time it's successful. Now, having said that, there's a couple of questions. One of them, as a preference in your practice or your colleague's practice, do you start uh, rituximab before cyclophosphamide or mycophenolate for lupus <laughs> nephritis? And if you oh, do, no, no, uh, no, uh, this is out of question. <laughs> Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. That's that's uh, would be very, very unusual because um, even the patients uh, I presented, uh, um, al- almost all of them, um, actually all of them have used uh, either Celsept or, uh, my, sorry, mycophenolate, mofetil or cyclophosphamide before they rituximab. Rituximab still comes as a um, uh, second, third step for patients that are uh, non-responders to the usual uh, standard of care therapy we have. Excellent. And this is also the second question, actually, which was there in the thing. Now, having said that, in case it doesn't work, do what do you move to? Um, this is a million-dollar question because... Uh, um, um, more recently, we have um, 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 approval for belimumab with nephritis. So honestly, if I have a patient with severe activity from the beginning, I start combination belimumab with standard of care from the very beginning. If I don't get a response, you still have the same pathway. You switch uh, MMF to cyclo and the other way around, then you can add rituximab or uh, uh, tacrolimus. Uh, um, I think we still have uh, uh, some time before we can use vocalis podens not yet available to us, uh, which could add another uh, uh, benefit to some of the patients. But if you don't, if you don't get a response, then the best you can is to combine uh, multi-step immune suppression with um, probably tacrolimus, some cell cell and maybe rituximab. Uh, but it's it's very difficult. There's not a single answer to that question. Good. Prof. Mandar, would you like to add something to his words? Or? No, no, I agree. I agree 100%. So Fair we, enough. All, 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 all guidelines, Kidaigo guidelines, Euler guidelines, Abler guidelines, Rituximab mm-hmm. in that first line is a rescue, rescue therapy when you sure. fail the first line, which is fair. Enough. Which is fair, fair. Enough. Okay. Uh, Dr. Hajar, you have a question. Uh, first, I congratulate you and Dr. Brahim for excellent work. Uh, the question is, uh, maybe we missed it. Uh, do you keep a record of those who relapsed during the follow-up of one year? And if there was the predictor was, I mean, you mentioned compliance, one of them, but did you keep a record of those with lupus you followed from baseline and the activity, they relapsed and need required hospital admission? Uh, so first uh, question, uh, actually, we included all the patients uh, were diagnosed already with pure SLE and were um, um, following in our clinic as uh, SLE, uh, uh, pure SLE without any other overlap. Uh, for other, th- other question, we did not count any for uh, any uh, intellectual and educational level in our uh, uh, collection and even uh, infection if, uh, if happens during this period. Last question. Uh, actually, we took only our uh, known SLE patients in the clinic as it's a little bit difficult to diagnose the new SLE uh, by using uh, virtual uh, methods. Yeah. 
Very good. But in a sense that the, the one you took as a lupus, did you keep a record of numbers, just a, just a rough number of how many people required lupus admission for uh, non-COVID? No, no, no. Actually, we did not count for any admissions or any uh, um, uh, complications happened during this Excellent. period. Excellent. I mean, as you said it nicely, maybe this is the way forward to have it uh, every six months uh, or three months of virtual and then move on with the six month or one year in a physical. So you have two physical sandwiched, one uh, kind of uh, virtual. Uh, I don't know how we're doing with time, Dr. Hamid, because you are there in Oman and you know the time better than me. <laughs> I think we have some more time for some more Very good. because uh, yeah. so uh, I mean can, yeah. I, can I ask the next please question Jamal? Please, please do so, uh, I combined actually two questions or three questions to, to Munda. Uh, first of all, one question is can you we use thrombolytic in caps? That's one. And the second question, which is probably related to it, is when you encounter a patient with caps who is half in bleeding at the same time, maybe due to the thrombocytopenia or maybe whatever reason, maybe both cesarean section or something, how to anticoagulate? Okay, this is, these are two important uh, clinical uh, clinical questions. Mm -hmm. in, in bleeding in patients with even catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome is very rare. Even with severe thrombocytopenia, they don't bleed. Don't ask me why, I don't know. They don't bleed. Even with low platelet number, you panic. Everybody panics. They don't bleed. So don't. If they are bleeding, obviously, of the, over after cesarean section or the cesarean maybe triggered the catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome, you have to be careful with your anticoagulation. But that doesn't mean you stop anticoagulation. If you stop anticoagulation, you you are in trouble. So you have to be very careful. The balance is not easy during bleeding and anticoagulation at the same time. But this is a, 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 the, the, the art of medicine, so it's, it's a diff difficult balance. But generally speaking, we are lucky that these patients very, 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 very rarely bleed. And if they bleed, investigate the reason of bleeding, okay? Sometimes you have other factors causing that bleed. So this, this is one. And, and how thr thrombolytic, yes, is indicated like uh, any, anywhere else. And, and in the context of catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome has been done successfully as well. So it's indicated as a with single organ like multiple organ, but you go for it if needed. Yes. Uh, yeah, I can, I can just say, uh, Prof. Yeah. Munzer, I think we are encountering uh, bleeding in case who are having uh, a lupus with antiphospholipid syndrome and they are presenting with alveolar hemorrhage. Okay, so we had okay. such cases usually in ICU. So lupus with, alve uh, with alveolar hemorrhage and they are having antiphospholipid uh, syndrome. This is that's I mean, true. Those cases. That's true. Yeah. It's what but what is you the word alveolar hemorrhage? Okay, alveolar mm -hmm. hemorrhage is is caused by small vessel disease in the lung, it's like you mm -hmm. call it alveolitis. Is not the the word alveolitis means inflammation? Is not okay? It's a clotting mm -hmm. problem. A small vessel mm -hmm. can cause hemorrhage, like suprarenal hemorrhage. Sometimes mm -hmm. happening catastrophic. 10% of catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome have suprarenal hemorrhage. The cause of the suprarenal suprarenal hemorrhage is thrombosis. Believe it or not, mm -hmm. despite the word hemorrhage, mm -hmm. what is you know hemorrhage mean bleeding? Is the mm -hmm. cause is thrombosis. So don't follow the word what it means. These patients mm -hmm. require anticoagulation, despite that there are slight bleeding in the circulation because the microthrombosis in the lung. So mm -hmm. don't worry about the term hemorrhage. Mm -hmm. the, 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 what it, the cause of that term is thrombosis. Bottom line. Mm -hmm. Jamal, still we have time. Two minutes, Jamal. Go ahead. You are muted, Jamal. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry about that. I see a question here, uh, Doctor Zahir. Thanks for the presentation. How did you exclude overlap disorder in the patient ex in exclusion criteria? Uh, Dr. Hajar, will you take that? She's on mute as well. Dr. Hajar? Yes. Yeah, no, no. Uh, yeah, there was a question. Uh, they thank you for the presentation and they are saying how you should overlap, this, overlap disorders in patient 
This is the first question. The other one, did you consider intellectual education level of patient, which both are limited results? I think you answered this one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I go and, through yeah, all yeah, of you them. Did. And yes, you did that. You did your homework. So, <laughs> so this is over here. Um, and the question is, you don't assess new and you answer that. This is the pending question from this side. I think we give the audience one minute to break because we are due to close at, I got the message from the organizer to 11.25. And really I take this opportunity to thank all the speakers and all the attendees. It's an excellent session. I really enjoyed it. And thank I you hope all. you stay safe. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Too. Thank you, Ahmed. Thank, thank you. Thank you, much. thank you very much. All the best. All the best. Thank, thank you. you. Enjoy the meeting. Thanks. Ahmed, we need to sit back to decide. Yeah. 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 This is Dr. Yasser Badampur. I'm a rheumatologist from Kuwait City. Uh, I'm hoping you're enjoying the meeting as I am been doing for the last uh, two days. Uh, <clears throat> we're going to have the new sessions. Uh, we've been through the COVID-19 pandemic for the last two years. Uh, fortunately, unfortunately, rheumatologists, as the other physicians in this uh, area, the GCC area, has been affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. The way we uh, introduce our service to the patient, the way we're interacted with the patients. So it's, it's, it's very appropriate at this time to introduce a section where uh, from the GCC meeting has been allocated to the COVID-19 updates. I've seen a lot of the, uh, my colleagues from different countries uh, where they have done a lot of research and the way they interacted with these patients, the way they have vaccinated these patients, the way they've been managing with the COVID-19. So the section is divided into two. First, we're going to start with a presentation by Dr. Brahim al Maghloud from Saudi Arabia, uh, where, I, where I'm going to introduce in the next two minutes. Then we'll have the Q&A section for 10 minutes. Subsequently, we'll have the second part of the COVID-19 uh, section, where we're going the three uh, presenters from uh, different countries in GC going to present their research areas and the uh, COVID-19 area over the last uh, two years. 
So let's start with the first section where I'm going to introduce Dr. Rahim Al-Maghloud. He's a Roman assistant professor of rheumatology unit at the Department of Medicine at the College of Medicine in King Saud University. He's also the director of the College of Medicine Research Center in King Saud University. Dr. Maloud also holds the principal investigator of the National Prospective Cohort of SLE in Saudi Arabia. Dr. Brahim is going to present us in the next few minutes the updates in the COVID-19 and the rheumatology world. Dr. Brahim, the mic is yours. Thank you everyone for having me today. Uh, I'm delighted to join this wonderful uh, group of speakers to uh, talk uh, today about, uh, shed some light uh, about the updates in rheumatic disease management during COVID era. Um, I have no relevant disclosures to this topic. And my objective today in this topic is really to highlight uh, an issues related to SLE and rheumatic disease uh, uh, patient uh, management during COVID. I really want to address how the uh, COVID uh, pandemic had uh, impacted uh, our patient uh, population, uh, the role of the uh, virtual clinic versus usual care, whether our patients are getting worse with the vaccines and uh, do we have any benefit from the vaccine. Now, as you all know, the uh, impact of COVID-19 pandemic in general can be divided into several domains. Uh, we can easily uh, address these in the form of uh, one, what is the risk of our populations uh, uh, of getting COVID uh, infection? And that's usually these domains evolve over time since the, uh, initiate, uh, the beginning of the pandemic. Then the impact of the access uh, of the pandemic and the public health measures on access to care. Following that, we have the adherence to medications, patient reported outcome, and as well as the uh, how the uh, whether our patients are uh, susceptible to uh, the um, uh, vaccine benefits and whether they're going to have uh, complications related to the vaccine and what is their course during the uh, infection time and uh, finally uh, would managing them through a telecommunication uh, uh, serve them well or not. In order to address that, we did conduct in our uh, rheumatic, pay, uh, group, uh, rheumatic research group at King Saud University Hospital, a time series uh, event study. The study really was initiated in March 2019, shortly after the uh, beginning of the uh, pandemic. The goal of this time series uh, project was to uh, have repeated uh, 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 assessment of a patient with rheumatic disease at three different points of time in relation to different public health measures during the uh, COVID uh, pandemic. The first one was uh, wave one, which happened at the highest restriction of public health measures. And the second one happened a couple of months after, which uh, during which more less restraint and more flexibility in terms of movement and access to care took place. And the third one was really later on when the most of the uh, curfew uh, was uh, uh, removed, as well as the public health uh, measures were lessened, uh, and that allowed patients to really move freely within the uh, kingdom. What is very important is that the outcomes of this uh, 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 time series event was to assess the impact of the pandemic on the individuals, particularly patient reported outcomes, as well as the impact of that, of all these measures on the disease, their perception of disease activity and their ability to access care. We had a very large study population. We have almost 1,000 uh, uh, patients, 1,278 uh, over the three period of time. Uh, we did sample patients with rheumatic disease, and those were accessed through the uh, Charitable Society of Rheumatic Disease databases, as well as the King Saud University rheumatic patients uh, in, uh, registered in the clinics. Uh, at wave one, we had the highest number of responders, and then at period two and period three, Three, wave two and wave three, we had a little bit less. What is very important here is to see that the de demographics of the population uh, is predominantly enriched by Saudi, uh, and uh, the uh, majority of the people were uh, having significant. Uh, 
uh, high level of uh, education. And more importantly, most of our patients did not differ in period one, period two, or period three. So it is a homogeneous population in general, and it is fair to treat them uh, all as uh, one population. Now, majority of our patients were patients with rheumatic disease, followed by uh, rheumatoid arthritis, followed by lupus, and then the other chronic conditions. This is very similar to the distribution of patients with rheumatic inflammatory arthritis in general worldwide and correspond to what has been reported by the Global Registry of Rheumatic Patients. So the first question is, what do we know about COVID perception from our patients with rheumatic disease? It was very important question of whether patients have a good understanding of COVID and the impact of COVID on their population and their health. To start with that, most of the time people through uh, standardized questions had decent uh, knowledge about the uh, COVID with 92% representing decent knowledge. Most of their information were done through the social media, obviously. And then after that, the rest of the ch uh, channels were uh, uh, represented. One third had concerns and fear of infection. And this is a very important factor because our question was whether this fear and whether this perception has any impact on their uh, adherence to medication and uh, their uh, uh, disease activity later on. And many of these, half of them were afraid of deterioration of COVID. We had a lot as a result of this study, had a lot of social uh, of, uh, campaigning and media campaigning during early phases of COVID, reassuring patients about the uh, infection risk. Now, when we look at the conceptual model that we had hypothesized before, the, before I show the results of our study, conceptual model uh, essentially uh, was Patient with uh, uh, rheumatic disease may have worsening disease activity due to their inability to access health care or because they are not adherent to their medication uh, as a result of their fear of getting infection, so they would stop their uh, medication. And as a result, non-adherence can affect their uh, activities and uh, what so on. So this is a very important part. Uh, and we also uh, wonder if that perception of disease activity, i.e. getting worse, from a patient perspective, uh, uh, had increase in healthcare utilization, i.e. ER visits, follow-up duration, as well as uh, healthcare facility uh, uh, visits. And to assess that as a major confounder, these could be influenced by their comorbidities and whether they had prolonged disease duration. To make the story short, we uh, this was uh, the uh, first results of the study in an unadjusted uh, crude, uh, um, unadjusted uh, univariate analysis. We can see that the patient the perception of disease activity uh, of the patient was. Uh, was associated with increase of healthcare utilization, as you can see here by the uh, odds ratio. This was also persistent even when we adjust for other confounders. It was also noticed that the uh, adherence to the medication, so when people have uh, good adherence to uh, medication, uh, they uh, actually have obviously this uh, flare-up, and uh, obviously the uh, patient flare-up was also uh, significantly associated with access to medication. And these were also persistent even when we adjust to uh, other confounding variable. In another way, uh, we also noticed that the patient fear of COVID did not influence their uh, perception of uh, uh, disease activity. It also did not influence their uh, adherence to medication in a separate analysis. And whether they had a prolonged course of disease or they had a recent disease, their follow-up duration, uh, uh, and the last assessment by a, a, a rheumatologist did not influence that. So in another way, we do believe based on these uh, st uh, in this uh, study that patient 
during COVID pandemic. And this should be, uh, should have a reflection on further waves of COVID that we are uh, currently facing or other kind of pandemic that has significant public health measures. It is very important to notice that healthcare, the, their access to medication may significantly influence their disease perception, uh, the disease activity as measured here surrogately through uh, their perception of disease activity, as well as as a result, if they get worse, their access to healthcare utilization in the form of ER visit or unscheduled dramatic disease clinic visit is higher. And that is irrespective of how long they, when was the last time they saw their uh, rheumatologist and whether they had uh, uh, fear of medication or not. It's not about their knowledge. It's about the services and availability of medications. And that's a very important point. Now, the second question that we asked ourselves uh, is whether this event, this, um, these findings were actually a matter of one time point that happened early on in the disease, uh, in the COVID, or this is persistent pattern over time. And that the, what allowed us to do that is the time series uh, design of the project. And what we have noticed is that actually as patient, uh, the findings did not significantly change over time. In fact, they, in anything, they got worse. In another way, once you hit by an impact, the impact will linger over time. So for example, the patient perception of disease activity that did not change, did not change significantly over time, i.e. when they got worse, they get worse for a period of time. And what is very important that this worsening activity it lead to an increase in healthcare utilization as measured by increased ER visit. And also, uh, it also impact their, uh, uh, this was significantly associated with the limitation in healthcare uh, access, i.e. as you increase the uh, uh, healthcare access, you're likely to notice uh, less of this. Uh, it is also important that uh, the, uh, and sc the scheduled uh, uh, clinical visit uh, increase over time. And as we improve the uh, schedule uh, visit, you will notice uh, uh, the improvement in limitation of healthcare access. Now, so all of this is a consequence of having limitation access early on, having limitation of access on medication. So there is an impact of that on the healthcare utilization in general. Now, we don't think that this is related to their comorbidity because we did not notice any significant change in the clinical visits in patients uh, for a uh, condition other than rheumatic disease. Now, the second question that we asked ourselves, so, well, that's fine. What about the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on the psychosocial uh, effect uh, of uh, psychosocial domain of patients with rheumatic disease? In order to assess that, we looked at patient reported outcome using PROMIS, which is a, a very well validated tool to assess the uh, psychosocial function and social domains that, um, that may be uh, uh, that may, uh, might affect patients uh, during COVID uh, pandemic. And what we notice is the following. The first part is we notice that we have significant impairment uh, um, in patient uh, social, physical function, psychosocial, uh, so psychological function and anxiety and depression, as well as their sleep quality and fatigue and during COVID time. Now we, uh, uh, the, uh, the blue here uh, describe the uh, interpretation of the level of impairment. So blue means normal and essentially uh, orange is mi uh, mild impairment. And then you have the gray and yellow as a, a moderate to severe. What I wanna highlight here is an, an average. We have about 15 to 20% moderate to severe impairment in one of the psychological domains, so anxiety or depression, or fatigue, as well as uh, 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 sleep and uh, physical impairment as a result of COVID pandemic. These impairment requires a clinical attention. So this is a major thing that we need to address on clinical visits, especially when we uh, look for a value base and well-being of overall individual. But the second question, whether this impairment was, a sub, uh, was related to public health measures or it is independent, i.e. are they similar at all these waves or 
when we have more release of public health measures and we ease down the process, we notice that there is an improvement. And actually what we notice here in period one, period two, and period three, that the on average, most of these domains did not significantly change over time, or at least in any clinically or meaningful way. And that's a very important part because the effect of the curfew is likely to have any la lingering effect over time. And two, it is very also important to reflect uh, that on our usual management of patient traumatic disease, because when we have an impairment in one significant impairment in any of these domains, this impairment, unless they are addressed unlikely to change over time and to improve on its own. So it's not a transient thing. Now, what is the relationship between these domains is very important because what we notice in our study here, uh, and this is a paper that has not been uh, published yet, uh, is similar to what we noticed also uh, in the uh, international society, the relationship between different domains are very tightly related. So in another way, when you have a physical, when you have an anxiety or depression, you are more likely to have significant physical impairment. And this impairment will also reflect on your fatigue score, getting more fatigue. And that all, all of these will be related to you having poor sleep. Now, in another way, you will also have uh, this could be partially related to pain, but it's not totally uh, dependent on the disease activity or pain. And uh, this is particularly important uh, because we see that a lot of these are uh, significantly correlate with how much comorbidities do you have. So if you want to pick the most likely people to be affected psychosocial, physical, and functional domain, those are from patients with rheumatic diseases, they are likely to be the one who has significant comorbidities. Now, why this is important? Because another question will be whether this is related to fibromyalgia or not. While the patient, we did not notice that this is predominantly seen in fibromyalgia patient. Most of those patients will self-reporting fibromyalgia. They did not have formal uh, assessment. And what I want to highlight here, when you have someone with rheumatic disease who have multiple comorbidities, it is worth to screen home for fibromyalgia because perhaps we might have some sort of impairment in psychosocial and functional domain or pain all over. They may qualify for fibromyalgia and then we need to address these domains to improve their quality of life. Now, did we have any studies uh, done in the Arab region that reflect similar findings? Our fi is our finding generalizable? And actually, this was supported by study that uh, conducted by the Arab League of Rheumatology uh, group. They have a decent study that was cross-section of what point of time published closely related to our publication on the first wave that showed that patient in general with uh, rheumatic diseases have significant toll by the uh, COVID. That's in particularly related or, uh, to the uh, impairment to medications. So access to medication seems to be a major problem affecting multiple uh, uh, people, not only in, the, uh, in Saudi, but also in the region surrounding. And what is also important to note that there was also an impairment in terms of the impact on mental health. Most of the impact seems to be a minor impact of, uh, on mental health, which we shared by our study in depth using PROMIS. So I also want to highlight that the, many of our patients had uh, 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 issues at accessing emergency uh, services. And this is important because if we do not mitigate this risk in the future, we'll continue to overload our system by uh, a patient who had unplanned uh, uh, visits due to the possible flare-up. And accommodating that ahead of time might mitigate this risk. Now, furthermore, the, uh, the, the, in their study, they uh, also looked at the factor associating with the uh, uh, negative impact of COVID on patient, uh, on individuals. And we can see that the uh, particularly certain regions might have uh, more risk compared to other regions. Uh, I'm not going to go to the details whether this 
actually need to be adjusted or not, but it is it just give you a flavor that it is very important to look at your local area. It is also important to see that the uh, uh, isolation due to uh, COVID might have uh, a negative impact. So again, how the psychosocial uh, effect uh, on the medication. And I also want to draw your attention particularly here to the acceptance of teleconsultation. Uh, those who have go through teleconsultation or the acceptance of teleconsultation was a mitigating or a protective factor uh, uh, against negative impact of COVID-19 on our patient based on this study. And what is what this raises uh, uh, is another question of whether telecommunication is useful or telemedicine is useful for our patient. I will highlight that uh, in the near uh, shortly. Because of the time, I'm just going to uh, move quickly to the other questions. And that one of the very important questions, whether our medications put patients at risk of rheumat uh, uh, at risk of uh, viral illness or upper respiratory tract illness. Now, this is, was a major scoping review that we conducted in a lot in, uh, and published in uh, seminars of arthritis or rheumatism in collaboration with the Global Registry of Rheumatic Diseases. And what we know did we looked at the literature of all the literature that assess the risk uh, of the infection in clinical trials or uh, in a cohort studies uh, 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 for upper respiratory viral illness and stratify that based on the medications. What we noticed is that there was, uh, we screened more than 12,000 uh, papers and we studied about 180 at the end. Uh, in these studies, we noticed that most of the medications that we are utilizing do not have any conclusive evidence of increased risk of viral illness, especially DMARDs. We might have some risk of other uh, medications, but the le level of evidence is not as uh, strong. However, the scoping review was not aimed to assess the degree of evidence, but also to map what that was published at that time. We have more accumulative knowledge now in terms of the risk of viral illness and COVID, uh, and whether there's, there is risk of uh, hospitalization that will come across shortly. But what I want you to know that this is very reassuring to our patient. Uh, they should not freak out because of the, they, they are being on medications that might control their uh, immune system. What is very important uh, uh, is what follows. More, many studies has been published about the course of our patient and conflicting data uh, uh, has been uh, published in terms of what is the course of our patients who are using immune suppressive agent following COVID infection. I want to highlight that this probably the global registry and other studies that are uh, published for Mass General should significantly highlight that most of the risk that we noticed for hospitalization or bad outcomes in COVID is likely related to uh, comorbidities, the presence of lung disease, significant diabetes, hypertension, or chronic kidney disease. And that's especially true when we adjust for uh, uh, other uh, these comorbidities. We do not have major influence from disease-modifying drugs except for perhaps rituximab, which is a subject that uh, seems to be uh, repeated in multiple studies. And that was reflected on the guidelines uh, uh, published by the, or recommendation published by the Joint uh, Commission from ACR, as well as from uh, ULR. There was no enough evidence support that NSAIDs have any significant impact, but the most important recurrent theme, recurrent evidence, that uh, uh, has been noticed in most of the study is that steroid use more than 10. So minimizing the medication as much as possible if the patient condition allows is very important because this risk seems to dominate all the risk. Steroid and to some extent uh, pres uh, the utilization of rituximab. So if possible, reducing that is important. Now, I know that I have to... Uh, I don't have plenty of time, um, but um, I'm just going to go over the virtual care and telemedicine. And we have very nice uh, best practice guidelines published by the Arab League Against Rheumatology, which did a very nice consensus agreement using a Delphi approach. 
uh, to uh, provide some guidance in terms of use of telemedicine uh, in uh, rheumatic patient during, co especially uh, uh, during uh, to help people during COVID pandemic. Well, these are the definitions. Most of the uh, findings highlight the lack of significant evidence uh, uh, in terms of the. Um, out how the telemedicine impact the outcome. I just want to draw your attention about the quality of medical care. Uh, it, there is a decent consensus that access and continuity of care can be really provided through telemedicine. And I think this is a very important part. And we noticed in their initial survey how telemedicine uh, acceptance may mitigate the risk of uh, a negative effect of COVID pandemic on the management of patient, uh, on, uh, uh, COVID uh, on rheumatic patients, uh, uh, impact, impact of COVID-19 on patients with the uh, rheumatic condition. What I, what we try to do after that is to ask the question whether our question as a physician, whether doing telemedicine provides similar care to non-telemedicine. In order to answer this question, we looked at the literature, particularly we're focusing about lupus because this is my main area of interest. And we noticed this paper that, uh, an abstract that was shared but not published yet, yet in uh, as a full uh, article up to this uh, point where uh, uh, in China they try to uh, look after patients with lupus nephritis it was a randomized clinical trial that uh, we use, was single center looked at patient satisfaction as a primary outcome compliance and disease control as well as a risk of infection and the highlight of this study was that well, telemedicine seems to have similar effect and, or maybe slightly better in terms of the patient satisfaction. Um, however, there was a little bit of increased risk of hospitalization uh, uh, of a patient with telemedicine compared to the uh, uh, non-telemedicine or standard of care. In another way, people were happy when they were randomized to telemedicine versus more than the uh, standard of care. And that maybe assists, uh, uh, goes to the access of care. However, there was may, more hospitalization, but mo not differences in disease outcome, i.e. proteinuria. And we think in that study, because it was under power, it is related to the fact that most of the patients who went to the telemedicine group uh, were having uh, more, um, uh, they had more uh, active disease compared to the uh, uh, other group. So the patient, the, there was imbalance in the trial. And when they adjust for this, this imbalance, uh, the, this risk was mitigated. Now, why this is important? Because what we did in, uh, in our uh, center at, uh, in the National Prospective Cohort of SLE, we conducted a nested case crossover study uh, that looked at patient using telemedicine and then at one at point one, and then switch to in-person assessment at point two, and then in-person assessment at point three. And the differences with the timeline between point one to two and two to three is six months. And what we the a primary outcome of this uh, case crossover that is currently under uh, review, uh, yeah, is still not published, uh, is the actually disease activity. What we notice is that the disease activity uh, between period uh, between one to two, which we call it period one, virtual clinical assessment, and two to three, which is in person or the usual care, is actually there was significant difference in disease activity between in period one uh, than period two, uh, and that highlights essentially that perhaps during virtual care there is an overestimation of disease activity by the physician versus an in-person assessment. There was obviously multiple uh, uh, confounders that we adjust for in the regression model. One of them obviously is that patient at point one, maybe they came with higher disease activity because of COVID. We said just recently that there may perhaps 20% of the patient will feel worse because of access of care or whatnot. And then you got them better. 
uh, by period two. That's why there was no difference between two and three. However, we penalized the results for this potential unmeasured confounder, uh, and we still noticed a difference. So there is something about telemedicine that give us an over, perhaps an overestimate of disease activity. Now, that's why I think I, I do agree with this graph that was published and uh, that was in the publication of telehealth recommendation by the Arab League. Uh, and uh, what they, what I want to highlight here is that in those patients who we think based on telemedicine that they have a flare up or active disease, it is very important to actually see them in person be so before you uh, significantly change their uh, treatment. Uh, and that's particularly true for those areas where there is no objective assessment, i.e. it's not a proteinuria level, uh, because there is the assessment in person may might uh, add another clarity from a physical perspective. So that's, uh, I think, a very important take, uh, take away message from that part. Now, I think I'm uh, running uh, out of time, but the last two points that I want to highlight is the, uh, imp the uh, how to manage the patient in terms of the vaccine. And there was multiple guidelines published in that area. The key component here is the following. If a patient is in remission, and he's doing great, it is fair to hold the medication before and slightly after, particularly after for methotrexate, and that's the latest update, based on the data that looks at the level of the antibodies that produced by the uh, uh, individuals and how they are uh, reduced by being on disease-modifying drugs, particularly methotrexate and to, some, to lesser extent biological therapy. And of course, the worst of, out of all of these is rituximab. However, if someone is really active and they have active disease, you have to question, first of all, whether they should go for the vaccine or not, and whether the benefit here probably perhaps uh, uh, outweigh the risk by keeping them on some of the medication. Now, this is very important for rituximab because it, rituximab reduces the antibody level significantly, and perhaps the perfect timing of their vaccine, if they are in remission, is to do it uh, uh, when uh, just before their second dose, so perhaps a month or a couple of weeks before the uh, dose, which is scheduled on a six months interval. What support that? This study is a very interesting study, and that's what we need to uh, uh, promote to our patient uh, uh, is the uh, effect of the disease modifying drugs on the level of the medication. In this uh, uh, wonderful paper that was uh, published in the Lancet of Rheumatology, the uh, uh, patient with different disease modifying drugs, a good proportion of them were from the Netherlands, a good proportion of them were actually patients with rheumatic disease. They looked at their production of antibodies, and you can see that the after the first dose of vaccine, the levels were significantly lower in those who are using medications versus those who uh, have uh, who are not on disease modifying drugs. However, after the second uh, dose or after uh, the first dose after an infection, the levels are almost comparable uh, in those patients compared to the general population, except for the CD20 uh, uh, risk. And what that tells us is that uh, essentially, it is very important to give to promote the idea of having multiple doses. Not first, not only one dose, but perhaps two or three doses. And more data recently been showing that more with each dose, the levels increase significantly. Now, um, gonna wrap up because of the time. But the patients usually ask a question of whether they have a flare-up after the vaccine. And the data up to now, especially if, for example, in the uh, Vaclob uh, report, which focused on lupus patient, support the idea that majority of the patient they do not report significant uh, risk that requires their uh, hospitalization. So the risk is really, really low, about 3 to 5%. However, majority of the patients who report some side effects are mild side effects, and this happens uh, in similar extent between first and second uh, doses. What I want to highlight, this has not been compared to the general population, but this almost 
similar, close to what has been reported in the general population. So we want to reassure them there's no very bad out, uh, uh, risk that will require hospitalization and the benefit probably outweigh the uh, risk. With that in mind, I'm going to conclude here. And what I want to summarize by there is a significant burden of COVID pandemic on individuals and this burden likely to have a lingering effect and to continue in the clinic. The effect is really on their access of medication, especially with public health measure and their access to health care. And this is likely to reflect on their disease activity. And as a result, it is very important to mitigate this by improving their access, perhaps through telemedicine. And those who are really a uh, flaring, see them in person, to provide, make sure that there is a plan for disasters to ensure their medical uh, medication supply is intact throughout this period of time. It is very important for their well-being to address their psychosocial function and social domain because these will persist over time and about 20%, 15 to 20% have significant impairment. And that's important to, to be translated into action and actual care. I do recommend vaccination as recommended by the guidelines and it is very important to have multiple doses to ensure their antibody levels are actually good enough to protect them especially with these variants and this will uh, appear more and more with higher and higher level uh, with multiple doses and boosts and it is very important to reassure them that the risk of the vaccine flare-up are not super huge uh, uh, based on most of the reports so far with this, I conclude, and I would love to uh, uh, thank my colleagues, all my team, my PhD students, Lena, my co-workers uh, uh, at the rheumatology, Dima as a research coordinator, uh, uh, Asma, uh, everyone in uh, our uh, team uh, who helped to, uh, uh, orchestrate most of these uh, uh, studies uh, that we've been conducting at King uh, Saud University. Uh, of course, our pa uh, patients before all of them, because without them, wouldn't be able to understand more the disease and the burden of the disease on them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Brahim. Uh, first, I want to congratulate you on this uh, great uh, project was done during this whole pandemic uh, with COVID-19. I think I can't claim there is any single country's claim that they handled this pandemic in terms of offering service for our patients or the way they manage their patient. We've been learning. I mean, I, I think as a physician, as an internal medicine, as a rheumatologist, as a, even a regular citizen, everybody had problem accessing to the healthcare, especially in the beginning. Now it's been two years, Every we have different uh, wave through the Delta wave, through the Omicron wave. But before I ask you the question, I just want to remind the audience that if you had any questions, please send your question in the chat box and Dr. Brian will be happy to answer this question. So before we go to the audience, so in, everybody's saying this is not going to be the last pandemic. There will be another pandemic, whether it's Corona, whether it's SARS, whether it's a different What's your impression in general as a rheumatologist, since we're part of the Ministry of Health, we work in the government sector, we work in the private sector, how we can be prepared for the next time? What do we need to do to, to be prepared for next time so our care of our patient doesn't get affected? What you have learned so far in the last two years? Thank you so much. This is a wonderful question. I think this is the hallmark of uh, uh, these studies. 
Uh, preparedness is a very important concept in public health and population health management from a, a regulator perspective. Uh, I think there is a very important highlight in terms of the shared services under which is the medication supply for at least six months during a crisis. That includes war, pandemics, and whatnot. And what is very, very important uh, that we should highlight that Certain medications, especially DMARs, are very important to all our patients. And having a supply chain arrangement ahead of time, planning, is very important. I think most of the countries now learn that essentially, as you mentioned, it's a learning process. Everyone learned that preparedness is a very important, crucial part. But furthermore, it's also how we anticipate and increase search surge in patients. So for example, our patient, we know, we understand that there will be people who are going to be sick. We need to accommodate them in the clinic. What we noticed in the study that their access, if they don't go to the clinic, they will utilize the ER and they will utilize unscheduled clinical visit and you will have ugh, jump of patients on, on you. So uh, instead, if you prepare um, unscheduled emergency visits for some of those patients or a flow uh, chart for those patients who are sick, then you might be able to mitigate some of the risk. And I think that this is a very important part in uh, in any crisis or any pandemic. Uh, so that's, I think, the first highlight and what, what I would say about preparedness and having uh, a plan ahead uh, of time. So I just want to share with you our experience in Kuwait. There was a problem with access to medication for maybe a week or two, and then there was an immediate emergency plan where medicine were delivered to the home of the patient. So that was solved very quickly early on. I think what we're facing now after two years is a different way of problem is the logistic of getting shipping of all the pharma and there's the cost of shipping becoming so high and the logistic becoming so complicated. And I think this is also something we need to get ahead of it with the ministry, because if one thing our patient will fear that their medicate, they're going to run out of the medication and that by itself create a lot of fear for them. So I'm just going to go with the uh, audience questions. So there is a question basically it's a long question, but in summary saying both the influenza and COVID-19 vaccine are killed vaccine. Why are the two vaccination not treated the same? I, I assume she, the, the uh, uh, question is the way we're dealing with DMAR uh, holding like methoxate or rituximab with uh, comparing between influenza and COVID-19. I think you had shed light on that, but you may want to clarify that more further. Sure. Thank you so much. No, so I, I think the... Uh, First of all, during like with COVID-19, we had tremendous tons of studies focused on the effect and the uh, response in terms of the antibody response. So the amount of studies for COVID was way more than the influenza vaccine per se. Uh, that gives you a lot of clarity in terms of holding medications or not. What is very important is not the type, it's how you respond in the studies. So what the reason why we, we mentioned in COVID, we need to hold, hold after, uh, is that because in the studies, when they assess the response for those who are on versus those who are not. And uh, you notice that there was an increase in the levels, especially when they hold it for a period of one week. And the one week, although it has low level uh, of evidence early on uh, during the uh, recommendation, later on with more studies showing that that approach actually helped enhancing and increasing the level of antibodies. And there is this concept of correlation between the level of antibody and the level of protection. The higher level of your antibodies, the more likely that you will have uh, protection in terms of uh, risk of hospitalization or severity of the disease, not necessarily getting the infection. Okay, so there is Two other questions, they were not part of the, your talk, but maybe you want to shed light on them. One talking about the uh, new recommendation by ACR regarding COVID vaccines. And the other one is basically also uh, dealing with the percentage of people that got COVID-19 from your card. I don't know, that was not part of your project, but you probably have some data to share from your sure. country or from the uh, local area. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yassin. So first, uh, for question one, uh, the, um, the uh, 
uh, the, the first one was the percentage of rheumatologists getting infected with COVID-19. Uh, uh, well, we uh, we did not look into the rheumatologist uh, uh, serology. Uh, that probably a good idea. I have no idea. I have no clue. But to tell you the truth, in terms of the level, if you look at even the patient with rheumatic disease, we looked at the percentage of COVID-19 infection over time. It did it increased significantly with wave uh, with different waves, and now with the Omicron, the spread. You, uh, Dr. Yasser was chatting in the, the just before we uh, go live. There was tons of like, almost everyone you know got uh, the infection at least once. Uh, so I think by this time, the number of people getting uh, COVID nineteen or getting COVID nineteen is not the question. It is the question is how to ensure that people are not getting sick enough to be in the hospital. Um, so that's kind of my response to the first. The second question in terms of the recommendations uh, for the vaccine and uh, connective tissue uh, disease. Um, uh, well, the ACR, the task force uh, focused particularly on the uh, availability of the evidence and uh, the uh, benefit of having the concept is that how can we ensure that you have enough antibodies to protect you against infection, weighing the, this against the risk of flare-up. So in those people who are in deep remission, it is fine to play with the uh, and, uh, with the medications. And we do that all the time with the pre-op assessment, with any other uh, things that we do in daily practice. The challenging in those who are really uh, having active disease or semi-active, the one that flares quickly. And my recommendation in those situation would be, well, stick with what protect protect them against uh, the, uh, the flare-up, i.e. keep them on the medication, but ensure that they have multiple boosts because with multiple boosts on these medications, they are likely to have a level that is likely to capture the, uh, to have some protection against the infection. Add to this, many of our patients have logistic problems accessing anything in life if they are not vaccinated. So it's also a matter of uh, enjoy having availability to walk around uh, freely within their country. So uh, with the health passport. So just keep this in mind. Yeah. I think we have to wrap up Dr. Brahim because we're beyond uh, time. I, there is more questions, but hope we will have a second section. There will be another Q&A. Maybe some will answer some of these questions later after the second part. Thank you very much, Dr. Brahim. I Thank wish you, you so all much. luck. and. Be safe in this uh, fourth or fifth wave of the uh, COVID-19. <laughs> Take care. Sure. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the second part of the COVID-19 section and rheumatic diseases. I'll be happy now to introduce the second part with my colleague, Dr. Fadma Boteban from Kuwait and Dr. Nasra from Oman. This section is being assigned to the research sessions. We have three great abstracts, two from Qatar and one from Kuwait. Uh, they will be an oral presentations and uh, Committees has been assigned an award for the best presentation from these three. I'll have the pleasure to introduce the first speakers and uh, my colleagues will be introducing the other speaker later. So the first speaker is Dr. Karima Bassetti. She's a rheumatology consultant at Hamad Medical Corporation and assistant professor of medicine at Cornell Medicine in Qatar. She graduated from Cornell Medicine in 2011 and got a Qatar academic distinction. She's had an American board certified in internal medicine and rheumatology. She's involved in many research, including the area of interest today. She had completed a master of science in epidemiology and health services research at Cornell University, and also received in 2013 a rheumatology research foundation medical and pediatric resident research award. So uh, Dr. Karima is going to have the uh, first presentation or the first abstract. Uh, she had 10 minutes. Uh, the title of abstract is the point prevalence of coronavirus disease in 2019 in a multi-ethnic cohort of patients with autoimmune rheumatic disease in Qatar. Dr. Karima, the mic is yours. 
Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Karima Bissetti, Rheumatology Consultant at Hamad General Hospital. I would like to start by thanking the organizing committee for this opportunity to present our work on the point prevalence of COVID-19 in a multi-ethnic cohort of patients with autoimmune rheumatic diseases in Qatar. I don't have any conflict uh, of interest to declare. As everyone knows, COVID-19 was declared a pandemic by the WHO on March 11, 2020. Since then, it has affected more than 300 million people around the world with more than 5 million deaths. Our initial knowledge of COVID-19 came from large descriptive studies from China, Europe, and the USA, which identified risk factors for severe COVID-19, including older age, medical conditions such as diabetes, and hypertension. It is still unclear, however, whether patients with autoimmune rheumatic diseases are at an increased risk for COVID-19 or poor outcomes from COVID-19. So why autoimmune rheumatic diseases? Obviously, uh, we're rheumatologists and we're interested in this patient population, but also we all know that patients with autoimmune rheumatic diseases are at increased risk for infection, which is a leading cause of mortality. Patients with RA, for example, are at a higher risk for death. Uh, from infection and of contracting non-fatal uh, infection compared to the general population. Similarly, in lupus, uh, hospitalization rate for a serious infection were, was more than 12 times higher than that of patients without lupus. Uh, if you look at this figure from a, um, a systematic review and meta-analysis of studies looking at the mortality in systemic lupus erythematosus, infection carried more than five, four folds uh, the risk of uh, mortality, which is uh, also higher than cardiovascular disease mortality. There are several factors that contribute to the increased uh, infection risk, including the immune system dysfunction that is intrinsic to autoimmune rheumatic diseases, as well as the frequently associated chronic medical conditions, such as diabetes, which by themselves carry an increased risk of infection. Also, the immunosuppressant therapies, including glucocorticoids used for the treatment of autoimmune rheumatic diseases, are known to increase the risk of infection among other side effects. Someone might argue that uh, specifically with COVID, there are potential protective factors, uh, mainly pertaining to the several disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs, including hydroxychloroquine, tocilizumab, paracetinib, uh, TNF inhibitors, and glucocorticoids, which were or are investigated or being used for the management of COVID-19, taking advantage of their antiviral and immunomodulatory effects. So what is the um, exact risk of um, COVID-19 auto, uh, autoimmune rheumatic diseases? Um, what we know so far is a variable rate of COVID-19 in patients with uh, autoimmune rheumatic diseases uh, ranging from 0.1 to 8% uh, from different regions in the world. These rates also differ in how they compare to the reference or general population. And obviously we have uh, limited data on the rate of COVID-19 in uh, these patients in our region. So we aimed to estimate the point prevalence of COVID-19 in patients with autoimmune rheumatic diseases during the pandemic's peak in Qatar, uh, a country with a 2.8 million multinational population, one of the, one of the highest COVID-19 rates worldwide, uh, estimated at more than 40,000 cases per 1 million population by September 2020, and to evaluate factors associated with COVID-19 in this patient population. Using a cross-sectional survey of patients with autoimmune rheumatic diseases who were residing in Qatar between April 1st and, April, uh, and uh, July 31st, 2020, we did a purposive, purposive sampling uh, to select participants from the repository of patients with autoimmune rheumatic diseases following at Hamad Medical Corporation. We also advertised for the study through the hospital's social media ports to make sure to include patients uh, seeking care in other uh, health sectors. Eligible patients were physician confirmed uh, diagnosis of an autoimmune rheumatic diseases, had 18 years of age or older, and were able to complete the interview telephonically, as well as were willing to provide verbal informed consent. We collected information on patient demographics, chronic medical conditions, uh, non-autoimmune rheumatic disease medications of interest like ACE inhibitors and ARBs, um, uh, IRD specific data, including the specific uh, diagnosis, disease duration, disease severity based on the documentation in electronic uh, medical records. Uh, this was categorized into remission versus active. And uh, the most recent uh, autoimmune uh, disease medication regimen the patient was on. We also collected information on seasonal influenza vaccination, any close contact with COVID-19 uh, patients, either occurring at home or in the workplace, and the diagnosis of COVID-19 based on a PCR test. We described the data and then compared uh, the uh, variables between patients who contracted COVID-19 and those who didn't. 
We used multivariate logistic regression analysis to identify variables independently associated with COVID-19. And uh, we carried a stratified analysis in the sub group of patients with exposure to a positive COVID-19 case. At the end of the enrollment uh, period, we uh, had 700 patients with the mean age of 43 years, 73% uh, were women. Uh, as expected, uh, the majority uh, were, uh, had rheumatoid arthritis in 37% of cases and SLE in 22% of cases. 26% had active disease at the time of the interview. Uh, hydroxychloroquine was the most commonly used treatment followed by methotrexate, then uh, TNF inhibitors in 18%. Only 16% of patients were on glucocorticoids. Of these patients, we identified 75 who tested positive for COVID-19 uh, with a point prevalence of 11%, 95% confidence interval, 9% to 13%. When compared to um, uh, patients without COVID-19, those with COVID-19 had a higher rate of um, male uh, sex in 44% compared to 25%. They also had a higher rate of diabetes and interstitial lung disease. Obesity, however, was lower in patients who contracted COVID-19. Close contact as expected was much higher in patients who contracted COVID-19, 60% uh, compared to 7% uh, with a p-value of 0.01. When looking at the autoimmune uh, rheumatic disease specific variables, uh, we observed that patients with COVID-19 were less likely to have SLE, 11% compared to 23%, and uh, less likely to be on uh, hydroxychloroquine and mycophenolate, medications frequently used in SLE. No differences were observed in the other variables. Now, when, compare, when uh, looking at patients who had uh, contact with uh, COVID-19, uh, which were 86, Patients who were on hydroxychloroquine treatment were less likely to develop COVID-19, 35% uh, compared to 65%, while patients without hydroxychloroquine treatment were more likely to develop COVID-19, 72% compared to uh, 27%. Hydroxychloroquine, as well as other variables of interest uh, clinically or uh, from the univariate analysis, were included in, in the uh, multiregression model, which identify male gender, um, uh, as a, uh, a um, uh, significantly associated factor with an odds ratio of 2.56. Close contact uh, with a COVID-19 patient increased the risk of COVID-19 by uh, almost 30-fold. Other variables, although carried a tendency toward either increasing the risk, such as diabetes, or decreasing the risk, as, as, such as in the case of SLE or hydroxychloroquine, but this did not reach uh, uh, statistical significance. So the point prevalence uh, in, in our patient population was 11%, which was higher than the estimated prevalence in Qatar's general population, where the prevalence rate was estimated as 3.6% uh, by the end of the uh, uh, enrollment uh, period. Um, this uh, rate also seems to be higher than the rates reported in autoimmune rheumatic diseases in other countries, uh, which, as mentioned before, is extremely variable. Uh, in Italy, for example, the COVID-19 rate ranged anywhere from 0.2 to 7.2 percent, depending on the definition of COVID-19, so suspected versus confirmed cases, and the region of uh, interest. In the USA, a large cohort of patients with autoimmune rheumatic diseases estimated the rate at 5.6 uh, percent. Um, and in, in the meta-analysis of uh, a multiple observational study, the full COVID-19 prevalence was 0.01 in uh, our patient population, which was significantly higher than controls with an odds ratio of 2.1. Uh, our study suggests that maybe the rate of COVID-19 is ver is, uh, varies depending on the, um, on the uh, a, a disease, uh, specific disease, um, potentially a lower risk in SLE, like previously uh, shown um, by a study uh, by Pavlos and all, where SLE patients had a lower ra rate of uh, SLE. Uh, similarly, hydroxychloroquine carries an interesting association with COVID-19. In our study, although it's not statistically significant, uh, hydroxychloroquine use was more common in non-COVID-19 patients, and this was previously shown in other studies as well. In the study by Song and all, uh, the odds ratio um, for hydroxychloroquine was 0.09. Uh, 
Our data did not show an association between glucocorticoid uh, use and COVID-19. However, this might be due to the low percentage of patients uh, taking glucocorticoids. And it's important to also point to the importance of com uh, other comorbid condi conditions in defining the risk of COVID-19 in this patient population. Close contact uh, was important, uh, pointing to the importance of protective measures such as social distancing. And uh, like in, uh, in our uh, autoimmune rheumatic disease population, men uh, were also found to, to be twice as likely to become infected by COVID-19 in the general population in Qatar. Some strengths uh, of our study include uh, the fact that it's one of the first to report the rate of COVID-19 in patients with, uh, in the Gulf region. Uh, the large sample size, as well as the uh, large number of variables examined, uh, including uh, multiple rheumatic diseases. Uh, the study center uh, uh, is one of the main providers for uh, COVID-19, as well as uh, patients with autoimmune rheumatic diseases, which makes this cohort reflective of the uh, patient population in Qatar. Uh, all COVID-19 cases were confirmed by PCR testing, and the country's policy on extensive contract tracing and uh, massive testing um, uh, made it very difficult to miss asymptomatic patients uh, with COVID-19, especially after uh, positive contact. Uh, the study participants uh, were able to call back and report on any positive contact or positive uh, PCR testing as well. Uh, the, the study has limitations, however, including the study survey methodology, which depends on the participants' recollection of information. Uh, some variables were difficult uh, to ascertain, uh, including disease activity. The population in Qatar remains unique uh, in its uh, composition with higher male uh, population in general, and of course, the lack of control group, which is uh, one important uh, limitation. In conclusion, in our multi-ethnic population um, in uh, the GCC, we found that uh, uh, the rate of um, COVID-19 in patients with autoimmune rheumatic diseases is 11%. This prevalence is overall higher than the global estimates um, and adds to the substantial variability in the re reported COVID-19 prevalence in patients with autoimmune rheumatic diseases. It doesn't seem to be uh, driven by disease-specific variables or, or comorbid uh, conditions. Of course, the lack of a better understanding of the true risk of uh, in patients with autoimmune rheumatic diseases um, makes it uh, uh, challenging for us as uh, rheumatologists as well as for patients uh, during this uh, pandemic. Uh, I will finish by thanking uh, our uh, rheumatology division at HMC who contributed a lot to the care of patients with COVID-19 uh, as well as the care of autoimmune uh, uh, rheumatic disease patients during this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Karima. And now we are going and uh, proceed with the next uh, presentation, which is going to be by uh, Dr. Fatma Baron. Uh, Dr. Fatma is a specialist in internal uh, medicine and adult uh, rheumatology at Al Jahra Hospital in Kuwait. She obtained her medical degree from uh, UK. She completed her postgraduate medical training in Al Kuwait, and she is a Kuwaiti board certified uh, internist. She completed her fellowship training in adult rheumatology by the Royal College of Physicians, Ireland. She has a growing interest in rheumatic disease in pregnancy and connective tissue disease. She is going to present to us her abstract about rheumatologic aspect of COVID-19 pandemic, a practical uh, resource for physicians in Kuwait and Gulf region, as recommended by, uh, as recommended, uh, by the Kuwait Association of uh, Rheumatology. Dr. Fatma, the mic is yours. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, colleagues. I'd like to uh, thank first the organizing committee for uh, giving us this opportunity to present our set of recommendations for um, rheumatologists and physicians um, in regards to treating patients with rheumatic diseases during the pandemic uh, of COVID-19. So I'll tell you a little bit of how the idea was established. If you see from the graphs that around April, there is an increased number of active cases of COVID-19 in Kuwait where the number jumped from hundreds to thousands. 
And our aim of establishing the guidance was to support physicians who are treating rheumatology patients with COVID-19 on the wards or in outpatient settings, and as well as improving the treatment experience of patients with rheumatic and musculoskeletal diseases during the pandemic. Those uh, with the newly diagnosed um, rheumatic diseases or those who has established um, disease. Another aim of our guidelines was actually to provide healthcare professional, professionals who has um, rheumatic disease and answer their special um, questions. So with an invitation from uh, the CAR president, uh, 25 members of CAR actually met first on the 6th of April 2020 to address the most frequently asked questions concerning uh, our cohort during the pandemic. Those frequently asked questions were collected and addressed and another meeting was um, held between 12th and 15th of April 2020 by a task force which consists of um, 12 members. During that time, the frequently asked questions were evaluated and discussed and a constant was reached among the team to identify the best approach for treating patients with rheumatic diseases during the pandemic, as well as addressing other points such as risk uh, assessment, prevention, <coughs> and um, other important questions that we encountered during uh, the uh, daily practice. So the final vote was obtained uh, by the end of um, April and around um, the 21st of April, a final guidance was established, which was approved in June 2020 by the Minister um, of Health and was included in their policy. So the recommendation actually were um, summarized in a, time, in a table uh, with a 15 uh, main set of recommendation, which I'm going to go through them uh, more in details in the next few slides. <laughs> so the recommendation actually um, covered 11 main points, which we're going to cover the first one, which is stated as a general statement for patients with rheumatic uh, disease. So our set of uh, recommendation were to keep um, social distances of around two meter, uh, to master uh, hand washing, um, hygiene and techniques, and to wear surgical masks in uh, public places. Also encourage patients with a travel history or contact with um, COVID cases to contact their uh, preventive um, health clinics, as well as follow the rules of uh, Ministry of Health. The second part of the recommendation was answering the question where there, our patients were more vulnerable to um, severe uh, COVID-19 uh, infection. However, there is no such association has been established yet. So the our set of recommendation was for those patients is to follow uh, the general precautions uh, that I've mentioned earlier, and there is no extra uh, precautions they have to uh, follow. The third set of the recommendation was actually to um, look at um, the general statements for healthcare professionals in a way and rheumatologists themselves um, in regards to the outpatient follow-up, to the laboratory, laboratory monitoring and uh, for the um, hospital visits. So our advice on outpatient follow-ups was to um, <clears throat> rearrange the follow-up uh, in OPD and extend them to every four to six months if patients were stable and encourage telephone or video codes um, to reduce the frequency as well of the laboratory monitoring if possible and to encourage the patients to minimize their visit uh, to the hospitals and to use the home delivery service for the medications dispensing. In this section as well, we encourage rheumatologists to uh, contact the local authorities to make sure that immunomodulators are available for um, um, our cohort of patients as well as the COVID-19 patients such as tocilizumab. The fourth part of the recommendation was to answer the question where their healthcare professionals were more uh, prone to have severe infection and considered as a high risk. So um, our answers to our uh, colleagues who answer is whether or not they are at high risk of uh, getting the COVID infection. What we advised them was uh, to ensure that their uh, line manager and occupational health department in the hospital know about their um, diagnosis, their medication and scope of practice, and they can uh, discuss that on individual basis with their managers. 
And the major part of the recommendation was uh, to answer the question or to um, address a set of recommendation on how to um, treat patients with rheumatic disease during the pandemic. And this was actually nicely summarized in an algorithm, which I'm going to go um, into details now. So uh, our set of recommendation for those uh, patients who are stable uh, with established diagnosis of rheumatic uh, disease, who has no um, evidence of exposure or infection, is to continue same treatment. And our advice to the rheumatologist is to consider those who are on IV uh, routes such as tocilizumab or uh, abatacep to switch those patients on subcutaneous uh, forms if possible. Another <clears throat> recommendation on that set of uh, recommendation was uh, for um, the nurses, the staff nurses, and uh, the head nurse of each infusion unit or daycare need to contact the patient to prior to the attendance for IV medications to establish whether or not they were on um, high risk for um, COVID-19, either by exposure or infected. And for those with highly or suspected for to get uh, COVID-19, uh, we advise them to uh, be checked and tested before attending the infusion unit or the daycare. And for those patients with a uh, flare but has no um, infection or uh, exposure to COVID-19 cases, we advise to avoid hospital admission and treat these patients as an outpatient uh, setting. Um, we may consider a short course of uh, steroids or even using NSAIDs and calcicine. For those with um, moderate to high disease activity, um, we advise to optimize their dose of DMARDs, including biogic, and um, follow um, the guidelines for treatment for rheumatic disease uh, if there is no suspicion of COVID-19. For those with patients who are newly diagnosed with rheumatic disease in outpatient settings, what we advise is to um, start patients with um, DMARDs if indicated. Uh, we don't have any recommendation on which or um, <clears throat> any limitations. However, we advise um, rheumatologists at that time um, to use a shorter half-life uh, medications um, such as uh, salazopyrin and Embril and Jack and avoiding long acting uh, drugs such as leclonomide and fleximab or rituximab. So what our set of recommendation for those who has um, confirmed COVID-19 infection or has been suspected to have COVID-19 infection. So um, all the patients were advised to um, contact their local preventative medicine um, clinic and follow the um, guidelines from uh, the Ministry of Health. All confirmed uh, cases um, need to be admitted to the hospital. And I think this was the recommendation we made earlier in the, in the um, consensus. However, nowadays with more exposure to cases and we are more aware of the disease itself, we tend to treat patients with um, mild to moderate um, <clears throat> symptoms uh, as an outpatient setting with a close monitoring from the rheumatologist. So all patients who are at low risk of a flare and in remission uh, with um, contact or confirmed COVID-19 infection, we advise them to stop all their immunomodulators except from hydroxychloroquine, salazopyrin, and long-term steroids. However, there are certain cases where uh, medications need to be um, revised or kept, especially for those who are diagnosed with life-threatening um, diseases such as vasculitis and need to be on their immunosuppressant. Again, we discourage uh, to stop uh, corticosteroids appropriately and um, suggest to keep the patient a same dose uh, of their long-term uh, steroid doses. So the medication usually be stopped during the infection, which is around a week, and then we can start the uh, medications uh, 10 to 14 days after patients being um, asymptomatic. So what we do for those with confirmed uh, cases of uh, COVID-19 infection who has mild to moderate disease, our recommendation is to treat the flares with the minimum number of immunosuppressant agents as possible. And uh, we can use hydroxychloroquine, salazopyrin, and tracheal injection or short courses of low doses steroids at that time. For those who have severe active rheumatic disease, um, such as vasculitis or lupus nephritis, what we advise is um, to admit those patients to hospital and treat patients uh, case by case. 
So um, another um, part of the consensus or the guidelines that we wrote was uh, discussing our rheumatology medications and COVID-19. And um, at that time, we uh, recommend that hydroxychloroquine only be um, started to those who are um, having a disease indicated for treatment with hydroxychloroquine and not to start a newly patient or start patients with established rheumatic disease with um, hydroxychloroquine, not to get a false sense of protection against COVID-19 infection. Steroids, at the time we were under guidance, we say that there is no rule for steroids in uh, treating COVID-19, and that was actually before the uh, results of recovery trial. And if you are interested, uh, we have an update from CAR, which is a great association of rheumatologists on using immunomodulators in COVID-19. I presented this nicely in a poster during uh, this conference. If you're interested, you can have a look at our um, poster. So the last set of um, recommendation or the part of the guidance was uh, to ask the frequently, to answer the frequently asked questions. And the first question that we encountered uh, very common on the words at that time was whether hydroxychloroquine should be started to patients. Um, and um, we recommend that hydroxychloroquine has no rule in COVID-19 profit access. What about steroids? Can we dis uh, discontinue steroid for confirmed cases uh, of COVID? And the answer would be no, keep them on their uh, routine dose of steroids and do not stop the corticosteroids abruptly. Will DMARS be uh, discontinued during the pandemic? Again, for those who are stable and has no uh, suspicion of COVID-19, continue the same uh, medication, same routine, same regimen, same dose. Yet, if they have a confirmed case of COVID-19, then our recommendation would be stop their immunomodulators except from steroid hydroxychloroquine and salazopyrin. And again, there is a certain um, disease or situation where we might cont may continue um, immunosuppressant, and you can find this in details in our um, guidance, the hard copy of it. Um, should patients take in DMRNs to be off work? Again, uh, we encourage patients uh, with DMRNs actually to follow um, the preventative measures such as wearing masks, avoiding uh, mass um, social gatherings, and um, to uh, master their hand hygiene. Um, for those patients who are at high risk, especially those who work in a crowded um, office, they need to discuss the matter directly with their employers for a special accommodation or a rearrangement such as working from home. I would like to thank you uh, for listening um, to us today. And if you're interested, we have another uh, poster um, in regards to um, patients' attitude um, towards COVID-19 vaccine in Kuwait and assessing the short-term adverse events among the patients with um, rheumatic and musculoskeletal disease. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fatma, for this uh, informative uh, presentation of abstract. Now, please allow me to introduce our third and last speaker for this COVID-19 and rheumatic diseases abstract session, Dr. Omar Said. Dr. Omar is a rheumatology consultant at the rheumatology division, Hamad Medical Corporation. He graduated from Misri University for Science and Technology in Cairo and completed an internal medicine residency program and rheumatology fellowship training at Hamid Medical Corporation. Dr. Omar completed his internal medicine Arab board and became a member of the Royal College of Physicians in UK. He has many publications in peer-reviewed journals and got grants from medical research centers for many research projects in rheumatology and osteoporosis field. He is a lead member in the Qatar FRAX developing team and a member in Ministry of Public Health Osteoporosis Task Force in Qatar. Uh, Dr. Omar will be uh, presenting an abstract titled Humoral Response to Messenger RNA-Based COVID-19 Vaccine in Patients with Autoimmune Rheumatic Diseases, a Retrospective Comparative Study. And please uh, remember to uh, leave your questions in the Q&A box and we will get uh, back to them at the end of the session. Uh, Dr. Omar, the mic is yours.
Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is Omar Al Saeed. I am a rheumatologist in Hamad Medical Corporation. And thank you for the organizing committee for giving us this opportunity to present our uh, study. So I have nothing to disclose regarding the current uh, presentation. And, the, and also I would like to thank the co-authors of this paper. Uh, the title of this paper, as you see, it's the humoral response to uh, COVID-19 vaccine in, in, in patients with autoimmune rheumatic disease. It is a retrospective comparative study. So as we know, the uh, BioNTech vaccine, uh, which was the first FDA approved vaccine, initially appeared effective and safe. But whether uh, that is true for patients with autoimmune rheumatic disease remain a matter of concern. So as early study didn't include patients with autoimmune rheumatic disease and immunocompromised patients. However, uh, data have uh, gradually accumulated. So advances in manufacturing have paved the way to target immunomodulators and anti-cytokines agent to treat autoimmune rheumatic disease such as CD20 depleting agent and uh, inhibitor of Chinese kinase, tumor necrosis factor and interleukin-6 inhibitor. Understanding the immunogenicity of COVID-19 mRNA-based vaccine in patients with autoimmune rheumatic disease receiving such agents is increasing. The aim of our study was to evaluate whether the humoral immune response to COVID-19 mRNA-based vaccines differs between patients without and with, her, and with autoimmune rheumatic disease under treatment with immunomodulator. So the method was a patient who had autoimmune rheumatic disease but where COVID-19 infection naive had two doses of mRNA-based vaccines and had been tested for SARS-CoV-19 uh, SARS infection uh, is a protein antibody at least two two weeks after the second dose of uh, second dose of the vaccination were identified from our medical records. Control patient had the same selection criteria as the patient of the autoimmune rheumatic disease, but were are uh, but were free from autoimmune rheumatic disease and other inflammatory conditions. So the electronic medical records of these patients were retrospectively reviewed to capture the demographic data, autoimmune rheumatic disease medications, dates of vaccination, comorbidities, and underlying autoimmune rheumatic disease. These patients, uh, the case groups, were assigned into six subgroups according to their autoimmune rheumatic disease medication. These groups uh, were methotrexate monotherapy, conventional synthetic DMRDs combination therapy, TNF alpha inhibitor, rotoximab, and uh, JAK inhibitor and IL6 inhibitor. The humoral response were assessed using Elixis kits, uh, which measures the titer of anti SARS coronavirus 2 S protein antibodies. And the samples were considered non reactive and poorly reactive when the titers is, uh, uh, were less than uh, 0.8 and less than 132 uh, retrospectively. So uh, the mean of the S protein IgG antibodies was compared between the control and each subgroups of the cases by using independent and bare T test and chi square for the above mentioned titer cutoffs. So uh, the results, the baseline characteristics for the uh, case group for the autoimmune rheumatic disease. So we have identified uh, 110 patients uh, with mean age of 47 and predominantly they, they were females at 60%. And the subgroups, uh, we had uh, 15 patients on methotrexate monotherapy and 26 on combination uh, conventional synthetic DMRDs, TNF-alpha inhibitor 46, rotoximab uh, 20, and JAK inhibitor 12 patients and IL-6 seven patients. For the comparator group, uh, we have 20 patients the mean age was uh, 59 and uh, uh, females were 75%. So if we compare the baseline characteristic for the between the cases and the comparator group, um, we, uh, as we can see here, the, uh, the mean age is higher in the control group with p-value is uh, 0.001. And uh, regarding the gender difference, uh, they are equal. So this is the main uh, slides for our results. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, we have six subgroups for the cases. We have conventional synthetic DMR combination therapy, methotrexate monotherapy, TNF-alpha, rotuximab, and JAK inhibitor and IL-6 inhibitors. And we have the control group, as the control group will be uh, the reference for the other group for the comparison. 
So we have the, in the first row, we have the uh, main, the overall mean of the uh, S-protein IgG antibody and the p-value. And then we have the zero, uh, zero conversion, zero positive, and uh, the percentage of the titer, I mean, the percentage of the patient who, who had titer more than 0.8 and a poorly reactive patient uh, in percentage and, uh, and poorly reaction, as we mentioned, when the titer is less than 132. So we will start with the uh, first group, the conventional synthetic DMR disease group. Uh, as you see, the overall mean of the IgG antibody, I mean, the S-protein IgG antibody title is comparable to the, con uh, to the control with insignificant p-value. And the rate of zero conversion, the percentage is comparable between the, uh, uh, the, the DMRD uh, group and the control group. Regarding the methotrexate uh, uh, monotherapy group, Again, the overall mean of the uh, IgG antibody titer is comparable between the between uh, with the controls, and the rate of uh, percentage of uh, zero conversion is also comparable, uh, and the poly reaction is also uh, comparable to the control group. For the TNF alpha inhibitor group, it's the same. Uh, the overall mean is comparable to the control with insignificant p-value. And 100% of the uh, of the TNF uh, alpha group they uh, get zero converted. They have uh, the antibody that the titer is detected, and poly reaction was only in 19% of the patient. However, the p value is insignificant. For the rituximab group, <coughs> the overall mean is, uh, as you see here, the overall mean of the uh, S-protein antibody titer is lower in the rituximab group, and the p-value is significant. It is 0.012, and uh, the rate of zero conversion, the percentage is also lower. It's 65% they have zero converted uh, compared to the control, with p-value is 0.004, and the poly reaction is the same. Uh, it's lower in the rituximab group with significant p-value, 0.028. JAK inhibitor group, they have a similar uh, uh, mean of uh, S-protein titer with insignificant p-value uh, and the rate of the percentage of zero conversion and poly reaction is, uh, is comparable to the control group with insignificant p-value. The same findings were found in the IL-6 inhibitor group. They have comparable mean uh, S-protein titer to the control and the rate of zero conversion is 100% and poly reaction is 14% with insignificant p-value. So if we, if we took the table as overall, as we see here, uh, the rituximab group is, uh, uh, is the only group who had lower uh, uh, titer of the uh, S-protein titer as overall, and the rate, the rate of uh, the percentage of zero conversion is lower uh, in, uh, and also the poly and the uh, the titer is all at the cutoff at the cut of 132 is also lower compared to the control group. So uh, in conclusion, so conventional synthetic DMRDs, TNF alpha, JAK inhibitor, and IL-6 inhibitor were associated with comparable zero conversion rates to mRNA-based vaccines, whereas rituximab was significantly associated with decreased immunogenicity. So this is uh, some of my references, and uh, thank you very much.
Hey, welcome back everyone. We will start now our Q&A session. We have all the speakers and all the moderators with us for this uh, session. Uh, so uh, I would like to start with a question from myself directed to uh, Dr. Omar. Uh, Dr. Omar, I have a question for you. Now, uh, regarding the uh, subgroups of uh, medication that you have used for your uh, abstract, was there any subgroup analysis for patients on steroids? I, I haven't noticed that you have noticed that you have not chosen a steroid as one of the subgroups. Yes, actually, the uh, in our cohort, we have very few patients uh, using steroid. They are, uh, let's say, three or two, I would I remember. For that, we didn't do sub analysis uh, because of this uh, very few number because it will not give us a uh, good information. So for that, we, we didn't do that for the uh, steroid because as I said, it's only three patients, I remember. Okay, and what about the other groups with all the biological therapies? Were they as a monotherapy or they were they associated with other uh, drugs or steroid even? Because you know, if, if uh, one of the subgroups was having another drug, a combination therapy, or with a steroid, or has been recently receiving steroid, that can be a co-founding factor for your results. Yes, we know that this is a, not a prospective study, it's a retrospective. So for, for that, we have maybe a difficulty to, uh, to identify or to make the patient a certain medication. For example, the conventional synthetic DMRDs group, they are in a combination group uh, uh, of DMRDs. And a few of them, they are, none of them, they are on steroid, actually. Uh, uh, Reduximab, I mean, the, let's say the TNF group, uh, they are in uh, plus minus a conventional synthetic DMRDs. They are not purely on TNF. Uh, the Reduximab group, uh, this group is the, uh, in this group, we have three patients on steroid. And in, other, in addition to other uh, uh, DMRDs like Plaquenil and some of them in Methotrexate as well. So they are, it's not uh, clean, but uh, we have just a general hint from the, the table that I showed at the end that the only group that showed uh, less immunogenicity is the rituximab group. And we did uh, univariate analysis uh, for each medication and we found the same that the rituximab is the only one associated with uh, uh, low immunogenicity. Okay, thank you. Okay, if any other moderator have any questions to ask? Sure. Uh, I'll go with the second question. So this question is uh, addressed to both Dr. Fatma and Dr. Kramer. You're welcome to answer both. There is more than one question in the chat box talking about the mode of action of vaccination. Basically talking about the killed vaccine versus the mRNA-based uh, vaccinations. I know I'm Qatar and uh, they have more than one uh, vaccines. In Kuwait, we only have two. We have the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine plus the Oxford vaccine, but in Qatar, you probably you have more than uh, these two. So the questions basically all goes around, around which one would you recommend as a mode of action for our rheumatological disease patient as an autoimmune uh, patient? You can either Dr. Karima start or Dr. Avadma and then Do you want to start, Dr. Fatma? So in Qatar, we actually have uh, the Pfizer-Moderna uh, vaccines, which have the same uh, mode of action, and the AstraZeneca vaccine. Um, and most of our uh, rheumatic disease patients uh, were among the first to get vaccinated in the country as a priority uh, because of their uh, risk factors and received either Pfizer or Moderna. Uh, so in terms of, uh, and I don't know if Dr. Omar has uh, any information about uh, uh, differences in immunogenicity between uh, the two vaccinations uh, versus AstraZeneca, which I don't believe um, uh, many of our patients received uh, as a vaccination. Uh, so in terms of what's better for our patients with autoimmune rheumatic diseases, I, I don't think I have the answer to that based on our data from Qatar. Um, if you don't mind, I can answer this question, not from my presentation, but with abstract that we had actually uh, about our uh, work on vaccine in rheumatic patients cohort. So actually the main um, vaccines that was received in Kuwait was around Pfizer. There was like 64% of our patients received Pfizer and the other 40 kind of percent received the um, Oxford um, 
AstraZeneca um, vaccine. And looking at the side effects, around 80% of the patients combined, the visor and the expert actually has very mild um, side effects um, that lasted less than five days. But when we comes to uh, the rate of disease flare, we had only five patients who actually flared. Mild flare, we would say, that did not necessitate a visit to their rheumatologist. Um, Three of them were on Oxford and two of them were on Pfizer. And that's of about, about a population of 504. So we would say um, to me in my uh, study, um, the flare or side effects from these um, vaccination um, in my study was actually unremarkable, I would say. <clears throat> So uh, probably I will uh, comment on this. Uh, as per the ACR uh, recommendation, which is uh, the latest uh, one, version five, they are recommending actually patient with rheumatic disease to be given the messenger RNA uh, vaccine. But if it is happened and the patient had already taken, you know, other, uh, other type of uh, vaccine, they are recommending the booster dose should be of messenger RNA type of vaccine, whether it is Pfizer or Moderna. Okay, and I will take this, uh, this opportunity because we cannot end it, uh, this uh, session without highlighting the, all the new recommendations that came uh, uh, from the ACR, the recent one in 2022. The major changes happened uh, that now they are uh, making all the uh, DMARD, even for the first and second uh, dose whether the patient on uh, uh, sulfasalazine, mycophenolate, azathioprine, all of them should be held for one to two weeks after getting uh, uh, the vaccine. This was uh, true for the booster dose, for, I mean, from their uh, recommendation for the booster dose, but now even for the first or second dose, we have to hold this medication, if it is possible, of course, according to the patient clinical status for one to two week and they have mentioned that they didn't reach concerns regarding the biological therapy uh, regarding the anti tnf the interleukin 17 inter uh, 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 23 regarding whether we should stop or not so this is is left to the physician to decide uh, about it uh, the other changes I, I think they're continuing the same i mean the rituximab of course i mean you need to wait till uh, two to four weeks before the next dose so that you can uh, give them uh, the vaccine. And uh, of course, for the uh, what is called uh, uh, the cyclophosphamide, you should time it so that it occur one week. Uh, I mean, patient should be, and you should receive the dose and then one week you can uh, give the vaccine. So the major change is that all the oral uh, DMR should be uh, stopped as well, except of course, as all of you know, for the hydroxychloroquine and the prednisolone, uh, I mean, you can continue. This is from uh, before, even for the booster dose, this was the same uh, recommendation. I will move on now with a, a question, unless someone of the moderator would like to add any other uh, points, probably I have missed it. If no, we will move on. So the next question, they said there are many recent reports at, at uh, attracting rituximab towards COVID-19 outcome. What do you think uh, of this observation? And do you recommend uh, changing rituximab to other DMARD? DMARD? So I will leave it uh, to Dr. Karim and Dr. Fatma to answer and even Dr. Omar, if you'd like. I Anyone can go ahead. Sure. Um, it is uh, the, the case that uh, most studies, including the studies from the uh, Rheumatology Global Registry, uh, showing uh, an association between rituximab and worse outcomes from COVID-19 uh, in patients with autoimmune uh, rheumatic diseases. Um, uh, and uh, Dr. Omar might speak to that uh, from the uh, data from Qatar uh, specifically. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, it, obviously, it is a risk benefit uh, discussion when it comes to treatment in patients with autoimmune uh, rheumatic diseases. Um, and it all depends on the indication for rit rituximab timing, especially when it comes to vaccination, the importance of vaccination uh, before initiating uh, rituximab if, if uh, time allows. Um, so it's not um, uh, in patients who are already on rituximab and, and doing well, um, uh, one must uh, uh, consider the risk, obviously, uh, try to time the vaccination appropriately to uh, provide the patients with the appropriate protection. 
protection against COVID-19, uh, but potentially continue treatment if no alternatives, especially if no alternatives exist. Uh, Dr. Omar, do you want to comment more on that? Yes, uh, it was uh, proven by large scale studies by the Global Registry and from also from Qatar. Uh, uh, it's the same uh, case that what, what you mentioned that the worst outcome is associated with uh, rotoximab use. Another point that I need to highlight that unfortunately, uh, rotoximab user, even if we delayed rotoximab dose uh, four weeks uh, uh, post vaccination, unfortunately, the immunogenicity is fades very fast. Even if we give the patient chance to get the vaccine four weeks and then they give the rotoximab, the immunogenicity of this patient is fading very fast comparing to the other DMRDs. For that, uh, rotoximab uh, is not uh, a good option uh, for, for both things, for the worst outcome and for the efficacy of the vaccine. For that, uh, really, it is very, very recommended that if there is another alternative therapy like the TNF, uh, IL-6, uh, especially in connective tissue disease, not we, we started to see, for example, through their patient, there is now st start to, uh, to hear some evidence for using Actimra or uh, Tocilizumab. Mm -hmm. So if we can switch the patient to such medication, uh, it will be great during, especially during the current pandemic. Uh, Dr. Nasr, if I, may, if I may comment on this uh, as well. In Kuwait, yeah. we have uh, analysis of our data from the uh, COVID-19 Global Registry, and we're going to publish that uh, soon, inshallah. Uh, we had 65 patients, and we had three mortalities. All of them were on rituximab. So that goes exactly with the with the global data yeah. of the high risk of the rituximab. And we have non-official recommendations among ourselves in Kuwait, uh, in the Kuwait Association of Rheumatology, among the rheumatologists, that we should try to avoid starting new patients yeah. on rituximab for the time being till we are done with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Yeah. Uh, can I Thank add you. a Thank little you. bit of a comment, Dr. Nasra, if you don't yeah. mind? I love the discussion. This is Ibrahim and Maghlouth yeah. again. Yeah, you uh, can go, Ibrahim, before I thank start. You. Yeah. Thank you. So I, this is a wonderful discussion. I just want to draw the attention of a couple of things. The people who receive rituximab have a, a confounded by indication, i.e. most of those patients have the risk factors that put them at risk of bad outcomes. Talking about interstitial lung disease, which is the major risk independent of uh, not necessarily rituximab. And that's why when you look at the even the global registry on at a total, when they did in their initial report, the major confounder for the medication was the presence of underlying comorbidities for which rituximab is uh, used. So that's number one. Number two, it is a risk benefit ratio for sure. For example, if you have a wonderful medication alternative to rituximab, by all means, that's a very good option. But switching someone, for example, with uh, 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 ANCA-associated vasculitis who has been maintained, and we know that they have very high risk of having a relapse in many of the major organ, may not be the best option. In my opinion, this should be tailored by, case by case, knowing that the medication is not the only reason why they get worse. Number three, which is very important, is the utilization of the uh, antibodies. And we know that those patients who have been limited or reduced in terms of the antibody levels might benefit from either the mobilization of antibodies uh, in terms of uh, administration of antibodies uh, for uh, or plas even plasma in patient who have hypogammic globinemia in the context of rituximab. So one of the, maybe the question, uh, I will end it, I don't want to take a lot of time because it's an interesting topic. Uh, question, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Kuwait, in their analysis of this rituximab patient, did they uh, have uh, any, did it, they, can they comment about the level of immunoglobulin that those patients had uh, at the time or prior to the uh, uh, infection, uh, uh, prior to their uh, worst outcomes? Uh, because that's an, an important uh, also confounder. Yeah, uh, I would like also to comment regarding uh, rituximab, and uh, I will take this opportunity actually to tell you about the result of our study that we did it here in uh, Oman, and I would like to thank all the team that they have involved in this study. We were part of the COVID Alliance uh, uh, a global uh, group for COVID-19 study. We had around almost 113 patients 
we had the same actually finding that rituximab was significantly associated with higher uh, uh, mortality. This was the only biologic that was associated with the uh, mortality rate. We had a mortality rate of 3.5% uh, uh, in comparison to the general population here in Oman. It was around almost 1.5. So our patient, I mean, with rheumatic disease, they, they were three times had a higher uh, risk of mortality. All other medication, including anti-TNF, including uh, DMAD, I mean, they didn't have a uh, a significant yeah. association with uh, uh, yeah. mortality. Now, regarding uh, whether, I mean, we are going, I mean, my personal uh, uh, opinion that uh, I will not recom uh, recommend rituximab for uh, everyone. I think uh, uh, I will be going probably with Dr. Uh, Ibrahim uh, opinion. I think you should take it, I mean, uh, patient uh, uh, by patient. But what I am doing that I make sure before giving any patient rituximab that they have received all the, the doses. By now, uh, here in Oman, almost like 80% of the population are vaccinated with the second dose. So now I am making sure that all the patients who I'm going to give rituximab that they take their third dose before giving uh, uh, rituximab and I'm giving them not as per what actually what is uh, recommended the two to four weeks for me, four weeks and above. They should come to me to get their rituximab after four weeks. So probably five or six weeks from their uh, last dose of uh, uh, vaccine. Uh, this is one. Meanwhile, I can manage them with other medication. I mean, if I can uh, uh, do that, whether with other any other uh, modality of uh, treatment till they get their uh, uh, COVID vaccine uh, dose. So uh, this is our experience here in Oman, and this is my personal opinion. I don't, if anyone else have, because this is really a very important topic, and we should really, I mean, all of us, I mean, have a, a concern regarding uh, rituximab in this uh, patient. If uh, yeah. Uh, can I have a comment, please? Yes, yeah, go ahead, Dr. Omar. Regarding the interval of the rituximab, I know that um, uh, most of the recommendation is a Q6 month, and we know that some patients, they are uh, in remission even uh, beyond six months. So that it's also during the pandemic now, it's useful to use the other uh, markers like the CD20 and the uh, immunoglobulin level. If it is still suppressed, the CD20, uh, depleted, I mean the CD20, it's also, it is, uh, uh, it, is recommended to uh, delay the dose of the rituximab. Uh, you can use these CD, uh, CD20 markers and immunoglobulins. Also, it's evident in a few of the, uh, of the papers that uh, uh, delaying the rituximab based on CD20 and immunoglobulin, it's a good option and during the pandemic. I know there is some uh, controversy on this, but I, I think uh, it's a good uh, option also. Option, yeah. 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 Dr. Omar, good thank idea. you very much. I have to stop the discussion here because we are running out of time as we are already 20, <laughs> 30 minutes behind the schedule. Well, thank you very much for all the speaker. Thank you, Dr. Omar. Thank you, Dr. Karim. Thank you, thank you Dr. Fatma, for your presentation. Good luck with the research award. We're going to be here about it soon in the next uh, few hours. Thank you for my co-moderator, Dr. Nasra, Dr. Fatma. Thank you very much for thank all you. and have a nice day. Thank, thank you to you all. Have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
Dr. Abdullah is a consultant uh, rheumatologist and uh, deputy chairperson of the internal medicine department at King Faisal Specialist Hospital uh, in Riyadh and uh, research center in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Dr. Abdullah has obtained his uh, Saudi board in rheumatology, uh, sorry, in medicine in 2011, and also his uh, rheumatology board in 2013. He also did his uh, fasciculitis uh, fellowship at the University of Toronto in 2016. Now, without further ado, please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Abdullah. Uh, Dr. Abdullah is over to you now. Assalamu alaikum and good, good day, everyone. And I'm very pleased and happy to be here. I would like to thank the organizing committee for inviting me to give this talk on, on updates in the management of anchor associated vasculitis. So here is the outline of the presentation. Uh, we're going to start with overview on general principles and the treatment of anchor associated vasculitis. We'll move on to GPA and MPA treatment. And then uh, next, we'll talk about eGPA treatment. And then we'll finish with a summary of uh, our talk. This is the, um, what we call the vasculitis flag, where every vasculitis is categorized in either to large, medium, or small. Small is also subcategorized into immune complex and non-immune mediated. And we'll be focusing on the right bottom uh, corner here with this subgroup of uh, diseases of NK-associated vasculitis. General principles to be, uh, to be uh, we think about before treating patients that due to the rarity of the disease and difficulty of finding uh, a homogeneous um, group, uh, most clinical trials do not differentiate between the clinical manifestations of subtypes of anchor associated vasculitis, neither by ANCA specificity or the clinical subgroup. And this is very important while encountering a patient or interpreting any data uh, from, the, uh, from the research. Again, uh, in general, PR3 or C anchor positive patients tend to have more relapses and much more severe renal disease, but fortunately, they respond very well to treatment. While encountering a patient with anchor associated vasculitis, it's very important to differentiate between active disease or irreversible injury. A very good example of that is the chronic peripheral neuropathy. And also, on a, again, the stable uh, proteinuria and renal insufficiency. Usually, the patient will have a scarring of the kidney with persistent proteinuria, but does not really indicate uh, an active uh, or new relapse of the disease. It is very important while encountering a patient to um, recognize these uh, patients with severe life-threatening disease because the approach to treatment is quite different and usually severe life-threatening disease we go with more aggressive treatment and these patients usually present with CNS vasculitis, aviral hemorrhage, cardiac involvement, active uh, grimmelophritis with RPGM, mesenteric ischemia or limp ischemia or mononeuritis or even polyneuritis multiplex. In general, uh, we have uh, two phases of treatment, induction, as you know, which take three to six months, and maintenance, which is in general from eight to 24 and maybe beyond, and all customized based on the disease activity. And how much maintenance uh, we need uh, is a bit of controversy. Uh, this study published in 2017 when they randomized patients, 117 patients who were induced with cyclophosphamide to be maintained on azacyprin and prednisone. At the 24-month mark, the, the patients were randomized, either to continue the treatment for further uh, two years or to stop it. Uh, prolonged remission maintenance therapy with adenohyprin beyond 24 months uh, reduced the relapse. So people who uh, stopped medication at two years had more relapses, 63% uh, compared to people who continued uh, who had only 22% uh, uh, percent of relapse. So again, how much do you need maintenance? Uh, more is better in terms of maintenance in general. That's a, still a question to be answered and a topic to be discussed. So going into GPA and MPA treatment, we'll start by each medication and we'll see the role of the medication in the treatment of GPA. The first, of course, the cornerstone, um, prednisone. Usually in severe life-threatening disease, we start with methylprednisone, one gram IV for three days, followed by one milligram per kg, and uh, aiming to taper it to 0.5 milligram per kg at the, three, at, at the end of the third month. A lot of research has been going on, uh, and the latest was the PEXIVAS trial, which was published in 2020, and um, uh, it addressed the need for uh, plasma exchange uh, that we'll come to and talk about later in the presentation, but also how much steroid do we need? Is it a conventional or what, co what is called reduced dose uh, regimen of uh, steroids in the treatment of life-threatening 
um, uh, anchor associated vasculitis. And the study found that uh, the reduced dose was non inferior and uh, reaching the primary endpoint, which is con uh, considered end stage kidney disease or death, and of course, with a decreased rate of infection. So, again, this um, uh, presents the question how much steroids do we need? Do we really need to give higher dose or, or a reduced dose is enough? Another trial published in uh, 2021, just recently. Uh, by a Japanese group called the LOVAS trial, where they, where they um, uh, included 100, 140 patients. And after rituximab induction, people were randomized to either um, 0.5 milligram, which is the reduced dose, or 1 milligram, which is the standard dose. And the primary endpoint was defined as remission with BVAS of zero and a reduced uh, steroids less than 10 at uh, six months. And they found that the reduced dose was non-inferior. So again, posing the question of, do we really need this much steroids? There is an ongoing study called the Tapir study, which is a very interesting one, where people with GPA who reached five milligram are then randomized either to stop steroids completely or to continue for another six months of um, five milligrams of uh, prednisone. Um, as for non-severe disease, unfortunately, more than half of the patients will eventually require the addition of another immunosuppressive medication. Hence, the recommendation is to add methotrexate or azathioprine to steroids to minimize steroid toxicity and to maintain uh, remission. Uh, but still, it can be used alone as first-line therapy in a very selected um, uh, patient group. The new kid in the block is the avacopan, which is trying to replace steroids. It is an oral selective inhibitor of uh, complement 5A receptor. Uh, the classic study in 2020, uh, it's a phase two trial who included 42 patients, showed that avacopan, adding avacopan to the standard of care added no safety signals. The CLEAR study published in 2017, which the, was the first clinical study uh, to uh, show the importance and efficacy of avacopan. Uh, they randomized 67 patients to three arms, either avacopan with no steroids or avacopan with low dose steroids or placebo in addition to a standard dose of prednisone after induction with either cyclophosphamide or rituximab. And they defined the clinical response at 12 weeks, 50% uh, reduction in BVAS. Avacopan was shown to replace prednisone without compromising efficacy. The most recent and most important was the ADVOCATE trial in 2021, when they randomized 330 patients to either receive avacopan 30 milligram BID versus tapering prednisone with either cyclophosphamide or rituximab plus azathioprine. At week 26, avacopan was non-inferior, yet not superior, but non-inferior to steroids. But at week 52, avacopan was superior uh, in maintaining remission. And, and there was a signal that uh, it, had a very, uh, it had a beneficial effect on kidney function and infections with, of course, were more with the prednisone. So again, does avacopan replace it? This is still a question to be answered and more research needed uh, to see the long-term efficacy of avacopan. And again, the um, cost uh, issue is another uh, issue to be addressed before uh, introducing avacopan to the guidelines and regimen, treatment regimen of anchor associated vasculitis. As for rituximab for induction, uh, rituximab is uh, recommended over cyclophosphamide and mainly due to the side effects and the toxicity of cyclophosphamide in inducing remission in life-threatening anchor associated vasculitis. This was for, first addressed in the famous RAVE trial back in 2010, where rituximab was compared to oral cyclophosphamide, and it was non-inferior to standard regimen, but all, all, uh, also was superior in relapsing disease with no major differences in adverse, uh, adverse events. And uh, as we all know, cyclophosphamide is quite to toxic, namely neutropenia, bladder injury, malignancy, and infertility. There's an ongoing study currently evaluating whether combining rituximab with cyclophosphamide is superior to, to, to rituximab only uh, to maintain uh, or induce remission and maintain remission after that. As for maintenance, rituximab has uh, recently introduced and been recognized as a maintenance treatment. Uh, this came first by uh, the May Ritson study, which was published in 2014. 115 patients were randomized after cyclophosphamide induction to either receive rituximab, 500 milligram every six months, 
or azathioprine. But as you see, the azathioprine dose was reduced after the first year from the standard dose 2 mg per kg to 1.5 and then uh, subsequently to 1 mg. The uh, uh, relapse rate which much, was much more in the azathioprine arm. Uh, up to 28% of them had relapsed compared to only 5% in the rituximab. Since then, rituximab was introduced and um, uh, being recognized as a uh, treatment to maintain uh, relapse. Uh, further study follow-up for the following three years of the same group of patients showed the continuation of the same um, uh, rate of relapse and the difference between the two of um, uh, azathioprine and rituximab. The Merritson 2 study compared uh, two approaches to treating patients with rituximab, either a tailored based on the CD19B lymphocytes and anchor or a fixed regimen. There was absolutely no differences between the two approaches, so still we stick with the rituximab fixed dosing uh, for maintaining remission. The Merritsin 3 re randomized these patients in Merritsin 2 to receive either four rituximab infusions or to receive placebo. Of course, long term rituximab maintenance was achieved with low relapse rate, again, showing that we really need more than two years to maintain remission and stopping medication after two years will increase the relapse rate. So, again, more is, is better in terms of rituximab and maintenance. There is an interesting study going on called the Riotazaram study. They finished and uh, recruiting patients. They had uh, they, they had 188 patients, and they're comparing rituximab as maintenance of one milligram Q four months compared to two milligrams uh, of azathioprine after induction with rituximab. So the main difference between Meritzin and Riotazaram is the induction, and Meritzin was uh, cyclophosphamide, and here in Riotazaram is rituximab, and the dosing of rituximab here is much more heavy, and they uh, will maintain azathioprine without reduction like in the previous study. As for cyclophosphamide, it is still used to induce remission. Uh, one important study, which was the Cyclops study published in 2009, compared the efficacy of um, IV for, versus oral, and of course, no difference in terms of mortality, renal function, and end stage, but the cumulative dose was lower and the toxicity was less in the IV group. Since then, there was a shift between the recommendation uh, of oral into the recommendation of giving IV cyclophosphamide. Going back to the PEXIVAS trial and the need for uh, plasma exchange, um, so this study uh, uh, addressed uh, the question of do we need plasma exchange in uh, severe um, uh, case associated vasculitis. So uh, patients were randomized either to receive seven plasma exchange or not to receive them. And, um, and uh, the use of plasma exchange did not really reduce the incidence of the primary endpoint of death or end stage kidney disease. And also the secondary outcome was not uh, affected in terms of sustained remission, serious adverse events, or serious infection at one year. Back in 2007, a, uh, the MEPEX trial was published and uh, they randomized people to uh, either receive seven sessions of, psycho of plasma exchange compared to the three uh, doses of IV with the prednisone in addition to cyclophosphamide and prednisone. And initially back then it was found to be superior in renal recovery, but a follow-up study four years later, the authors stated that the long-term benefits remain unclear. We can see two different recommendations between two different studies, the PEXAVAS in 2020 and the MEPEX in 2007. Of course, there's a 13-year gap in this in this 13-year gap. There are a lot of, of improvement in immunosuppressive medication and supportive care and improvement in diagnostics as well which may lead to the uh, conclusion by PEXAVAS uh, group that uh, plasma exchange is not really beneficial as an added medication. So in general, it is recommended for patients with higher risk of progression to end-stage kidney disease, uh, with kidney function um, uh, upon presentation, loss of kidney function or response to remission induction, it is recommended for uh, patients with anti-GPM antibodies, and, and generally it is not recommended for patients with pulmonary hemorrhage. Moving to IVIG, uh, a study published in, in the year 2000 with 92 patients 
um, from very heterog heterogeneous background in terms of diagnosis, in terms of uh, immune suppressive medication, where um, uh, showed the benefits uh, by using IVIG. But again, uh, we should take these results with a grain of salt uh, because of the heterogeneity in the background of immune suppressive medication and also the clinical background of patients. Another uh, study published in 2016 uh, compared IVIG to placebo. Um, but unfortunately, the uh, reduction in disease flare and the induced inflammation did not, was not maintained for more than three months. Uh, and there was, of course, more adverse events in the IVIG group. So in general, IVIG therapy uh, can be used in refractory disease, but uh, should not be used routinely. It can be used as a bridge uh, in, uh, in terms of if, there's, uh, if the patient has sepsis or pregnancy, we can bridge these patients with IVIG until we can use the conventional immunosuppressive medications. So going to methotrexate, non-severe disease, uh, the methotrexate was first introduced as a treatment of induction of non-severe disease back after the NORAM trial in 2005, where they compared oral methotrexate, oral uh, cyclophosphamide and inducing remission, and the remission rate of six months was non-inferior in the methotrexate arm. Methotrexate for maintenance. Um, methotrexate was compared to azathioprine in maintenance in the Wigand trial, where um, after uh, achieving remission with cyclophosphamide and prednisone, the two agents, uh, methotrexate and azathioprine, appear to be similar for maintenance therapy. And since then, methotrexate has been an option to be to treat in addition to uh, azathioprine. For azathioprine, it is probably the oldest uh, treatment used to maintain remission. Uh, and this study published in 2003, it was uh, compared to cyclophosphamide after cyclophosphamide induction. It is compared to, uh, to it as a maintenance treatment and uh, did not, in the use of azathioprine, did not increase the rate of relapse. As for mycophenolate uh, mofetil, the improved trial back in 2010, where uh, MMF was compared to azathioprine after the induction with cyclophosphamide, unfortunately relapses were more uh, in the uh, mycophenolate mofetil group. It is still an option, but it comes after rituximab, after uh, methotrexate and azathioprine and the choices. Um, just in general, um, things that we need to know about leflunomide is a very uh, scattered data published in the case series and case reports. Uh, it was compared to methotrexate. Uh, it had a decreased rate of relapse, but unfortunately, uh, a higher rate of drug withdrawal and toxicity due to the higher dose of uh, leflunomide that we use, which is 30 milligrams per day. As for bilimumab, it was evaluated in the PREVAS trial as an added medication to uh, maintain remission. Unfortunately, adding bilimumab to azathioprine and prednisone did not reduce the risk of relapse. Abatacept currently is being evaluated in the APRO, uh, APROGATE trial, uh, and it is evaluating the added value of abatacept in addition to uh, methotrexate, azathioprine, mycophenolate as a maintenance treatment to sustain remission. So after going all of the options that we have to treat people with GPA and MPA, a bit of insights, um, can we say less is more in terms of prednisone, cyclophosphamide, plasma exchange and IVIG? And again, is more, uh, more is better in terms of maintenance therapy in general? Rituximab, do we need 500 or do we need one gram to maintain remission? And how long do we need to keep people on methotrexate and azathioprine? Currently, we can say more is better in terms of um, maintenance therapy. Going into EGPA and the treatment of EGPA, things to keep in mind while treating patients with EGPA, the survival rate at one year is around 93 to, 93 to 94%, where it is quite a wide range of um, survival rate reported between 60 to 97 at five years. And this is compared to only 10% 10, 10 survival in the 1950s. Um, also to keep in mind that prednisone is still required to maintain remission and in the French cohort, 84% of patients required ongoing prednisone to at, at, at least a mean dose of 13 milligrams to maintain the remission. Something also to keep in mind is the five factor score, which is a, a prognostic uh, factor uh, score uh, uh, depending on the age 
uh, cardiac involvement, renal involvement, and gastrointestinal involvement, and absence of ENT manifestation. So the absence of ENT manifestation is a bad prognostic factor, while patients with ENT manifestation generally have a good prognosis. And um, this will uh, this is translated into if you have a five factor score of zero, then the mortality is around ten percent, and it doubles if the five factor score is one. It doubles again to forty percent if the five factor score is two or more. But again, this should not guide the treatment because patient with pulmonary hemorrhage is life threatening and to be need to be treated aggressively. Although his five factor score will be zero, so this is only to guide the prognosis and uh, probably for research purposes as well. So treatment in general in life-threatening EGPA, where there's cardiac, CNS, gastrointestinal, or severe ocular involvement or pulmonary hemorrhage, uh, definitely prednisone is still very important and probably pulse to start with pulse and then high dose 7.5 to 15 milligram uh, per kg to start with and then one milligram per kg following that. And then we have uh, to maintain remission in addition to um, induce remission in addition to prednisone, we have cyclophosphamide or rituximab and uh, still the dose is still to be uh, determined. There are different schools, especially in rituximab, uh, with 500 to one gram IV every six months. Other medication to maintain remission, we still can use the same of uh, GPA and MPA in terms of azathioprine, methotoxate, leflunamide, and mycophenolate. As for non-life-threatening disease, uh, prednisone is still the cor uh, cornerstone. The uh, CHUSPAN trial, uh, included patients with five factor score of zero and they compared giving prednisone and glucocorticoid alone versus glucocorticoid and azathioprine and there was no um, difference between the two in achieving remission major, major or minor relapses of 24 months. Despite that, the latest guidelines from the ACR um, recommended adding azathioprine methotrexate, MMF or mepilizumab uh, to steroids to reduce, of course, the toxicity of a prolonged use of steroids. Going to um, map, um, uh, the most important study was the MIRA study. Uh, it was the first uh, randomized control trial uh, in a, in the, to use uh, mepolizumab in refractory or relapsing the GPA. And people, uh, patients were randomized to mepolizumab 300 milligrams of monthly or placebo for one year in addition to standard therapy. It included relapsing, refractory, and glucocorticoid dependent patients, but excluded initial diagnosis uh, and life-threatening disease. They ended up including one, 136 patients. 60% uh, of the mepolizumab arm were already on immunosuppressive medication compared to 46 in the um, uh, placebo. So this is something to keep in mind while interpreting the data from the MIRA study. Again, only 54% of the mepolizumab arm had a BVAS score of more than 70, while in the placebo, much more uh, people, 71% uh, had a BVAS. Uh, so people in the placebo arm were more active and um, were uh, less on immunosuppressive medication. So the remission rate at week 24 was achieved in 28% of people with the added uh, mepolizumab arm and compared to 3% in the placebo group and response to mepolizumab was higher with the xenophil uh, count more than 1,500. Relapses occurred in mepolizumab in 56% uh, in that arm compared to 82% of relapses in the placebo arm. Again, the uh, study showed the favorable safety profile where serious adverse event was less common in the mepilizumab arm rather than the uh, placebo. So in general, uh, it has a good uh, safety profile. Moving to rituximab in uh, the treatment of EGPA, um, uh, an old series of 41 patients showed that rituximab uh, improved BVAS remission and partial response at six months and 12 months. The most recent study, which uh, they only published their, um, uh, their abstract in the uh, most recent ACR, is the RIOVAS trial, where rituximab was assist for induction versus cyclophosphamide. They uh, included 105 patients with either new or relapsing with variable severity. And the preliminary conclusion, which was only published in the abstract, that rituximab was not superior to conventional therapy strategy uh, based on the five-factor score uh, and uh, vasculitis remission. But these studies, this study still has more uh, data to be published and things to think about later on. 
And because rituximab reduces the IL-5, which is uh, shown to precede the reduction in isinophil, it has a dramatic improvement on isinophil count, especially after the induction phase. So in general, uh, rituximab is effective in NK-positive patients and active gremineralphitis patient, and also patients with previous treatment with cyclophosphamide and relapsing, just uh, the same case as uh, treating GPA and mepiruz and uh, uh, Hyperangitis, rituximab is much more effective in people who received cyclophosphamide in the past. The French group is conducting uh, a study where rituximab is compared to azathioprine uh, for maintenance therapy in AGPA patients. So what's in the horizon? Still the long-term access uh, program for Mebrizumab are still interpreting data for, from the MIRA study and again a prospective observation study for 300 patients uh, exposed to mepirizumab and still data to be published about mepirizumab. Another two monoclonal antibodies in the right and right trials. Uh, they're both case series and case reports and they're uh, quite overdue. And another uh, uh, promising uh, drug and, and uh, anti antitoxin 11 monoclonal antibodies under investigation ulcerative colitis currently in Bellisbon we go out with plans for future studies on asthma and as every uh, medication that we have for AGPA it is studies it is, it is studied initially with asthma and then um, uh, in AGPA another is the dopamine which is a monoclonal antibody against i4 receptor which shows to be effective in severe asthma and atopic dermatitis currently being studied in azophilic esophagitis and gastritis and uh, probably in a gpa in the near future so going to the final uh, two slides of uh, summary of our talk uh, uh, how can we approach and what is recommended for patients with gpa and mpa so if you have a patient with severe and uh, for induction of remission, uh, rituximab and prednisone, uh, of course, the bigger the space, uh, the bigger the uh, recommendations of rituximab and prednisone compared to cyclophosphamide is more recommended. And then maybe plasma exchange and IVIG has a role in induction. As for maintenance and severe life-threatening, rituximab is taking a bigger role and um, uh, prednisone is stepping back. Again, we still can use azathioprine, methotrexate, maybe leflunamide and mycophenolate as alternative options uh, down in the list. As for non-severe, methotrexate and steroids can be used, maybe azathioprine as well, leflunamide and mycophenolate for a lesser extent. For uh, maintaining remission in non-severe, methotrexate and azathioprine has a major role, and then prednisone can still be used uh, in, uh, in maintaining remission in non-severe disease, leflunomide and mycophenolate, again, uh, to a lesser extent and lower indication. As for EGPA, for induction, still cyclophosphamide and rituximab, in addition to prednisone, are the gold standard of treatment in inducing remission life threatening severe disease in EGPA. For non severe EGPA, prednisone, in addition to azathioprine, methotoxate, mebrizumab, and mycophenolate. As for maintaining remission and severe life threatening, uh, methotrexate and azathioprine are the mainstay, and probably also we can use uh, leflunomide and mycophenolate. As for relapsing disease, uh, rituximab is very important in relapsing disease and also IVIG, and again, omalizumab, which is one of the monoclonal antibodies, can be used. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for your attention, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Abdullah. <clears throat> that was really a great talk, very comprehensive. You included almost all landmark studies in ankle vasculitis. <clears throat> uh, we'll get uh, some questions. Um, <clears throat> now, is uh, Dr. Abdullah ankle negative or ankle positive? Is it a good thing or bad thing? 
So uh, a lot of studies regarding the ANCA importance and what we know until now that if you are ANCA, if you are uh, PR3 or C ANCA positive, that you respond better to treatment. Uh, in general, ANCA negative patients have um, less relapses and they have more uh, less severe disease. But still, this is not concrete and uh, we still have more variabilities. Yes, okay. Now, you didn't mention the BCB prophylaxis. Now, in our areas, BCB is not the endemic. I know some of my colleagues in hematology, for example, they're not prescribing prophylaxis. How do you approach such I mean, issue? Do you prophylaxis? Well, of course. Or Yeah, adjunctive therapy, uh, whenever needed, like vitamin D and calcium for uh, steroids, and also PCP if you're prescribing, uh, you prescribing cyclophosphamide. But um, uh, just giving um, anti-PCP uh, prophylaxis as a treatment uh, by itself is really uh, fading away, and it's not uh, really one of the mainstay, in a lot, uh, mainstay of treatment. A lot of treatments have this now overcame uh, the role, and it's uh, going down in the list in the options of treatment. Right. Okay, good. Uh, now, uh, some patients who have simulandering uh, upper respiratory uh, tract enforcement, it can be really difficult to manage such patients because of the active disease versus uh, chronicity. Uh, so how would you tackle such an issue uh, with such patients? Do you mean, <clears throat> if I heard the, the question right, is it upper airway you said? Yeah, I mean, ENT basically, you know, like uh, subglutic stenosis, bronchial uh, uh, involvement or ENT basically. Okay, so the most chronic and lingering symptom of ENT is chronic sinusitis. Uh, usually chronic sinusitis will have some, um, uh, it will stay there for a while, but uh, monitoring the patient from nasal discharge or bleed, this will help us differentiate. And also if the patient has fever, imaging sometimes like CT will tell us how active is the sinusitis. Regarding subglottic stenosis, uh, usually uh, we use uh, PFT in the help of our ENT colleagues for indirect scope to tell us how severe is the uh, stenosis, is getting better or worse, and also the symptoms of the patients. Right. Of course, taking this in the general approach of the patient, uh, constitution symptoms and fever and other and probably ESAR and CRP would, uh, would help us to know where we are exactly. Right, okay. Uh, I saw Bakupan is uh, really uh, now making some difference to the approach to be such patients. Uh, I, I know the... Uh, <clears throat> they approved uh, Focopan, but actually it's not included in the ACR guidelines. Uh, how you see uh, Focopan as a new modality of treatment? It's quite promising, but we still have a very big challenge with Abacopan. Uh, it's really uh, expensive and compared to steroids, it's there at the cost level with, with the biological treatments. So uh, whenever prescribing Abacopan, um, this thing needs to be uh, in um, uh, thing to be in mind. Of course, it's got its FDA approval after uh, the uh, initiation or after the publication mm -hmm. of ACR. So probably maybe we'll see it in the next recommendations, probably. I still there are more data to come to prove its uh, safety. One or two studies, uh, major studies, I, I mean, it's not... Um, Uh, it's not enough. Like with every drug that we see, we need to see uh, more reassuring. We know steroids, we can predict what's happened with steroids, but still Avacopan is still unpredictable until now. Um, it might have a role, keeping in mind the cost issue. Right, okay. We'll see if, if we have any other questions from the audience. Uh, I think that's all the questions uh, we, we have. Uh, thank you, Dr. Abdullah, for this excellent talk. And uh, I think we'll go for the next session. So thank you, Dr. Abdullah.
welcome back again. Uh, now we will start uh, the fasciculitis uh, abstract session. I will be presenting uh, Dr. Fatma Hadji and Dr. Abdullah will present the other two speakers. So our first speaker is Dr. Fatma Hadji from Bahrain. She's a consultant uh, rheumatologist and internist at Salimaniya Medical Hospital Bahrain. She's the head of uh, Central Morbidity and Mortality Committees and member of the Irish Rheumatology Society and collegiate member of the MRCBI. Uh, her talk is entitled the first published uh, GC case series in Bahrain, Diagnosis and Management. Uh, welcome Dr. Fatma and so over to you now. Alaikum. It's a great pleasure to be uh, among the second GCC uh, Rheumatology Conference. I would like to thank the Omani uh, Society of Rheumatology and the chairman for the introduction. My abstract today is about the first Jansel arthritis case series in Kingdom of Bahrain. Jansel arthritis is an inflammatory condition that affects the blood vessels. It's the most prevalent vascular disorder among people over 50 years of old with an average onset of age of 72. It can cause pain in the head, joints, face, and arms. It can even lead to vision impairment and blindness. Inflammation due to GCA constri constricts and blocks the blood vessels, interrupting the blood flow. Left untreated, transal arthritis can cause blindness, stroke, and aneurysms. Rapid diagnosis and effective treatment are required in large vessel vasculitis in order to treat symptoms, but more importantly, to reduce risk of complications. Jansel arthritis is the most common vasculitis in adulthood with an annual incidence that varies from 1 in 5,000 5, to 1 in 17,000 of adults over 50 years old. It's most frequent in populations of Northern European background. Incidence of Jansel arthritis in our population is not common and unknown. To date, there is no single publication about GCA diagnosis and management in Bahrain. In Bahrain, the diagnosis in the past was solely dependent on the histopathological finding of unilateral temporal artery biopsy, which was rarely done and never positive. The objective of this abstract is to present the GCA uh, cases which were confirmed using the British Society of Rheumatology algorithm guidelines and their management will be reported. This is the adopted algorithm where cases suspected to have GCA will be referred to rapid access clinic where um, symptom signs and laboratory tests will be reviewed. If the probability of Jansel arthritis is new, an ultrasound examination will be performed. And if it's positive, then a temporal autobiopsy will be performed to confirm the diagnosis. If the probability of the giant cell arthritis is medium, i.e. 20 to 50%, or the ultrasound is uh, equivocal, then a temporal autobiopsy will be performed. If it's positive, the ultrasound is positive, then it will be treated as GCA. In cases where they are having high probability of GCA, then an ultrasound examination will be performed. And if it's positive, again, it will be treated as GCA. If it's negative, then they will go for a temporal autobiopsy. And this is the algorithm that I have adopted in my uh, abstract. So methodology, all the cases were referred to a metallurgy clinic between 2019 and 2021. This table summarizes the uh, demographic data of all the four cases. And as you can see that uh, men to women uh, ratio is one to one with the age varies between 70 to 83 years old. They were having a different source of referral out of point of interest, either from self, neurology, ophthalmology and cardiology subspecialties. Also uh, comorbidity such as diabetes, hypertension and dyslipidemia is highlighted in this, time, uh, in this table. The most common symptoms when they presented was very localized temporal um, side uh, headache, uh, which was bilateral and three quarter of the cases was localized to the left side in one of the cases. Vision um, loss, the two cases were having complete bilateral blindness on the time of presentation and was reduced in uh, the third and fourth case. Out of point of interest, they have a very, uh, these four cases had a very variable time from the onset of the symptoms to the presentation. Case number one had um, six months from the onset of the symptoms to presentation. Case number two had seven months. Case number three had two months and case number four had two months. 
Joe claudication was present in 50% 50 50 of the cases. And the first case, it was uh, very difficult to elicit as the patient was very poor historian and was very confused. Constitutional symptoms, i.e. weight loss, significant fatigue, night sweats and night fever was present in three quarter of those cases. ESR was very variable, ranging from 25 to 110, depending on the, uh, um, the higher the ESR is the, in the cases where they had a longer time between the presentation and the uh, time of the onset of the symptoms. Seroactive protein also varied from 12 to 81. Optic uh, nerve examination in two of the cases, case number one and case number two, where they had very severe symptoms and high ESR and CRP, the, both of them showed optic nerve edema and optic neuropathy bilateral on their uh, MRI scans. Cataract was in case number three and no abnormality in the last case. Temporal artery ultrasound was performed in all of the cases and it was positive in case one, three, and four. Case number two was negative, but remember this case presented seven months after the presenting of the symptoms. He was already treated in another hospital with a high dose of uh, steroids being on six months of 60 milligram of steroids. Um, MRI was performed in case one and two and they were both positive MRI of the uh, uh, cranial nerves and um, they showed positive results. A PET scan was performed only in one case, and again, it showed confirmed the positivity of the inflammation and the vessels. In the same case where the MRI and PET scan was performed, a, temp a temporal artery biopsy was performed in one side, and uh, it was reported as negative for um, genital arthritis. All the cases were started on steroids with a range of 40 to 60 milligram. Methotrexate was introduced to three of the cases, number two, three, and four. And um, then tocilizumab was started in case number one because he was not tolerating methotrexate. Uh, case number two, again, uh, because he had very severe symptoms. Case number three was not uh, um, started as the patient had history of diverticular disease and diverticulitis. So, um, in summary, this is the results that I presented uh, with the demographic uh, characteristics of the patients. Um, the ultrasound e examination was performed only with a very sp uh, specialized um, uh, consultant radiologist who is expert with uh, performing ultrasound examination of the cranial arteries and the aortic artery, which showed uh, positive hello signs in all the cases that were reported as positive. Temporal artery hello score is being performed uh, using the ultrasound uh, scoring system, where you have the three branches of the temporal artery on the both sides, each will have a score from zero to four with a total of 24 points. And then you'll have the full hello score temporal and axillary artery, where you will have the both axillary artery added to the examination. Each will be scored up to four and then multiplied by three with a total score of 48 points. If your HALO score is 10 or above, then this is significantly positive. And remember that uh, the uh, specificity of the HALO sign positivity is more than 95%. Um, I'll skip this. In 2018, updated GLR recommendation for the management of large cell vasculitis. Um, they have concluded that when you are suspected diagnosis of large vessel vasculitis, um, uh, and imaging should be confirmed, the diagnosis should be confirmed by imaging, either ultrasound or MRI for temporal or other cranial arteries, ultrasound, CT, PET scan, or MRI for the aorta and extra, art extra cranial arteries, or a histology with a uh, temporal artery biopsy. High doses of steroids ranging from 40 to 60 has to be initiated immediately once uh, the diagnosis is suspected for the induction of remission of active GCA. Once the disease is controlled, then it's recommended to taper the steroids as per the protocol. Adjunctive therapy should be used in selected patients with GCA refractory or relapsing disease in the presence or an increased risk of, uh, of steroid-related adverse effects or complications using tocilizumab, methotrexate may be used as an alternative. The original recommendation advised temporal artery biopsy in every case suspected of GCA. 
a large amount of good quality data demonstrated that imaging and biopsy have similar diagnostic value if assessors are proficient in these techniques. Imaging of the temporal arteries by ultrasound or MRI identifies only 77 and 73% of the cases respectively with clinical diagnosis as reference standard for GCE. ESR and CRP are typically elevated in GCE and it's highly infrequent, less than 3% that both are normal. In conclusion, these four cases demonstrate the difficulties faced in diagnosis of GCA in Arabs as it is not common disease, the challenges faced in diagnosis and the delay in the starting of the treatment. Unfortunately, complete vision loss was in 50% of the cases and only uh, uh, partially regaining of the vision was in 25% of the cases. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, Dr. Fatma. would like to introduce our second abstract. It will be presented by Dr. Lama Timimi. She's currently a uh, medical intern at the King Saud Medical uh, City in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. And the abstract is titled uh, Evaluating uh, Bahja Disease Activity Pattern in the Context of Major Organ Involvement. Uh, Dr. Lama, please, uh, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. This is Lama Timimi, medical intern at King Saudi University. And my topic today is about evaluating Bishat disease activity pattern in the context of major organ involvement. I want to start by noting that I have no conflict of interest with the presented material in this presentation. So Bishat disease is a chronic remitting relapse in the inflammatory disease involving blood vessels in various organs. And since there are no laboratory indicators that represent the disease fluctuating course, it's currently diagnosed exclusively on the basis of physical science utilizing the Bichette disease current activity form, or the bd -Cal. And while the frequency of organ involvement has been well studied among various ethnic groups, little is known about the impact of baseline organ on disease course over time. Besides, most of the prognostic studies in Bichette disease do not consider the varying nature of the disease activity and the potential influence of various medications on disease course. Therefore, our aim was to examine the effect of baseline organ involvement and factors associated with changes in disease activity over time. So this is a retrospective longitudinal study where electronic medical records of a cohort of Bichette disease patients were reviewed. Adults 18 and above fitting the international criteria for Bichette disease were followed at King Saudi University Medical City in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia were included. Patient demographics and clinical characteristics were collected using a standardized collection sheet. Demographic data included age, gender, smoking habits, family history of Bichette disease, while clinical data included disease duration, organ manifestation, and administered medication. And the collected medical records spanned over a five-year duration, from 2015 to 2020, using univariate analysis and the generalized estimated equation. The disease activity was measured using the bd cuff score, and the scores were calculated depending on the presence of persistent symptoms which patient complained of during visit one. A GEE model was used to account for the varying nature of the disease activity over time and assess the association with other variables. So from this cohort of patients with Bichette disease, a total of 134 individuals were included in this study out of 142. The majority of patients were male and many of whom were Saudi. The reported median age at Bichette disease diagnosis was 36 years and almost one third of patients were current cigarette smokers. Only five of patients had a family history of Bichette disease while two of them had a family history of other autoimmune diseases. At the time of diagnosis, there were a total of 495 symptoms reported by our study population during visit one. The three chief complaints were oral ulcers, ocular lesions, and genital ulcers. Over the five-year period, uh, five period of patient's disease duration, various immunosuppressive therapies have been administered. Anti-TNF was used in 56.7% of the cases. Of those, infliximab accounted for 40.2%. Adalimumab 10.78%, 10.7%, uh, and Etanercept for 
3.8% of the cases. Also, various conventional DMARGs were used in 67.2% of the cases. Now let's move on and look at the graph of other general organ involvement at presenting time. It was suggested that the patient's eye manifestation and genital ulcers, as well as skin ulcers and joint complaints at presenting time have measured a slightly greater mean BD CAF score, despite the lack of statistically significant difference. That being said, patients who presented with positive complaints of oral ulcers measured significantly higher mean BD CAF score at breast time than those with negative presentation. On the contrary, people who had presented with central nervous system complaints, fever, and vascular compromise had measured significantly lower mean BD cuff. Adding to that, patients' mean BD cuff score at diagnosis time had converged significantly and positively on their repeated mean BD cuff scores. So for each additional one point increase in patient BD cuff score at diagnosis, their corresponding successive mean BD cuffs rose by 7.1% on average. It's worth noting that the patient who received a cumulative glucocorticoid dosage had correlated significantly with their mean BD cuff score. Also, greater dosage of glucocorticoids predicted significantly higher mean BD Bichette disease activity. The use of, of DMARDs did not correlate significantly with patients' mean BD cuff score. On the other hand, the use of anti TNF drugs was found to be statistically significant with higher mean BD cuff score. The rate of Bichat disease activity uh, for those taking the anti-TNF was 70.8% higher. However, patients who received a combination of anti-TNF and glucocorticoids had a significantly lower mean BD cuff score that declined by a factor equal to 44.5%. So to sum up, the nature of Bichat disease activity follows a peak up baseline followed by a downgoing trajectory. High disease activity at baseline is associated with higher disease activity across time, and baseline organ involvement seem to predict the course of disease, with oral ulcers being associated with higher disease activity, while central nervous system and vascular involvement predict lower disease activity across time. Lastly, the addition of glucocorticoids to anti TNF significantly reduces disease activity compared to demand. At the end, we'd like to thank the College of Medicine Research Center at King Saud University for providing funds for the study. Also, special thanks to Rheumatology Unit staff at King Saud University Hospital for the data collection. Thank you, Dr. Lamana. We'll go to our third abstract today, presented by Dr. Saad Shlui, who's currently a medical intern at uh, King Khalid University Hospital in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. And his uh, abstract is titled The Frequency, Nature, and Predictors of uh, Serocytes in Patients with Badger Disease, Systemic Review, and Meta-Analysis. Dr. Saad, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Sa Okay, good afternoon. My name is Saad Shalawi. I'm a medical intern at King Khaled University Hospital. I will present our uh, research, which is talking about the frequency, nature, and predictors of serocytes in adult patients with Bajet disease. Actually, this is my agenda. We will go through it 
inshallah, uh, in this presentation, disclosure, introduction, aim, methods, results, and uh, conclusion. Disclosure, that there are no conflicts of interest declared by the authors. Uh, introduction, Paget disease, uh, as we know, is uh, a chronic inflammatory vasculitis that's uh, not restricted to physical size and uh, may uh, affect various organs. The commonly involves a mucocutaneous system in the form of recurrent oral genital ulcers, pseudofolicolitis, and erythemal dosum. The disease also affects the ocular central nervous and gastrointestinal system. However, this is an important uh, point. Serocytes are not usually encountered in disease manifestation. Aim and objective, uh, our uh, aims, to systematically review the clinical phenotypes, nature, and frequency of serocytes in adult patients with Behjit disease to identify predictors of serocytis in adult patients with Behjit disease, to identify the outcome of serocytis in Behjit disease. Methods, uh, we systematically search midline in PES and Cochrane Central Register of Control Trials from database inception until April 2020 for all cases of Behjit disease, which reported any form of serocytis and exclude international studies. We have primary and secondary outcome, Primary outcomes is the frequency of primary first and secondary serocytis among, uh, among uh, Paget disease, uh, patients presented with any form of serocytis. The second outcomes include the predictor of serocytis related to serocytis, uh, outcomes of serocytis in Paget disease and factors associated uh, with uh, poor outcome defined as mortality or lack of response. Keywords, uh, these are keywords what we use it. Detect, uh, data extraction done by a team of two reviewers in pairs independently screen title and abstract studies. And uh, any disagreement between the two reviewers was uh, resolved by a third reviewer through the confidence platform. Data was analyzed by using uh, SPSS for uh, associations. Inclusion criteria, we include all uh, report case, all uh, reported case reports case series cohort studies that include adults more than 18 diagnosed with Behjet disease based on international criteria for Behjet disease or international study group for Behjet disease. Study that's, uh, that uh, doesn't uh, report the symptoms of, of presentation or criteria of diagnosis will be used for sensitivity study to ensure the consistency of data with uh, other included studies. Diagnosis of uh, serocytis in general, or uh, specifically in the form of varieties, pericarditis and proteinitis, based on the clinical judgment, not in serum confirmed criteria. We allow overlapping autoimmune conditions, metabolic disorders, or secondary causes of serocytes, including medications or infections. This exclusion criteria, no clear uh, phase of budget disease diagnosis, pediatric cases, clinical trials that uh, are not de designed to examine serocytes and budget disease. Quality assessment, the Newcastle Ottawa scale for observational studies was used to assess the methodological quality of included studies. Result, actually this is our uh, Prisma chart. We started with uh, uh, 511 studies. Then we found around 96 studies is uh, duplicated. We screened around 415 su uh, studies. Then uh, 294 the studies are irrelevant. Then we assist for eligibility. We found uh, 121 studies. We exclude around uh, 17 studies for, for these reasons. Uh, 44 no-fault texts, 17, uh, uh, 17 wrong study design, 10 wrong uh, patient population, eight wrong outcomes. We uh, ended up with uh, 44 studies. Uh, this table, we, uh, this table demonstrates that the main of them, they are male around 70%. And also the, the most common manifestation is the uh, oral orthosis around 80, followed by genital orthosis and uh, vascular manifestation. The Behjet disease activity uh, index around seven. The serocytes actually presented with pericarditis, uh, pericarditis uh, most commonly, followed by pyloritis and peritonitis. Uh, follow up after treatment, we found around uh, 60, they are uh, recovered, uh, and around 20 uh, partially recovered, and around 17%, uh, they are not uh, recovered. In this, in this graph, describe the causes of serocytis, whether related to primary uh, uh, budget or secondary to other causes. 
we found around 63.6% uh, uh, they are primary to secondary, uh, they are primary to budget disease and around 25 secondary to other causes. Secondary to includes uh, tuberculosis, familiar Mediterranean, Crohn's disease, rheumatic fever, pneumonia, cyclosporin, and TNF. Outcomes, recurrence uh, around uh, seven patients, budget flare up uh, after season we found uh, three patients, death around four. In this table, we compare between the dead and survived. We, we notice that uh, the dead patient uh, older than the survived and also the uh, fast current manifestation, we found it in all the dead patient. And also we, we can demonstrate that uh, in this table, actually the serocytis is presented most commonly in the, in the patient as a peritonitis, actually. What's the cause of death in these patients due to poor investigation uh, of secondary causes or uh, purely budget? The first patient, cause of, uh, the cause of serocytes unknown and they investigate to rule out secondary causes. The second patient, the cause of serocytes unknown, uh, they, uh, they didn't investigate to rule out secondary causes. The, the uh, third patient, the cause of serocytes is budget and uh, they didn't investigate to rule out uh, the secondary causes. Fourth patient, the cause of serocytes is uh, budget and they investigate to rule out the secondary causes. We conclude from our study that the majority of serocytes reported in budget disease are related to, uh, to disease itself rather than secondary etiologies. Most patients respond to treatment yet mortality remain high. High risk of bias due to uh, low to moderate quality of reported cases mandate careful interpretation of the results. The, the strengths, uh, actually this is the first dedicated study to examine the relationship between uh, patient and uh, serocytes. The study is specifically collected data to address the clinical questions and the limitations there, there were a number of papers uh, that couldn't be obtained due to no available access, no fault text, uh, and language barriers. The quality of the final papers didn't score high in Newcastle scoring system. Thank you for listening. I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you to our speakers. We'll go to the Q&A session now. Uh, so question to Dr. Saad. So what was the overall rate of serocytes among all patients? So what is the rate, the frequency? Actually, the rate uh, we, we collect around uh, 40, uh, 44 patients. All, all, all of them, they are uh, having the serocytes when you collect. Uh, all yeah, all but, of them, yeah. they are having the okay. serocytes. And that's in how many patients overall, the, out of how many, 44 out of how many patients? All of them, they are have uh, 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 serocytes, as uh, bretonitis or uh, bluritis or bricarditis. And uh, so while there was a high mortality rate, though actually serocytes uh, probably is uh, one of the easiest probably to treat uh, in the primary budget. Uh, Any reason why the, such mortality was high? Maybe the the late diagnosis of serocytes in, in budget patient will, will affect the, the management plan for them. Maybe this is the main uh, the main issue for them. There is another question to Dr. Fatma. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so seventy percent of your patients uh, had loss of vision. 
uh, why such they have very high rate? I mean, almost all of them. Was that because of delayed diagnosis or uh, not seen um, by specialists daily? You know, because some some of them already seen by by ophthalmologists. Um, thank you for the question. I uh, I can um, definitely say that the late presentation because. Um, two of the cases who had complete bilateral blindness, they presented at least six and seven months after. Uh, point of interest, uh, they were being seen and investigated. Um, one of them was, uh, both of them actually, they thought of meningitis, encephalitis, um, um, strokes and multiple other neurological symptoms, but the uh, diagnosis of GCA was not um, put in on the differential list of, uh, uh, list of differential diagnosis. Uh, one of them, uh, which is case number two, had actually was the a rheumatologist was consulted and the differential diagnosis at that time was a possible genital arthritis, but because of the fact that they've done the temporal artery biopsy and the biopsy was negative, so they just said that this is what will out temporal arthritis. I mean, uh, this is a very important point. Uh, the awareness among the rheumatologists and non-rheumatologist specialists with the GCA I think has to be, especially in our area, um, we need to refocus on this, uh, being not such a common disease in Arab world, yet it is there. So it has to be uh, put in as a differential diagnosis and it has to be ruled out and other investigation to be ruled out too. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fatma. <clears throat> uh, maybe questions uh, to Dr. Lemon. You hear me, yes, Dr. Lemon? Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, how how many patients ended up having uh, eventually having just mouth ulcers? I mean, how many of your patients who you followed up <clears throat> had uh, persistent mouth ulcers? Hello. Um. Yes. Hello. Uh, the, uh, uh, Sixty-seven point four percent of our patients had mouth uh, oral ulcers. Uh, how many? Uh, I mean, uh, after the follow-up, at the end of the follow-up. Sorry, how many were there? Uh, the the, the, the sixty-seven point four percent is the uh, total uh, the, the number of uh, oral ulcer complaints throughout the follow-up period. All right. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Because the disease, because the mouth ulcer usually linger for a long time, and you, if you take just mouth ulcer as a reflection of disease activity, most of the patient anyway, they will show up that they having an active disease, and that's the reason why you see <clears throat> many patients. I mean, presenting initially with mouth ulcers have higher active disease. They ended up also having active disease because basically it lingers, and you know this is not a blood test. This is just basically asking the patient, do you have still mouth ulcers, and then. Uh, they will score basically yes, and you see even after many years uh, they still have disease activity, and it's difficult to define what an active Bajet disease is, especially if you don't have any organic manifestations. Okay, um, so any other questions we have? Um, yes, Dr. Jama, a couple of questions for the uh, Dr. presenters. Dr. Yes. Uh, Dr. Fatima, thank you. Just uh, a question in regarding to your cases. Um, what is the symptom to steroids uh, period approximately? Do you have any insights uh, from the time that the patient reported symptoms until steroids were started? Uh, unfortunately, three out of the four cases, they have not been started on steroids. Um, uh, only case number two, where he had all the investigations done, i.e. the MRI, the temporal artery biopsy, um, and the, um, uh, the, uh, the imaging. So on that case, because of temporal artery, um, uh, genital arthritis was suspected, they have kept him on steroid 60 uh, milligram, started even higher, 100 milligram, as like uh, his weight was 100, so one milligram per kg. Um, then because he responds very well, um, case number two also had other cranial nerves. So he had the 
uh, uh, facial nerve palsy, he had uh, ninth nerve palsy, he had vocal cord palsy. Because he responds uh, partially and his uh, inflammatory markers dropped very well, they kept him on steroids, despite the fact that they did not entertain the diagnosis of Janssen arthritis, but because he responds very well, he was on it. By the time he presented to me, he was already on steroid 60. So for the last six or seven months, he continued to be on steroid 60 milligram. Um, the minute they dropped it or tapered down the steroids to 40 or less, he will have a, a flare of his headache and his inflammatory markers will jump up high again. So they, he continued to be on 60 milligram. The other three cases, they've never been even started because the diagnosis was not even entertained as part of the differential diagnosis. Yeah, since initiating treatment is uh, time sensitive in GCA, probably the median uh, or uh, the median uh, your case series of starting steroids, uh, symptoms to starting steroids might be a very added uh, value to the uh, uh, to the study and data. Uh, second question, Dr. Saad, uh, you've mentioned in the last slide that um, the study did not score high uh, in the uh, OS and the uh, Newcastle score. So um, why do you think is that? what factors led to uh, not scoring high on it? Actually, we found that uh, most of them uh, depend on the selection and the exposure, the outcome. We didn't find the, ex uh, the actually uh, what we want from this study because we give it, we have uh, four domains, around four or five domains, selection, exposure, outcome, and also the reporting. Depends on that, we, we, we categorize it to uh, around uh, Eight questions. For eight questions, we have uh, around uh, eight score. If the patient get around uh, more than five, we we call it uh, we consider it as a, a valid case uh, uh, report. For for that, actually, we found uh, around uh, thirty percent. Uh, uh, around thirty patient get uh, less than uh, uh, five. So uh, depends on that. We give it. Uh, we we call them uh, uh, a low score for that. Thank you very much. Uh, no further questions. Uh, I don't know if there are any questions from the audience that we can take, or maybe Dr. Jamal can conclude our session. Okay, uh, I don't see any more questions. I think we will end up here. I think I uh, would like to thank our uh, speakers. Uh, thank you very much, and <clears throat> we hope to see you, inshallah, in the future.
In the last few decades, there have been major advances in the understanding of the causes and development of spondyloarthropathies. A key element of this has been the recognition that enthesitis may be considered the primary pathological process underlying SPA-associated skeletal inflammation. Previous studies in PSA patients have identified risk factors for developing enthesitis to be high body mass, more active joint disease, and young age. This association between young age and enthesitis observed in PSA patients may be due to mechanical load being a trigger for enthesial inflammation, as physical activity is usually higher in younger individuals. It is likely that the overall burden of enthesitis may be higher than clinically estimated, primarily due to there being more enthesial sites than those assessed in standard clinical examinations. We also know that the application of imaging techniques yields a substantially higher prevalence of enthesitis than palpation. Enthesal pain can be disabling and the management of enthesitis is still seen as a challenge for rheumatologists. The HEAL trial was the first randomized placebo-controlled multi-center study of an anti-TNF agent for the treatment of patients with SPA with refractory HEAL enthesitis to show significant clinical benefits. In this trial, patients receiving Enbrel had significantly greater improvement in the PGA of HEAL enthesopathy activity versus placebo, with a significant change from baseline beginning at week 8. Patients also experienced an improvement in heel pain and lower limb function. These results suggest that Enbrel could be of significant benefit to patients with SPA suffering with heel enthesitis. It is my pleasure and honor to be uh, part of the faculty of uh, this uh, comprehensive congress. Uh, we're going to move to the systemic sclerosis and CTD um, uh, session. Uh, our talk today is going to be about systemic sclerosis related interstitial lung disease, um, diagnosis, and management. Uh, our speaker today is Dr. Khuloud Saleh who is a rheumatologist uh, and head of uh, the unit at the Farwaniyo Hospital. She's also a clinical tutor at the Faculty of Medicine, Kuwait University. Uh, Dr. Khuloud uh, finished her uh, fellowship from the University of Western Ontario uh, in Canada uh, in SLE and systemic sclerosis. Uh, she had been involved in multiple researches in lupus, chagrin, and rheumatoid arthritis. She also has another uh, interest of you related to uh, imaging and uh, uh, using MRI and she has been certified uh, with the ULAR advanced uh, uh, certificate. Uh, without further delay, I would like to welcome Dr. Khuloud uh, for her talk. And uh, thanks for joining us today. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the organizers from uh, Oman Society of Rheumatology for organizing the second GCC Rheumatology Conference. It's a great pleasure uh, for me to join you today as a speaker. And the task that was given to me 
is to talk about systemic sclerosis related lung disease. And uh, the topic for me is the updates in systemic sclerosis, uh, interstitial lung disease, diagnosis and management. Here is my disclosure. So my objectives of this talk is to know how common is interstitial lung disease in patients with systemic sclerosis. And then I will move on and talk about how to screen these patients with possible ILD. And then we will talk about follow-up of patients with scleroderma ILD. And in the second half of my talk, I will be focusing and reviewing updated guidelines in the management of scleroderma-related ILD. So systemic sclerosis is basically a rare and chronic autoimmune disease that has three main components that makes it very characteristic. So it has an evidence of autoimmunity, evidence of vasculopathy and fibrosis. And the hallmark of this disease is the presence of Raynaud's phenomena and skin sclerosis or sclerodectyly. And the leading causes of death in these patients are both pulmonary fibrosis and or pulmonary hypertension. So it's a rare disease. We see seven to 20 per million new cases per year. And the incidence with the prevalence varies widely across the geographic areas. It affects women aged between 25 to 55 years more than men. And up to 90% of patients with a scleroderma may develop some degree of ILD in the course of their disease. And about one fourth of these patients develops clinically significant lung disease, especially within the first three years of the diagnosis. So the peak of the risk of developing ILD is three years. Scleroderma ILD is responsible for about 35% of the overall mortality in patients with system sclerosis. And the median survival in patients with system sclerosis ILD is five to eight. And the 10 year survival in overall patients with scleroderma is 71 that has been improved from the 54 back in 1970 before the uh, use of uh, ACE inhibitor to reduce the mortality from renal crisis. So a little bit of pathogenesis to understand the uh, upcoming uh, therapies and managing these patients. So, so there is definitely macrophage dysfunction in these patients with fibroblast uh, uh, migration, activation, and differentiation as well. And there is also elevated pro-inflammatory cytokines with upregulation expression of the tumor growth factor beta and interferon regu regulated genes, as well as gene for uh, chemokine legend 4. And in these patients who are uh, developing uh, pulmonary fibrosis, uh, there is genetic markers for the fibrosis, and those are the collagen type 1A and uh, uh, connective tissue growth factor, as well as matrix metalloproteinase. The clinical presentation are uh, a lot in scleroderma. As you know, there's skin changes like hardening. Uh, 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 there is also uh, dysfunction of the uh, uh, melanocytes with hypo and hyperpigmentation. They are prone to have calcinosis and telangiectasia. There's a lot of a lot of hands and face changes as well, and uh, they are prone to have musculoskeletal complaints. Cardiovascular system also can be involved, so they can have spasms of their coronary arteries, they can have irregular heartbeats, constrictive pericarditis, and of course, pulmonary manifestations are either uh, interstitial lung disease and or pulmonary hypertension, including pulmonary arterial hypertension. GI manifestations, uh, uh, as you know, uh, a lot, ranging from dysphagia to diarrhea, alternating with, with constipation, bacterial overgrowth, and malabsorption. And they are also prone to have renal crisis, and vasculitis. There are two main categories of systemic scleroderma, the limited form, which is seen in 70% of patients that affects the skin of the face and distally to the uh, elbows and distal to the knees. It develops very slow and the internal organ involvement, including ILD is less common than what we see it in the diffuse form. Diffuse cutaneous is seen in 30% of overall patients with scleroderma. It affects the skin all over the body, including the face and the trunk, and it develops quickly as compared to the limited form. The internal organ involvement, including ILD, is more common and earlier in the course of the disease. There is a very rare form. Uh, personally, I had only two cases of sinus scleroderma. 
so in these patients, there is no skin involvement whatsoever. Their skin is absolutely normal, but they do have Raynaud's and they do have uh, 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 fibrosis or affected internal organs. And uh, probably they may have an evidence of autoimmunity as well. So this is the classic presentation for, of limited systemic scleroderma. So as I said, Raynaud's develops first and it takes long time to develop the other features. So five to 10 years to have digital edema, sclerodactyly, GI symptoms, telangiectasias, and they are more prone to have anti-centromere positive. And after even longer period of time, like in 10 to 20 years, they may have pulmonary arterial hypertension. Um, on the other hand, this is the classic presentation of diffuse form. So they can have Raynaud's along with the, the whole manifestations of the uh, disease at the same time, or it may take a few, few months to have the progressive skin disease, GI involvement, arthritis, for example, and they are more prone to have SCL70 or antitopoisomerase. It's the same uh, antibody positive. And after one to five years maximum, they may develop ILD or renal crisis. It peaks in three years after the onset of renus. This is the survival in patients with limited systemic sclerosis as uh, compared to the uh, diffuse uh, skin. So as you can see, the survival rate is uh, in favor of the limited scleroderma. Survival is 55 in the diffuse form, but uh, 90, uh, 69 or almost 70 in the uh, uh, limited uh, form. Uh, this is uh, after 180 months. So talking about the diagnosis of systemic sclerosis could be, it could be a challenge. Why is that? Because we have non-specific symptoms. Patients may present only with fatigue, puffy hands. They have very variable presentations. And there is no single diagnostic test to diagnose them uh, uh, faster. And the differential diagnosis is a lot here. But on the other hand, we have diagnostic tools such as the evidence of fibrosis, whether it's in the skin or internal organ. We have to look for evidence of vasculopathy and evidence of autoantibodies. And we have a good scoring system, which is, which is the ACR and ULAR classification criteria. Here they address all the three elements. We have the evidence of fibrosis, which is covered here. There's evidence of vascul vasculopathy and evidence of autoimmunity. And if the patient scores not nine or above of these points, they then have definite systemic scleroderma. This is from Inbuilt. This is uh, uh, the uh, interstitial lung disease diagnosed in about 170 patients with autoimmune disease. And they found that RA related IND found in 50% of cases. And then one fourth of these cases, they were having scleroderma related IND. Talking, talking about how uh, fast will it develop, this is uh, interstitial lung disease. Uh, in scleroderma patients, and it was found that the pulmonary involvement is evident in one year only after the onset of Raynaud's phenomena as measured by FVC below 80%. So it develops early in the course of the disease, and this study was in around 700 patients. So as you know, the patterns of interstitial lung disease is connective and connective tissue dis, uh, disorders, we have two main patterns, which is the non-specific IP and the UIP. Non-specific IP is seen in all the connective tissue disease, uh, but not in RA, where we have the UIP commoner than NSIP. NSIP is the form that we do see in scleroderma and Sjogren's, for example. Talking now about the diagnostic challenges in scleroderma-related ILD. So why it's a challenge? Because they may have heterogeneous presentation during the course of the disease. They may have non-specific symptoms. Not all the patients comes to you with dry cough or shortness of breath. And there are patients that have, that have also subclinical disease, quietly asymptomatic. So early and regular screening is therefore essential to ensure early diagnosis to detect these patients uh, before a significant progression occurs. Okay, let's talk about the risk of ILD that uh, develops in the two main forms of uh, system sclerosis. So we can see ILD in about 35% of patients with limited form and 50% in patients with diffuse form. If we rely only on physical symptoms, so uh, symptoms of these patients may not be uh, presented all the time. And if it is there, the most common is the, uh, they present with dyspnea on exertion. And others in the other indicators could be a dry cough, fatigue, and probably chest pain. 
And if we look at the physical examination, so we just auscultate for crackles at the basis, sometimes it's not there. So you have to keep in mind the symptoms not always presented. Also, the physical examination is not always abnormal. So we do need regular screening and monitoring for IND. So I'm going to focus now on the evidence-based European consensus statements uh, regarding the identification and management of ILD and scleroderma. So here is the steering committee and the expert panel. The expert panel consists of four internists, eight pulmonologists, and 19 rheumatologists with a median experience in treating these patients of 11 years. And the panel members treated more than 1,400 patients with scleroderma lung disease in the last year. So they came up with 95 statements, uh, were tested across six main domains that I will cover now. So first they added the risk factors of IND, and then how to screen these patients, and then how to diagnose uh, the uh, ILD with assessing the severity, and then treatment initiation options, and disease progression measurements, and then we move on and talk about the treatment uh, escalation. So they came up with six main risk factors that increase the likelihood of de developing ILD. And these risk factors are the presence of respiratory symptoms, smoking history, ethnicity, so being a Native American or African heritage, uh, they, uh, uh, it will carry a higher risk to develop ILD, male gender, diffuse cutaneous scleroderma, and the presence of antitopoisomerase 1 or SCL70. On the other hand, it, it was found that anticentromere antibody antibodies increase, decrease, sorry, the likelihood of developing ILD. Next domain is to address when and how should patients with system sclerosis be screened for uh, ILD. So they uh, emphasize that all patients should be screened at baseline using HRCT and pulmonary function tests, especially looking at the FVC and DLCO with the auscultation. The frequency of HRCT depends on the clinician or the rheumatologist and the pulmonolo pulmonologist. And the screening with pulmonary function test as well as auscultation should be repeated regularly each visit. Regarding staging, why it's important to stage patients with scleroderma ILD? Because the extent of the disease and the severity is related directly to the mortality risk and survival. So if we look at the HRCT, if there is less than 10% involvement on the left side, this is a limited disease. And on the right side, if there is more than 30% involvement, then this is extensive disease. What about in between? So we have 10 to 30. This is indeterminate. And the driver here is, F, uh, is the FVC percent predict, uh, predicted. If it is more than or equal 70%, then this is limited form. If it is less than 70%, this is extensive disease. And of course, the limited disease, they have better survival than the extensive disease. What about timing for monitoring of scleroderma uh, IND? So with lung auscultation in each visit, as well as PFT, every three to six months, if the patients are symptomatic, and every 12 months in asymptomatic patients. And if you detect any abnormalities in their PFT and or progress, progression of their symptoms, then you have to repeat HRCT. Remember when I said screening for HRCT, all of them should have a baseline. So on the right side, if they have a limited disease uh, by HRCT, then we have to evaluate their symptoms with PFTs every three to six months. If their disease is stable for about five years, then you can go for uh, PFTs every 12 months. In those patients with extensive disease, we have to consider treatment. And you have to check if there is any changes in PFTs, uh, for example, decline in their uh, FVC or uh, DLCO, then we have to repeat uh, HRCT and uh, discuss the uh, pharmacological options. And then now we should know how should disease progression be assessed. So in talking about the progression of the disease, there are four main factors that we have to address. Any changes in the extent of fibrosis or pattern on HRCT, PFT, including FVC, uh, DLCO with the absolute value or uh, FVC decline, and the six minutes walk or exercise induced oxygen desaturation and worsening of the clinical symptoms that reflects the quality of life of these patients. And when talking about treatment escalation, there are two main drivers here, the pace of progression, 
So how rapid or how fast do they progress and the disease severity. And the panel states that all patients with severe or progressive scleroderma ILD should be offered pharmacological treatment with either antifibrotic agents, mycophenolate, mofetil, and cyclophosphamide are the treatment op uh, options here. And rituximab may be also considered. Uh, of course, in uh, 2016, the uh, hematopoietic uh, stem cell uh, transplant was uh, approved and it was recommended in 2016. And of course, you have to uh, check patients also that needs lung uh, transplants. Now, we should know when should a patient with systemic scleroderma related ILD receive a treatment. So unfortunately, there are limited guidelines on timing and management of treatment for scleroderma. You have here four examples, like for example, uh, Khan et al. We have the Volkman uh, uh, that was published in 2016. But in all of them, they, had, they have common uh, uh, features. So they relied mainly on symptoms, PFTs, and the extent of disease on HRCT. This is EULA recommend, recommendation and in 2017, they recommended the use of cyclophosphamide and hematopoietic stem cell transplant in patients with systemic sclerosis uh, IMD. So despite the toxicity of cyclophosphamide, they said that it should be used, especially in patients with progressive IMD. Regarding the HSCT should be also considered for treatment of selected patients with rapidly progressive scleroderma at risk of uh, organ failure. But you have to remember one thing, since the publication of these guidelines, results of many RCTs came out, such as uh, scleroderma lung uh, study too, and the uh, census as well as in built trials have been published after, after that. Talking about the rationale of the emerging treatment options. So, so far we have the existing treatment aiming to minimize uh, the progression and the symptoms, but nothing to stop the natural course of the disease. We have the non-specific immune suppressive medications with probably significant toxicities such as cyclophosphamide. And we have the emerging treatment options focusing on the nature or on the root uh, of, this, uh, of this disease by targeting the uh, either the underlying uh, autoimmunity, like I'm going to talk about IL-6, or the resulting fibrosis. So I'm talking here about the antifibrotic agents. So the tyrosine kinase inhibitors, the only one that was uh, FDA approved is nantidinib for uh, uh, management of scleroderma IMD. And the perfinidone uh, was FDA, US uh, FDA approved for treatment of idiopathic uh, PF. So talking about the ULAR consensus, this is the algorithm for scleroderma IMD. So starting from the top, screening all patients with system sclerosis by HRCT, PFT, and every patient should receive the physical examination. So if this is positive, any of those, HRCT or PFT, they have to, we have to evaluate the uh, six minutes walk, the quality of life of the patient, and then decide if the patients need pharmacological therapy. So it depends on all of these factors. So if we go with pharmacological therapy, then the choices here, according to the EULAR, is uh, Celsept or uh, mycophenolate mofatil, cyclophosphamide, nantidinib. But again, remember, a lot of RCTs came after this uh, was pub published. And uh, we have to follow up these patients again with the HRCT assessment, PFT, the six minutes walk. And if they have either disease progression or inadequate treatment response, we can escalate therapy. And how do we do that? So we have to optimize therapy. For example, if they were on suboptimal dose of mycophenolate, we can increase the dose. If they fail cyclophosphamide, we can switch to mycophenolate. Or probably some experts add the uh, nantidinib antifibrotic agent on the top of uh, Celsept. We have to consider also rit rituximab according to the recommendation and consider the uh, hematopoietic stem cell trial transplant in selected patients. Now I'm going to focus on this very nice paper. This is a narrative review that was published in February of 2020, talking about, uh, talking about therapeutic options for treatment of ILD in all connective tissue diseases. But I was very, very selective for the tables that covers the treatment of ILD and scleroderma. So there are three nice tables that 
uh, tables that summarize all the uh, trials that were done in scleroder scleroderma lung disease. So here is the summary. Talking about glucocorticoids, the efficacy of glucocorticoids is controversial, uh, but still uh, it's empirically used in most clinical trials and in association with immune suppressive drugs. The efficacy of glucocorticoids on PFT was found to be only slightly positive in patients with FVC more than 75, so in mild disease. And you should be very cautious as a scleroderma renal crisis may develop in long-term use of glucocorticoids over 10 mg uh, prednisolone per day. Cyclophosphamide, two high quality RCTs have investigated the use of cyclophosphamide. Uh, we have the uh, scleroderma lung study one and FAST. And despite the known toxicity of cyclophosphamide still, uh, it should be considered in patients, uh, especially those with uh, progressive ILD and the dose duration of the treatment should be tailored and individualized according to the condition and the response. Next is uh, HSCT that was uh, proven in uh, 2016. Uh, it carries a high mortality uh, due to uh, infections, so it should be done in specialized center and patients should be highly selected. So it's approved for those patients with rapidly progressive scleroderma at risk of organ failure. The assessed uh, trial uh, showed that uh, HSCT was superior to cy cyclophosphamide therapy with respect to both improvement in skin score and lung uh, volume. Next is mycophenolate mofotel. So many observational studies provide, provide encouraging the results of use of mycophen uh, mycophenolate mofotel and scleroderma ILD has led that, uh, to uh, uh, many experts using it as a first line and study of cyclophosphamide as it has a good uh, safety profile. Uh, SLS2 is the only available randomized trial that compared the mycophenolate to oral cyclophosphamide. It shows that there is long lasting efficacy on lung functions, parameters, and dyspnea with a high safety profile uh, in uh, the uh, MMF uh, group. ULAR International guidelines didn't consider it, as I mentioned before, uh, didn't consider MMF as treatment uh, option and uh, scleroderma ILD because it was published before the results of uh, scleroderma study two. Uh, next is azathioprine. So in the clinical practice, azathioprine is considered a well-tolerated and alternative uh, agent for maintenance therapy in patients with scleroderma ILD after induction with cyclophosphamide or MMF. FAST trial was addressing this uh, the uh, issue and recommended its use as a maintenance therapy. Next is rituximab. So there are several studies reassuring uh, the use of uh, rituximab in uh, these patients. The commonest one is recovered trial. And the available data so far showed encouraging short and long-term results with an acceptable safety profile. So next is IL-6 inhibitors. So uh, tocilizumab to to or uh, Actemra is the first uh, biological therapy used in scleroderma ILD. And in March of last year, 2021, the US uh, FDA approving the use of Actemra or tocilizumab and uh, scleroderma related uh, ILD. And uh, the uh, focus, the trial was on uh, was done on uh, 212 patients, and the results uh, were encouraging regarding the FVC. Talking about nitidinib or the uh, antifibrotic agents, in preclinical studies, uh, the uh, nitidinib uh, demonstrated reduction in tissue density, fibrosis score, and uh, myofibroblast count. And they found that the decline in FVC and the placebo group uh, is influenced by the combination with MMF, suggesting the role of MMF on the lung rather than the uh, nitidinib. Nantidimum was observed uh, to have no effect on the skin or health-related quality of life, but there is a still uh, ongoing uh, study, I think uh, the impulse still uh, two or three. Uh, the drug was approved for, uh, the, uh, by the FDA in uh, September of uh, last year for treating uh, patients with scleroderma-related uh, lung disease. So here is my take home message. Scleroderma is a very heterogeneous in organ involvement and manifestations. 
Pulmonary fibrosis and pulmonary hypertension are the leading causes of death in these patients. Early and regular screening is essential to ensure early detection of uh, scleroderma ILD before significant progression occurs. Both PFT and HRCT are essential in early diagnosis and follow-up in patients with scleroderma lung disease. More than one measure should be taken into consideration to assist the progression of the disease, and that will affect the survival and the decision of treatment. And these uh, measures are the changes in the extent of fibrosis or the pattern of HRCT, PFT taking into consideration FVC and DLCO absolute value or FVC decline, the six minutes walk or the exercise induced oxygen desaturation, and if there's any worsening of the clinical symptoms that may affect the patient's quality of life. And at the end, uh, the uh, approach that should be taken in these patients is a multidisciplinary team approach. So we have to collaborate with our colleagues, the respirologists, uh, for optimal management of uh, patients with scleroderma-related interstitial lung disease. And thank you very much for listening, and I'm willing to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Khulut, for this extensive review. Um, it's always nice uh, to hear uh, scleroderma lectures uh, from colleagues uh, uh, in the Gulf because uh, we really would like to uh, increase the awareness uh, on this rare disease and its complications. Um, I would like to ask you first, uh, from uh, your point of view as someone who worked in a scleroderma center, uh, what would be your advice when a general rheumatologist who uh, is working in a secondary setting or a private uh, sector, whenever he diagnoses uh, scleroderma patients, do you think he should uh, embark in the uh, uh, journey of managing these patients or better uh, to take the habit of referring these patients to a tertiary care hospital and uh, to a more experienced colleague? Yeah, very nice question, uh, Mohammed, to answer. Uh, I was working with Janet Pope. She's uh, the god of scleroderma in Canada, as you know. Um, the patients in the tertiary hospitals were referred to her, and she was having a shared clinic with respirology. So I think these patients, as they are rare, uh, and the mortality is very high in patients with ILD. I think they deserve to be uh, treated um, under uh, expert hands in combination with uh, both consultant rheum rheumatologists who has experience in treating these patients along with the, uh, our colleagues, respirologists. So I think if the patient's very stable, asymptomatic, PFTs are reassur reassuring, then they can be followed in tertiary as long as the rheumatologist is following them closely, like every three to four months. Uh, if they are asymptomatic, then they can increase the frequency of uh, their PFT or auscultation. And if they detect any abnormalities with PFT, they have to do the HRCT. If there is uh, HRCT changes, it's better to be referred to uh, hospital where they, they are speci specialized to treat uh, those patients, especially in extensive disease. My, my next question is about uh, the use of corticosteroids. As you know, the ULAR consensus um, has uh, advised against uh, the use of, of corticosteroids. Sure. Now, of course, um, uh, this recommendation has not been based on uh, research. It has been based on their uh, uh, expert opinion. 
Uh, and still you can see that uh, many patients with ILD going into clinical trials of systemic sclerosis, um, a large proportion of them, uh, at least 50% are on corticosteroids. So if you have a patient today and you have the practice and what is seen in the clinical trials where these are the best centers managing systemic sclerosis and the ULR consensus uh, driving you away from uh, lower doses of corticosteroids. We're not talking about high dose, of course, uh, five milligrams or less. Uh, how would you uh, like combine these two views in your practice in a patient that you see today? Well, in my practice, those patients, uh, because I have lost like two patients with renal crisis, I really hate using steroids uh, or taking decision of using steroids uh, in these patients. So I always discuss it with my colleague. I have uh, in the uh, Farwani Hospital, I'm working with a very nice colleague who has ex experience in treating patients with ILD as well as pulmonary hypertension. So he also doesn't like steroids, but if the patient has progressive symptoms with high inflammatory markers, for example, high ESR, high CRP, he prefers to give a short period of steroids, like not exceeding 15 mg along with the immune suppressive mitigation wean them off uh, as soon as possible, like within two months, they should be off. The same time, I'm, I'm watching them very closely for a possible uh, renal crisis, and I have not get any uh, patients with uh, such complication uh, when I started collaborating with the, uh, my colleague. So yeah, uh, if we can avoid it, better, I think, but if there is porologist ad advice, to start uh, low dose, then yes, we try, why not? Especially in rapidly progressive patients' uh, symptoms. Okay, my last question to you. Do you see that cyclophosphamide now is um, losing its uh, uh, place as uh, uh, the initial therapy of uh, treating uh, scleroderma-related ILD and even other uh, CTD related ILD with the introduction of safer medications like mycophenolate, mofetail, tocilizumab, and Nintendo. Same story as in lupus nephritis. Yes, I think that's very true. Yes. Okay. okay. I think um, we don't have any questions. So I think uh, everyone now uh, knows how to manage uh, scleroderma related ILD. Uh, Victor, it was a pleasure listening to you, and uh, we thank you for your effort. And Thanks, we hope that everyone enjoys the uh, remaining of the uh, conference. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Assalamu alaikum, uh, welcome back. Uh, we're gonna now uh, move to the abstract session on uh, uh, connective tissue diseases. 
Uh, we have two abstracts uh, along with my dear colleague, uh, Dr. Rajai Namas, uh, my co-chairman. Uh, the first abstract is going to be presented from Dr. Ashat Halkindi, who graduated from the Arabian Gulf University in Bahrain in 2013. She completed her Oman Medical Specialty Board in Medicine in November 2018 and joined the Acute Medicine Department Royal Hospital, where she works as a senior registrar. Um, I'm very glad that she's going to present uh, one of my uh, favorite topics, uh, which is uh, about uh, systemic sclerosis uh, experience uh, from the Sultan of Oman. Uh, Dr. Rashada, you're uh, on the stage. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Shada Khalid Al Kindi. Um, I'm from Acute Medicine uh, Royal Hospital, Oman. Today I'll be talking about uh, my research, which was on the demographic data of patients with systemic sclerosis in Sultanate of Oman. So to begin with, uh, systemic sclerosis is a rare, complex, heterogeneous immune-mediated disease of unknown etiology. It's characterized by fibrosis of skin and internal organs, uh, along with immunological disturbances and microvasculopathies. So why this topic of research? Well, um, up until the time we did the, our research, there was no study of demographics and clinical characteristics of systemic sclerosis in Sultanate of Oman. And since it's a heterogeneous disease with varying presentation and demographics, uh, in different ethnic uh, groups, it was important to study it in our population. Also, to, uh, it will help identify any potential differences in presentation that may impact management options. So this was a retrospective study done in Royal Hospital Oman. Uh, we looked at all the patients uh, labeled to have systemic sclerosis uh, in our hospital records between the years of 2006 to 2014. And after that, uh, all patients fulfilling the American College of Rheumatology ACR 1980 criteria for systemic sclerosis or those fulfilling the American College of Rheumatology slash European League Against Rheumatism ACR ULAR 2013 classification were included in the study. So they needed to fulfill either criteria. Uh, after that, a questionnaire was filled with all the patient's demographic, uh, clinical presentation, most common symptoms, um, uh, lab investigation, and uh, treatment. And an analysis was done using SPSS. So as you can see, 32 uh, patients fulfilled our inclusion criteria. Of the 32, uh, 29 were female and 3 were male. Um, so at a ratio of female to male of 9.6 to 1, which is basically on the higher end of the global calculated ratio, which ranged between um, a ratio of 3 to 1 to a ratio of 14 to 1. The age, uh, the mean age uh, at diagnosis of our patients was 38 uh, plus minus 12 years. Uh, in a meta-analysis uh, of worldwide global analysis, um, the mean age was 46.7. Um, the duration of symptoms before diagnosis was 34 plus minus 40 months. Um, most of our patients uh, met the 1980 ACR criteria, which is 31 patients, 96.9%, uh, and 27 patients met the ULAR ACR 2013 criteria, which is 84.4%. Um, we also had patients with overlap syndrome, 50% of our patients. Uh, of our patients with systemic sclerosis, um, most of them had limited cutaneous uh, systemic sclerosis. Uh, that's 26 patients, which is at 81.3%, and six patients had diffuse cutaneous, which is 18.8%. So the ratio of limited cutaneous to diffuse cutaneous was 4.3 to 1, which was similar to a cohort uh, study in Iran. The mortality um, was 21.9%, as you can see. 
These are the clinical features of uh, the Omani patients with systemic sclerosis. As you can see that 100% of the patients had cutaneous manifestations, 87% uh, had vascular manifestations, 62.5% um, had pulmonary manifestations, 31% uh, had cardiac manifestations, 78 gastric, 21% renal, and 78% had musculoskeletal involvement. The most common symptom in our study was Raynaud. 87% uh, had uh, this symptom, 82% uh, had shortness of breath, and 64% had GERD. Of the skin manifestations, the most common was sclerodactyly, 46% had it, telangiectasia was at 41%, and pigmentation 31%. Of the vascular manifestations, Raynaud's was the most common at 87.5%. Uh, after that comes gangrene and digital ulcers, 38% of the patients had it, and then calcinosis, 32%. Of the gastrointestinal symptoms, 64% uh, complained of gastroesophageal reflux uh, dis disease, and 36% uh, complained of dysphagia. Uh, despite the large number of uh, patients complaining of uh, GI symptoms, uh, only 9% um, showed gastritis or ulcer on OGD, and 15% showed dilated esophagus. Of the pulmonary manifestation, shortness of breath was the most common symptom. 82% uh, had this symptom. Uh, however, 41% complained of cough. 55% um, of um, the patients actually were found to have interstitial lung disease uh, radiologically. However, in terms of pulmonary function tests, it did not correlate with the radiological images, uh, mostly because uh, many of the patients, when they presented, uh, were not fit for PFT, either because of poor functional status or acute uh, conditions. Uh, cardiac manifestations were less common. Uh, echoes did show pulmonary hypertension in 25% of our patient and pericardial effusion in 16%. 78% of the patients had uh, musculoskeletal manifestations, either arthritis or arthralgia. 12.5% uh, uh, had osteoporosis. And um, x-ray changes, the most common was osteoacrolysis. Just going back to osteoporosis, uh, it's, uh, the value is not very high, which may correlate with the fact that our patients were not on very high doses of prednisolone, as we will see later on. Renal findings were uh, not common. And that is expected since most of our patients had limited cutaneous system sclerosis. Uh, only three patients basically had deranged renal function, hematuria, or proteinuria. Um, this was the autoantibody profile of our patients. Uh, so 92.6% had ANA positive, mostly with uh, ANA speckled pattern. Um, Anticentromere was not very common in our patients. Uh, with 6.2% uh, having positive anticentromere and 37.5% having antiscleroderm 70. Among uh, patients with diffuse cutaneous system sclerosis, only four had antiscleroderm uh, positive and two uh, had anticentromere positive. Among the patients with limited cutaneous, eight patients had an positive antiscleroderm but zero had uh, anticentromere positive. So the majority of patients, uh, um, majority of antiscleroderma positive patients were having limited cutaneous systemic sclerosis. Uh, these are the most commonly prescribed uh, drugs, um, omeprazole, omeprazole being the most common, then prednisolone, MMF, amlodipine, and azathioprine. Although most of our patients were on prednisolone, which is 75%, the mean prednisolone dose was 6 uh, plus minus 2 mg, and the mean maximum prednisolone dose was 25 plus minus 13 mg.
Most of our patients received immunosuppressive therapy. Most commonly what, uh, was uh, mycophenolismophytal, 62.5% received it. Uh, after that, 47% received azathioprine, 31% received cyclospo uh, cyclophosphamide, and 16% received rituximab. The mortality rate, uh, as we mentioned before, was 21.9%. Uh, the limitation of the study is the small sample size and uh, the fact that it's a retrospective study. Uh, this can be improved by having a multi-centered uh, study. In conclusion, Armani patients presented in a similar picture as uh, other populations. Uh, limited uh, systemic sclerosis was more common than diffuse in our population. The most common symptoms were rhinos, shortness of breath, and GERD. Interestingly, um, our patients with positive anti-scleroderma 70 correlated with limited cutaneous, and those with positive anti-centromere uh, correlated to diffuse uh, cutaneous systemic sclerosis. Um, further study in the future, looking at the response of our population to therapy, uh, may help uh, guide further therapies uh, uh, for our patients. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Hope that was useful. Um, thanks a lot. The next session uh, will be on the anti-signal response protein, uh, antibody and uh, uh, myopathies and its response to rituximab. The speaker is Dr. Uh, Rabin Han, who is a third year medical student at Khalifa University. She's expected to graduate uh, in 2023. She's currently finishing her clinical uh, rotation at Sheikh Shahpout uh, Medical City in Abu Dhabi and uh, she has been involved in many research projects as an undergraduate. Uh, we're gonna present now her recording because Dr. Ravine is not gonna, gonna be able to join uh, physically. Hello, my name's Raven. I'm one of the authors on our abstract anti-SRP myopathy, a disabling myopathy and its response to rituximab. And I worked with Dr. Sherban Diab as well as Mutaz Atiyah. So I'll be presenting our abstract today. So to start with, I'll give you a little bit of background on anti-SRP myositis, since it is quite a rare condition. So it's a type of idiopathic inflammatory myositis, and these conditions are characterized by muscle inflammation. So there's usually four subtypes based on histopathological and clinical features. There's necrotizing myopathy, inclusion body myositis, and dermatomyositis, as well as polymyositis. So myositis antibodies are found in approximately 50% of these individuals with idiopathic inflammatory myositis. And of these 50% of individuals, four to 6% have anti-SRPs autoantibodies. So these are myositis specific antibodies that are directed against the ribonuclear protein particle SRP, whose role is to regulate protein translocation across the endoplasmic reticulum membrane during protein synthesis. So anti-SRP myopathy is distinct from polymyositis um, and tends to appear different than other idiopathic inflammatory myopathies because one of the most frequent findings on histopathology is that it shows necrotizing myopathy with lack of primary inflammation. There's also limited inflammation that has been collected and unfortunately some conflicting information. So some studies have found other features in necrotizing myopathies such as capillary pathology with depositions of uh, membrane complex, 
uh, with MHC1 immunostaining. So because there's limited and conflicting histopathological features, it suggests that there's a need for further investigation and collation of patients' histopathological features so we can know more about this condition. In addition to histopathologic differences to other IIMs, patients with anti-SRP autoantibodies tend to differ in clinical presentation. Unfortunately, they tend to present with a much more severe myopathy with proximal muscle weakness that rapidly deteriorates, as well as a significantly elevated serum creatinine kinase level on presentation. While other idiopathic inflammatory myopathies usually respond well to immunosuppressants, patients with anti-SRP antibodies, they typically don't respond very well, and they have characteristically poor responses to both steroids as well as other conventional immunosuppressive therapies such as methotrexate. As many of these anti-SRP patients may be refractory to these conventional treatments, there really needs to be an uh, investigation into alternate therapies so that we can offer effective treatment to these patients. So since they're refractory to conventional treatments, which medications can actually be effective? So there has been some evidence of B cell depleting drugs being effective in treatment of other refractory diseases that are autoimmune diseases that don't respond to traditional treatment, such as rheumatoid arthritis and SLE that are refractory to traditional treatments. And encouragingly, they've also shown a good response to B cell depleting therapies and other myopathies such as dermatomyositis. So rituximab is one of these B cell depleting drugs. It's an anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody. So given the effectiveness in other studies of B cell depleting drugs like rituximab and other systemic autoimmune diseases, it's a logical leap to investigate the use of this drug for anti-SRP myositis and see if it's effective for these patients. So how does it work? How does rituximab work in a myopathy? So anti-SRP myositis is considered to be a disease of humoral immune system. And as we know, B cells are known to produce antibodies as part of the humoral immune response. We also know that anti-SRP antibodies inhibit the function of signal recognition proteins via inhibition of the binding of the SRP to the SRP receptor. So these features suggest that B cell depletion has a role in the treatment of this disease to get rid of those B cells producing those antibodies. However, there's limited literature available. It's a rare disease, so there's limited information. And there's been mixed reports in the limited information available on rituximab's treatment efficacy in anti-SRP patients, as well as the safety. So even if it is effective, is it safe to use? So we wanted to investigate that. So the aim of our study was to assess the efficacy of using rituximab in treating refractory anti-SRP myopathies. So we had two patients at our hospital that we diagnosed with anti-SRP based on the presence of their antibodies and elevated creatinine kinase. They were both refractory to treatment with prednisolone. So we then tried treating them with rituximab. We then did a subsequent literature review and we found 40 further individuals who also had anti-SRP autobody, anti antibodies who um, were treated with rituximab. So it brought our sample size to 42. We then retrospectively reviewed their lab results, clinical features of each individual, as well as their response to rituximab based on two criteria, their creatinine kinase level post-treatment and their muscle strength post-treatment. So what did we find? The analysis of the patients presented in the study showed that rituximab was efficacious. It improved biochemical markers in as much as 90% of the patients, and they showed this via a decline in creatinine kinase levels post-therapy. Rituximab treatment also um, resulted in favorable clinical responses in the majority of patients, with over 71% of them experiencing improvement of strength after treatment with rituximab. So this is a very impressive feature, considering that these patients had been refractory to an average of three different drugs with no improvement in muscle strength, yet over 70% of them were successfully treated with rituximab. However, it is important to note that a potential limitation of our study is that it's a relatively small sample sizes, and also there might be unsuccessful cases that were not published, so not included in our literature review. So we also wanted to look at the adverse outcomes. What is the safety profile of rituximab? So we found actually in our sample size that adverse outcomes were minimal and only reported in 11% of patients, 
7% of being non-fatal uh, treatable minor side effects such as herpes zoster infection. There was mortality present, however, in 4% of the population. However, it's important to note that one of the two patients already had heart failure prior to treatment, and the other patient uh, unfortunately passed away due to aspiration pneumonia, but he already had been unable to swallow and had a severe disability due to the previous progression of his disease. So it's unclear if this is a side effect of rituximab or it was an unfortunate inevitable outcome of their previous disease progression. So these results suggest that the use of rituximab is actually typically well tolerated, and it might be the only medication that we have available that can improve both creatinine kinase levels and clinical strength. And very importantly, we even found remission in patients, and these are patients who would otherwise be non-responsive uh, to all other available treatment modalities we currently have. We also found some interesting demographic features. So previous studies had shown some of them a prevalence in African-American populations, whereas other studies found a higher prevalence among Caucasians. In our study, we found an equal distribution, and there was an equal prevalence amongst uh, Black individuals and Caucasian individuals. In our study, most of the patients were female, over 62%. However, again, this is a small sample size, so we can't accurately extrapolate demographic data. Other clinical findings we found um, were that the presentation of anti-SRP myositis might be even more widespread and devastating than uh, previously thought. So it's usually characterized by rapidly progressive proximal muscle weakness. However, 65 of our patients had axial muscle weakness, 56% had an additional weakness of their distal lower limbs, and 48% had weakness in their distal upper limbs, suggesting that a lot of these patients have a much more widespread mu muscle weakness than just proximal muscle weakness. So because of this severe presentation, we need to note that this can be a very debilitating disease that can lead to patients being wheelchair or bed bound or unable to swallow. We also wanted to see if there is any reversibility of the disease. As it's a necrotizing myopathy, there have been concerns whether or not this muscle can be regenerated or regrow. So um, promisingly, we found necrotizing features in only 56% of the patients and 25% of patients showed regeneration of muscle fibers, suggesting that there is uh, an ability to regenerate this muscle fibers. And the fact that some of these patients show clinical improvement in their muscle strength or even remission shows that it is reversible in some patients. So our conclusion is that rituximab therapy was efficacious, the majority of patients responded favorably, and they had reductions in creatinine kinase levels, improved muscle strength. So our take home is that rituximab seems to be effective for patients with anti-SRP myositis that is refractory to other traditional therapies. And thank you so much for your time and taking the time to listen today. back. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ashada. We're uh, very proud of your work. Uh, and um, I'm really glad that these clear derma data are coming out uh, from the Gulf region. Now, if you are interested, uh, uh, Dr. Rajai Namas is leading an initiative uh, uh, in the Middle East, and he has collected more than two, 250 uh, patients. Uh, uh, and I think that your supervisor would be happy to uh, to contact Dr. Rajai to include your data. So it's gonna be a, a larger study. And the study also aims at comparing our uh, demographics and characteristics to uh, the North American cohorts in the US and Canada. So uh, I think we, we, we should join forces to have uh, this data and, uh, uh, stronger and uh, see if there are any differences. Actually, uh, I'm really happy because uh, 
your um, findings uh, are quite similar to what we have found in our cohort. Uh, a younger age uh, at presentation, uh, mm -hmm. a lower anti-centromere uh, antibody, uh, which uh, is not similar to what has been seen in Caucasians. Now, um, I just want to ask you, um, uh, how do you see if you have attended the lecture of Dr. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Sahar? Uh, mm -hmm. about the use of corticosteroids. And in your cohort, you had a large uh, uh, percentage of patients using uh, corticosteroids. How do you think that this is gonna be uh, changed with the, with the, uh, the uh, diagnosis of new patients? Would you, th would you see that the percentage of patients who are gonna receive corticosteroids is gonna be less, same, Yes, um, I think um, maybe now we're moving towards uh, or we're moving away from using of steroids. And uh, luckily enough that our patients, we didn't have much cases of renal crisis, but it's something to be careful uh, of in the future. And yeah, it would be interesting definitely um, because our study ended in 2014, but uh, it would be interesting to see if there's change now in the, the later patients. Yeah, I think you should uh, add to the patients uh, from 2014 onward to have a larger sample size. Now, mm -hmm. another point is, how would you explain that the uh, 2013 ACR ULAR criteria mm -hmm. are more sensitive in the diagnosis of systemic sclerosis uh, compared to the 1980 preliminary criteria, and you have a higher percentage in the 1980. So, uh, what what we would uh, uh, expect is a reversed uh, percentage where you have a higher uh, diagnosis based on the scoring system, the 2013. Mm. Definitely, yeah, that was interesting actually to observe. Uh, we think basically it might be because uh, we weren't um, our patients uh, in the clinic uh, didn't have a name for the capillary scope done for them. So maybe, and that is part of the 2013 uh, ACR ULR criteria. So maybe that's why uh, most of our patients fulfilled the older criteria. Uh, but uh, as you mentioned, it's the 2013 is more sensitive. So uh, it was interesting to see that um, actually we had um, more patients fulfilling the older criteria. Okay. So I don't see any questions. Uh, I would like to conclude and uh, thank uh, both speakers. And I would like to apologize on behalf of my colleague, Dr. Rajai, because he had an urgent matter to hold and uh, he could not uh, join us. Um, uh, I hope that in the next meeting, we're gonna have more research in uh, CTD uh, and see more data on this rare disease. Thank you all. Thank you, thank you very much. again and uh, I think we are coming to the last session today uh, after the heavy three days or two days and a half. Uh, the last session probably is not the least and I think most of you know uh, that's usually in the conferences what's happening. So it's given me great pleasure to introduce the next speaker Dr. Samar al Amadi. She's a senior consultant in rheumatology. She's deficient chief of rheumatology and also uh, of rheumatology deficient and she's a program director of the rheumatology at the Hamad Medical Corporation. <coughs> she uh, is president of the Qatar Rheumatology Association and Qatar Osteoporosis Societies. She's assistant professor at Will Cornell Medical College in Qatar. She had an MBA in London Business School. So she, she took the extra miles uh, <coughs> uh, in going to business as well. 
and she had multiple publications in peer-reviewed uh, journals. Uh, Dr. Samar is going to talk about pregnancy and uh, connective tissue disease, her experience, and basically literature review. And uh, Dr. Samar, please, uh, the floor is yours. I'd like to thank the organizing committee to give me the chance to talk about pregnancy, rheumatic disease, and Qatar. So today, uh, I don't have any conflict of interest with regard to this uh, topic. And I will take you through um, an introduction and I will uh, speak a little bit about the pregnancy rheumatic disease clinic service that we are uh, having here in Qatar since 2006. And I will focus actually in this lecture today about data uh, from the clinic with a focus on COVID and autoimmune rheumatic disease and the pregnancy and also immunization and TNF. So again, Hamad Medical Corporation consists of 12 hospitals connected through an electronic health care system. It serves a population of over 2 million. It does have a high standards of centralized care at a low cost. It's an institute of an excellence in medical education and research. And it is the first corporate outside the U.S. to have all its hospitals accredited by JCI and currently for education by ACGMEI. Pregnancy Rheumatic Disease Clinic Service in Qatar started by myself in 2005. It's a weekly clinic in direct collaboration with high-risk pregnancy and fetal maternal clinics. All diagnosed cases with rheumatic disease are referred to my clinic. We see patients pre-pregnancy, during pregnancy, post-pregnancy, so we do a lot of counseling. It is part of fellowship training program for rheumatology uh, fellowship and for high-risk pregnancy fellows. We do have currently a research team and we treat very difficult cases during a pregnancy, including patient on dialysis and in the intensive care unit. So what do we have in the clinic? This is just a glimpse of what do we see in the clinic. So we do see all uh, diseases in rheumatology. There is no limitation for this clinic uh, for any referral. So this is just to highlight a few numbers that we do have, uh, and you can see the impact and how busy is this clinic. So we have antiphospholipid uh, around 218 pregnancy recorded in this clinic after the diagnosis and without counting the prior ones, which are 378. We have 179 Sjogren's, 238 lupus, Rheumatoid arthritis above 100, spondyloarthritis and psoriatic arthritis. Currently, the number are increasing. If we can combine the both, we have more than 100 pregnancies currently. And scleroderma, we have seven pregnancies after the diagnosis of systemic sclerosis. What I mean by after diagnosis, after they've been seen by a rheumatologist in the clinic at one point. What about medication that we are using? So we are using safe medication during pregnancy and all of us, we knew what they are, the safe medications. So the commonest medication used are hydroxychloroquine and sulfasalazine. We don't use a lot of steroid um, as we are not a pro-steroid in Qatar unless it is an emergency and it is indicated. Uh, Eclixan is giving, which is um, uh, given only for cases indicated uh, either uh, either primary or secondary antiphospholipid. And uh, aspirin is given for most um, of the lupus patient and antiphospholipid. So if we say uh, regarding uh, lupus, what is the percentage of lupus taking hydroxychloroquine is 82%. In comparison to a different studies worldwide, um, we are, I think, doing better because in most of the um, published data, the maximum they reach up to 60%, F70% in some studies. But still, we want to see this up to 100%. And we do have some limitation why we are not reaching 100% that I'm going to talk about. Uh, because some people are non-compliance, uh, some people their diagnosis is established post-delivery, and some people, they do have fear of side effects, specifically the retinal toxicity when it comes that it is uh, vocalized to them by a non-rheumatologist, either a GP, obstetrician, or ophthalmologist sometimes. And some patients will have side effects, and specifically, we know that women, they do care about their skin appearance, and the skin hyperpigmentation is one of the side effects of hydroxychloroquine. 
What about the pregnancy morbidity? In our data, we found that uh, eclampsia, preeclampsia is more common with the lupus, Sjogren, antiphospholipid, and definitely scleroderma. But we have found that gestational diabetes is higher with SPA and PSA. And maybe this is because, for example, psoriatic arthritis patients, we know that they are more obese than the other population. Uh, we did not yet dig in our data why they are more of gestational diabetes, but soon we will have uh, our uh, manuscript for that. What about the pregnancy outcome? It is fair enough that we do have around um, more than 80% of a live birth. Uh, and we do have uh, our abortion uh, percentage is less than the published data. And our entry trial fetal death mainly actually with the antiphospholipid had been improved dramatically after being seen in this clinic and after being on the proper treatment. If we say antiphospholipid pregnancy outcome, so before the diagnosis, live birth was uh, 41, after the diagnosis was 56%, so we have an improvement. In abortion, we have before the diagnosis around 46%, after the diagnosis 35%, and intrauterine fetal death dramatically improved where we just have now 6% injury trying uh, fetal death in comparison to 11% in the past. So how do we follow the patient in this clinic? So patients are referred from primary rheumatologist and sometimes from obstetrician or direct referral from a private clinic. All patients are counseled depending on their disease type. We do adjust medication to a compatible one with the pregnancy and lactation. And we try to keep our risk that the patient in remission if they are coming to our clinic with no remission. And we know that this is in this part of the world and the culture, people comes to the clinic all of a sudden that they are pregnant without even uh, being on the proper medications or if they are um, still active. And the great bond actually do, we do have with the fetal maternal um, as we do have our protocol for congenital heart block detection and raw lab positive cases. We have several publications in the past. I'm not going to go through them because I want to focus specifically today on two uh, of them. So we had in the past the outcome of 69 pregnancies within a multinational population of systemic lupus erythematosus in Qatar. Then we had um, a meeting, a collaborative meeting with uh, Professor Monica Austinson to enhance the service of rheumatic disease in the Middle East. Then we had the safety of use of vitamin D in a pregnant woman with rheumatic disease and their babies. And then we do have um, then later an abstract which was uh, presented in ACR the impact of anti row antibodies on a pregnancy outcome in relation to a maternal disease presentation. And in conclusion of that abstract, in this study, we observed low incidence of congenital heart block in general. Interestingly, it happened only in asymptomatic women with a high antibody titer. So it was retrospective diagnosis. Miscarriages and intrauterine fetal death were more frequent than congenital heart block in patients with a primary sugar. Hydroxychloroquine was associated with a lower frequency of fetal adverse event. I'm gonna talk more now about two papers. One of them uh, that was presented in ECR and also in the Pregnancy and Rheumatic Disease Conference uh, just recently uh, last year. So the first one is about the vaccination of an infant born to a mother's on TNF inhibitors. Uh, safe administration of live vaccine given per the National Immunization Program. So we knew that biological disease modifying agent, including TNFs, are increasingly used during a pregnancy over the last few decades for a variety of autoimmune conditions. And there are limited data available regarding their safety through pregnancy, particularly in the third trimester. It triggers everybody not to give TNF during a pregnancy for a neonatal. Um, a neutropenia has made many practitioners defer live attenuated vaccine from the routine schedule. And also the international guidelines still recommend holding most TNF inhibitors for several half-lives uh, before delivery uh, due to the significant levels found in the neonate. Many mothers are advised to adjust the immunization schedule uh, of, the, of their infant accordingly. And recent accumulating data from IBD in a pregnancy started to support the safety of map use throughout pregnancy. And due to paucity actually of data in this regard, we have applied this study. 
So what we did, it was a retrospective data sheet collection from electronic record of two registries from IBD and Dermatology Clinic at the largest tertiary hospital in Qatar, which is Hamad Medical Corporation. All data are standardized in an electronic health system. We included all women who completed their pregnancies on biologics, so a minimum of three months of biologic use during pregnancy. And this is very important because if you read most of the data, either the patient was on biologics, either before starting pregnancy or the first few weeks and stopped. But uh, the longest duration uh, was very minimum in a lot of studies. Cases of abortion, injury, trauma, fetal death, and neonatal death were excluded. And actually, we have analyzed the clinical data of infants who were six months of age or older after delivery. And we run a descriptive analysis using SPPS uh, software. So what did we have? So we identified 30 completed pregnancies on TNF blockers. Out of these, 25 infants were more than six months of an age. Maternal age at the pregnancy was 29.5 years. And the underlying autoimmune disease, 13, were having inflammatory bowel disease, seven rheumatoid arthritis, two psoriatic arthritis, and the three spondyloarthropathy. TNF inhibitors were used, uh, infliximab seven, and most of those patients were inflammatory bowel disease, five on adalimumab, two on etanercept, and 10 on sertuluzumab. The mean duration of TNF inhibitor use during pregnancy was 6.8 months, so an average between five to a nine months. So some of the patients were throughout the pregnancies were on TNF, and this is the strength of this data. TNF inhibitors were taken throughout pregnancies in 15 cases. So including six on Semzia sertuluzumab, four on anafliximab, and two adalimumab. In two pregnancies, etanercept was taken for seven months, then followed by the sertuluzumab until birth. And most probably why this happened, because we knew that the transplacental passage of sertuluzumab is almost zero uh, uh, from the CRIB uh, study, uh, and uh, that it is the safest um, biologics during pregnancy, specifically in the third trimester. Mean gestational age at birth was 36.8, prematurity was recorded in seven cases, and low birth weight was in one case. Two neonates required in ICU admission for um, ARDS. Five cases of neonatal jaundice were identified and there was no congenital anomalies reported. What about immunization? Live attenuated vaccine uh, were given for 13 infants. So 52% were given uh, live attenuated vaccine at birth in spite that there was a lot of an education done for the mothers or they, both the mother and the father during the clinic, that they need to defer the immunization up to six months of live attenuated vaccine. But it happened, given that the culture, the way that the people live uh, in this part of the world. And 17 uh, babies, 68% received rotavirus at two months, and we have 46% and 12 infants received rota two at four months. And we have um, a 12 infant received MMR at one year. So there was no complication related to vaccination were recorded. So what about infection during infancy? Mean number of an infection encounter during uh, infancy were two encounters. Infections reported were upper respiratory tract infections, bronchiolitis and otitis media, not record hospitalization. One infant at two months of age got COVID-19 mild infections where mother at that time was infected and the mother was on sertuluzumab throughout her pregnancy and she was breastfeeding and both mother and baby were fine. So in conclusion to this abstract, we identified high rates of an infant who received live attenuated vaccines for the National Immunization Program without complications. This observation was also associated with higher rate of maternal TNF inhibitor use throughout pregnancy, and there was no alarming concern of repeated infections reported in this study. So this is telling us that maybe we need to look again at the immunization program for the infants who their mother are receiving TNF blockers at the third trimester. Now I'm going to switch gear to a COVID-19 and the pregnancy, which is a hot topic and we don't have a lot of literature. So since the emergence of severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus, 
causing um, COVID-19 pandemic. Particularly, pregnant women have received attention for being at high risk for increased morbidity and mortality in the general population. There was a higher odds for intensive care admission in a pregnant woman, regular pregnant woman here we are saying, and invasive ventilation with an odd ratio of 2.5. The most prominent perinatal adverse event in women with COVID-19 was found to be a preterm delivery with an odd ratio of 1.47. So what do we have data with regard to women with autoimmune disease who got COVID? So the first paper came out, and this was just a web-based, actually, paper um, uh, survey uh, done uh, from a single center in New York, evaluated the impact of COVID-19 in a pregnant patient with rheumatic diseases. It reported a similar prevalence among pregnant and non-pregnant women uh, to the center. It also found that the perinatal care was impacted in many of these patients. And all of us, we knew at the beginning of the COVID, a lot of the consultations were impacted by either teleconsult, a lot of ultrasound were uh, uh, delayed uh, for the, those uh, pregnant uh, patients because of the visit to the hospital. What about uh, a Global Rheumatology Alliance? So um, we were part actually of the Global Rheumatology Alliance and also we were part of this uh, paper for the pregnancy as we, uh, as we gave them 11 pregnant women with COVID. So the Global Rheumatology Alliance has studied the outcome of women with rheumatic diseases who were pregnant at the time of an infection with coronavirus. <coughs> the GRA database of rheumatic patients, for the people who doesn't know, it includes information about pregnancy and further obstetric details and outcome were gathered from referring physicians. So it is a RITCAP uh, web page registry that we need to fill all the information in. The data set included 39 women pregnant with COVID-19, from which 22 had further obstetric details. The mean age was around 33 years. Their rheumatic diseases included rheumatoid arthritis in 9, lupus in 9, PSA and inflammatory arthroiditis in 8, and antiphospholipid in 6 pregnant women. So COVID and pregnancy from the GRA data, what they found, the outcome was live birth in 16 out of 22, preterm birth in three, there was one termination of pregnancy and there was one miscarriage. Hospitalization, 10 out of 39 of the pregnant women were hospitalized uh, following COVID-19 diagnosis. Uh, only two actually uh, required supplemental oxygen. There was no death, which is really reassuring and uh, this was a very important message for the rheumatologists across the world, and 82% did not receive any specific COVID uh, treatment. Anti-rheumatic use um, for those patients, uh, seven patients included some of the following anti-malarial, colchicine, anti-interleukin, uh, one beta iso, um, azithromycin, glucocorticoid, and a few of them received uh, the antiviral. And in their conclusion, this is a small cohort failed to identify any significant or aberrant increase in adverse pregnancy, pregnancy outcome among a pregnant rheumatic patient infected with COVID-19. And it should be noted that non-rheumatic pregnant patients have been reported to have an increased adverse pregnancy outcome. So further study is advised. The limitation of this is that they did not have enough information about the pregnant women with autoimmune rheumatic disease, and they did not have a lot of an information on the um, uh, outcome of the babies. So what we did in Qatar, our local data, our rationale was that there is significant positive data regarding the impact of COVID-19 on pregnant women with autoimmune rheumatic disease. So we examined the maternal and fetal outcome in this high-risk group of patients during the first wave of COVID-19 pandemic in Qatar. So this cohort was a cross-sectional uh, study from March 2020 till December of 2020. It was conducted again uh, in our center. There was a consecutive patient visiting the center for follow-up during pregnancy were surveyed on COVID-19 through telephonic interviews and some patients were coming to the clinic. And this was where the restriction of patient visit to the hospital was there. Data on COVID-19 and the pregnancy outcome were extracted from electronic hospital record. So we had 80 pregnant women with autoimmune rheumatic disease included. Among them, 
A 21 diagnosed with COVID-19. The incidence of an infection occurred mostly in the second and third trimester of the pregnancy. Most women were tested because of contact tracing after close contact with an infected patient, and all of them were PCR positive. So the baseline characteristic for pregnant women during the COVID-19 pandemic, so we compared mothers with autoimmune disease who did have COVID positive and mothers with non-COVID positive. And there was no difference in disease duration or uh, disease activity. Also, uh, if you can see here that there is no difference in the type of medication, including hydroxychloroquine, 84 to 58%, sulfasalazine, almost 17% in both, azothyperin, uh, maybe more in the positive cases, glucocorticoid, actually uh, almost the same, uh, and anti-TNF, 12.7% in um, negative mothers and 11.8% in positive mothers. The majority actually of those patients were uh, asymptomatic. However, all of them developed mild symptoms later. Only one required hospitalization and intensive care unit admission. What about the obstetric and fetal complication in women with rheumatic diseases? If we compare both actually, we can find that there was no difference between eclampsia. Uh, there was no difference in fetal complication, including miscarriage, stillbirth, or healthy infant. In the pregnancy outcome, actually, we had a premature rupture of membrane, and it was statistically significant. And mode of delivery, uh, there was no uh, differences between uh, the two. Regarding NICU admission, we had five admission for mothers with autoimmune disease who were negative for COVID in comparison to one, and it was statistically significant. And there was one baby with congenital anomalies um, with a mother who is negative for uh, uh, COVID. And as I said earlier, prematurity, there was uh, a 19.4% and cesarean section 41% were most uh, prevalent adverse event. So we concluded from this, this is one of the first few studies to report the outcome of a pregnancy in patient with autoimmune rheumatic disease during the COVID-19 pandemic. Despite the high proportion of COVID-19 among patients, neither the presence of symptoms nor the underlying rheumatic disease or its treatment resulted in increased adverse maternal or pregnancy outcome. This observation may reassure pregnant women with rheumatic disease during the uh, pandemic. And the most important thing that we think that keeping the patient on disease remission during the pandemic was one of the key factors. We did not stop their medication. We advised them to continue their medication. We were behind them uh, through telephone consult or inpatient visit to the clinic to have the best outcome of their uh, pregnancy. So to take home message out of all of this, in general, in a pregnancy and rheumatic diseases, you need to educate patients early and often. No and recommend appropriate contraception that I did not um, uh, go through this part because I concentrated on the local data. Uh, you need to rule out serious underlying disease related damage because patient entering a pregnancy with either end stage renal disease or end organ damage, they will have a worse outcome. Timing is a critical, best maternal and fetal outcome is with a quiescent disease at conception. You need to review frequently the medication, either prior pregnancy or during pregnancy to have a compatible pregnancy related medications. Counsel patients, don't forget the partner because they need to give a huge support for their wives and close monitoring with your primary rheumatologist, obstetrician and other subspeciality if needed. At the end, I would like to acknowledge my team for their hard work and collecting the data, including Dr. Iman Sati, she is a consultant rheumatologist. Dr. Anawal, she is an associate consultant rheumatologist and our hero, actually, I can say, our research coordinator, uh, Ms. Hadil uh, Ashur, for her um, uh, didactic and like a huge work just filling our um, registry of the pregnancy. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to take any uh, question.
Thank you, uh, Dr. Samar, for the extensive review about uh, basically pregnancy connected tissue disease, COVID 19 pandemic. I think what you have done is great work, and I think it's, uh, it's a lesson in the GCC. We can learn that we can do our own research, probably it's better so it for our patient rather than always uh, rely on other studies. I think it's very great work. Uh, I will start with the question here, if you don't mind. Uh, somebody is asking, what do you mean by the immunization? I think he missed what you mean by the immunization. So if you okay. can elaborate yeah. more about the vaccination and immunization of the child. Well, what we are talking about here, if the mother is taking a TNF blockers at the third trimester, depending on what type of the uh, TNF blockers that she's taking, then you need to delay the immunization of the infant at least six months only the life attenuated vaccines. And we don't have a lot of life attenuated vaccines. So the three most important vaccines are the BCG, that if the mother was on TNF till the day of delivery, it, this should be delayed to avoid the risk of an infection that it's only reported only one time in the past with infliximab and it was BCG dissemination. And also to delay the um, um, the GI, the rota virus, uh, uh, the rota uh, vaccination. What you need to put in mind, if you don't give the child the rota virus on time, then there is no benefit of giving the rota um, uh, vaccination for the child after six months because the GI is already developed. So at that time, you're not going to prevent rota virus if you are going to give. Uh, rota uh, vaccination after six months, unless the patient is on a TNF blocker. <coughs> the requirement by the immunization is live attenuated vaccine for a mother who were on TNF blocker till the end of their delivery. Thank you. I have a question myself about hydroxychloroquine, or two questions actually in one. Uh, one, would you think that uh, probably the patient whom we know, because I mean, most of the patients with complete heart blockage basically who are unknown uh, rheumatic disease. Do you think that's because most of our patients in hydroxychloroquine or not? That's one. The second, did you look into your data whether there is a difference between, I mean, I know you said there is no much of heart block, but where is, there is a difference between giving hydroxychloroquine starting in advance of the pregnancy and whether the dose was the 200 milligram twice a day or the 400 daily or the 200 milligram OD or whether a difference when it was started or not? Okay, to start with, first of all, in our data, actually, most of the patients who are coming to the clinic, who are my patient actually, or are referred, day one, I start them if they are raw or lab positive, even with no symptoms, I start them on hydroxychloroquine. Regarding the dose, there are no definitive dose, which is better, the 200 or the 400, actually. There are nothing in the literature that tell you higher dose is better or a smaller dose is better because till today, I think all of us, we knew that this data is still to come out by Jill Bayer in a group that she is the one who's working on the dosage of a hydroxychloroquine and which dose that we are gonna give. So, but, but we have seen that um, retrospectively when we diagnose patient with Sjogren or rheumatoid because some of the people, they do have rheumatoid and secondary Sjogren, when they call us uh, from the fetal maternal that the uh, baby is having complete heart block. So what we, I do all the time, just do the row and laugh for the patient. And those are the patients who do have their babies, the congenital heart block. So I assume hydroxychloroquine does have a huge role in uh, preventing uh, congenital heart block in the babies. Because just, I have a lot of babies who had been diagnosed retrospectively their mothers when they were not on, uh, when they were not diagnosed, if we say with any connective tissue disease, the outcome was congenital heart block. But since then, after, since they are in our clinic, no single baby actually uh, developed a congenital heart block or a cutaneous lupus post delivery. Uh, I don't see any more, more question, and I think uh, I would like to thank Dr. Samar and uh, being the last chair of a session here. I think I would like to thank all the delegates and speakers for being uh, in this uh, conference. And I hope it was uh, to the level which is expected as if it is physical, although I doubt of that, but hopefully 
future will be better. Uh, I think it's, uh, I don't want anybody to leave because the chairman of the conference and uh, the chairman of the scientific committee is going to have a talk. And also they are going to announce the rewards for the abstract. So thank you all and wish you all the best. Thank you, thank you.
مساء الخير آه بعد ثلاثة أيام من العمل والمحاضرات وهكذا نشكركم على وجودكم معنا ولا آه شك أن هناك آه كثير من الأعمال قدمت لهذا المؤتمر ومن آه ضمن هذه الأعمال آه البحوث العلمية والأبستراكت والبوستر برزنتيشنز وعرضنا هذه الأعمال للتقييم لتحديد أفضلها وقام بهذا الجهد مشكورا دكتور طارق مع مجموعة من الزملاء من دول الخليج المختلفة وهو الآن إن شاء الله بصدد إعلامكم بالفائزين بقية هذه البحوث في مجال طب الأطفال وإن شاء الله سنعلن عنها لاحقا فلتفضل الأخ طارق مشكورا أخ طارق آه نعم دكتور آه علي آه اشكرك على ثقتك آه بنا في تنظيم هذا المؤتمر آه وقد قمنا باختيار آه افضل البحوث المشاركه آه في المؤتمر آه راح ابدا في الاعلان عنهم عن قريب آه ladies and gentlemen uh, it gives me a great pleasure uh, to announce uh, the um, uh, the best uh, actually uh, research Uh, oral presentations, as well as the best uh, poster uh, for the adult program, as well as the best research uh, for the uh, adult program as well. So uh, I would like to uh, announce and share uh, the uh, actually the results of uh, the selection process. Okay. So, um, so there'll be different categories of award in this conference uh, when it comes to the adult rheumatology research awards. So I'd like to start first for the awards of the oral presentations and uh, particularly for the rheumatoid arthritis session. And um, in the process was actually to have the shares uh, from uh, different uh, countries in the GCC actually nominating those uh, awardees. So the award for the rheumatoid arthritis or presentation session uh, goes to uh, so it goes to the uh, uh, presentation and the research titled as a long run relationship assessment of air pollutants on RA disease activity score DAS uh, 28 evidence from the VCAM approach. And the winner is Dr. Ahmed Saber from Kuwait. So great congratulations for great effort and actually great presentation. The next oral presentation um, award for the uh, spondyloarthritis and the psoriatic arthritis session goes to the um, research titled Association of Interleukin-6, Interleukin-13 and Tumor Necrosis Factor Alpha 
gene polymorphisms with psoriatic arthritis susceptibility in Kuwaiti patients. And the winner is Prof. Adil Al Awadi uh, from Kuwait. Great congratulations from the GCC Scientific Committee. For uh, the next, um, actually, oral presentation uh, session, uh, which is uh, systemic lupus, uh, the, uh, the uh, results of this uh, nominations in this session uh, and the oral presentation award uh, actually goes to the, uh, the research titled Multicenter Longitudinal Study of Prevalence and Mortality Rate of Systemic Lupus Erythematosus Patients in Oman, Oman Lupus Study. And the winner is Dr. Nasr al Udubi from uh, Oman. Um, actually, uh, great congratulations, uh, Dr. Nasr al Udubi. Uh, for this uh, great contribution to this conference. For the uh, next oral uh, presentation session, um, actually uh, the COVID and rheumatic disease research session. Uh, so uh, the, it was a very tough one uh, for the shares because uh, we had great actually uh, mm -hmm. contributions to this session. And this award goes to uh, point of prevalence of corona, uh, corona, uh, COVID-19 uh, in multi-ethnic cohorts of patients with autoimmune rheumatic diseases in Qatar. And the winner is Dr. Karima Bashati from Qatar. Uh, and congratulations. For the next session, um, which is the vasculitis session, uh, the award goes to uh, the uh, the title of um, presentation was Evaluating Bechet's Disease Activity Pattern uh, in the Context of Major Organ Involvement. And the winner is Dr. Lama Tamimi from Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. So great congratulations from, uh, for an amazing research product. So the next award for the Connective Tissue Disease Research Session goes to uh, the demographic data of patients with systemic sclerosis in Sultanate of Oman. And the winner is Dr. Shada Kindi from the Sultanate of Oman. So great congratulations for uh, such uh, a great product and for contribution to our conference. So we'll move on from the oral, actually, um, uh, oral presentation awards to the best poster award for the adult program. And the winner for this is the research titled Rate of Secondary HLH and Performance of H score in patients with severe COVID-19. And the winner is Dr. Faiz Zalem from Qatar. So great congratulations for uh, an interesting, actually, uh, research product in a form of poster. So finally, I would like to, to provide the award for the best adult program research award. For this award, we actually had three independent um, chairs to nominate it. And the criteria for selection was the novelty of the research, the re research methodology, as well as the outcomes and the results of an originality of this product. So uh, it gives me great pleasure to actually announce the winner of this award. And the winner uh, is um, Dr. Ahmed Asaber from Kuwait for the research titled Long Run Relationship of Assessment of Air Pollutants on RA Disease Activity, DAS 28, evidence from the VCAM approach, uh, given the novelty of this research in the region, as well as the conclusion and the rigorous methodology. So congratulations again, Dr. Ahmed Saab. So by this, we actually end up uh, our um, uh, awards uh, actually uh, session, and I will give the floor uh, uh, for the uh, Dr. Um, Ali for the closing ceremony.
راسهم باسي رفعوا لهم راسي فوق ارتفع شادة واللي عاف قرب انت بالعز شادة وانت فاخر على حبك رفعوا وجدانا يا اكبر واسمى فخار يا درس عزة يا عبار نقولها بالمختصر يا عماننا الله عليه قلوبنا لجلك تحن لو تشتكي كلنا نجي يا الله عليك يا أكبر وأسمى فخار يا ونقولها بالمختصر يا عماننا الله عليك من ضلع واحد هالوطان قلب اجتمعنا بحضن قلوبنا لجلك زملائي الكرام بصفتي رئيس الجمعية العمانية لأمراض الروماتيزم رئيس المؤتمر الثاني الخليجي لأمراض الروماتيزم أعلن رسميا بداية المؤتمر It's a pleasure to have you in this uh, workshop today. Hello, everybody. We can hear you, Lynn. Go ahead. وأخص بالشكر رئيس المؤتمر الدكتور علي الشراوي. Thank you very much. And this team actually is expanding. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. So I'd like to express my sincere gratitude to all the speakers. So you can see the program is really rich and packed with the most up-to-date scientific content. Um, this is my personal view of, of long term. Dr. Nashat, uh, thanks for the presentation. Dear colleagues, I hope that over the last three days you have learned and enjoy the lectures, workshops, and other seminars that was conducted during this conference. We thank you for your participation, for your enthusiasm, to attend as many of those lectures and presentation.
السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الزملاء والزميلات الكرام تتفقون معي أن خبراتنا الخليجية أظهرت قدراتها على مستوى عالي جدا في العرض والتحليل والبحث العلمي ومحتويات مؤتمر الخليج الثاني هذا عالية جدا والشكر موصول للمحاضرين ورؤساء الجلسات وجميع من ساهم في المؤتمر والشكر أيضا للجان التي وكلت إليها الواجبات المختلفة ونخص رؤساء هذه اللجان الدكتور طارق والدكتور ريم في اللجنة العلمية ونشكر بالأخص أيضا رؤساء الجمعيات الخليجية وهم متفقين على استمرارية فكرة المؤتمر الخليجي للروماتيزم وإن شاء الله سيكون المؤتمر الثالث في دولة الإمارات العربية المتحدة في سنة 2024 المرحلة القادمة هو التعاون في مجال البحث العلمي المشترك والتدريب في مجال الروماتيزم وتبادل الخبرات تدعوكم الرابطة السعودية للروماتيزم لمؤتمرها الثامن في المدينة المنورة بين التاسع والثاني عشر من مارس القادم كما تدعوكم لتقديم مقالاتكم للنشر في The Annals of Rheumatism التي بدأت في الصدور قبل بضعة أشهر كما نيابة, عن... نيابة عنكم نشكر الشركة المنظمة للمؤتمر التي أبدت نجاحا ممتازا في التقنية الفنية في نجاح الجلسات ونيابة عنا جميعا نشكر الشركات التي ساهمت بكثير في إنجاح هذا المؤتمر من الناحية المادية وكذلك في إنجاح المحاضرات التي كانوا مسؤولين عنها في الجلسات المختلفة وهذه الجلسات زادت من من قوة المؤتمر العلمية ولم تكن فقط إعلامية والأخ دكتور جمال صالح هو رئيس الجمعية الإماراتية للروماتيزم وسيحمل هذه المهمة للمؤتمر الخليجي وإن شاء الله أيضا الجمعية الخليجية لأمراض الروماتيزم في الفترة السنتين القادمتين ونرجو منكم أن تمدوا له يد العون في في النشاطات المختلفة التي ستقوم بها جمعية الإمارات لأمراض الروماتيزم والأخ جمال موجود معنا اليوم تفضل الأخ جمال أول شيء السلام عليكم جميعا ومشكور دكتور علي وأحب أشكر الأخوان في عمان فاتنا الحضور نشوفكم بالويه فيس تو فيس بس الحمد لله تواصل بال بال بالأجهزة الحمد لله تام طبعا أول شيء قبل ما نأخذ الأمانة نبغى نردها لأصحاب أول شيء بدأ الموضوع في الكويت وزهام الله خير الدكتور أديبة وفريق اللي معاها ما قصروا كمبادرة من الكويت وأنتوا خذيتوا الأول تحدي وهو التحدي إن خذيتوا في عمان كأول مؤتمر بعد الأبلا بعد الأرلار وكان صراحة تحدي قبته الواجب وكفيته نحن حين علينا مسؤولية أكبر لأن من خبرتنا السابقة يوم المؤتمرات تي دبي لازم تطلع على الأقل التوقعات أو أكثر وإن شاء الله بنكون قد المسؤولية فنرحب كلكم جميعا ببيتكم الثاني في دبي في الإمارات وإن شاء الله نقول عاد نكون على قد المسؤولية ما قصرتوا جزاك الله خير الأخ جمال 
بنيابة عن الجميع نشكر الجميع وفي أمان الله مشكورين مشكورين جزاكم الله خير أحسن شكرا جزيلا على الحضور إلى اللقاء Let's go. 
جمال انه الوقت كذا كذا وكذا وقلنا اوكي وانا بس كان المؤتمر كان المؤتمر يعني صاحب صاحب البضاعة ما يمدحها كان يتصلوا فينا صدقني ممتاز انت كيف كيف أنا أشوف المثيري الصراحة راقي أنا أنا قلت هذا في في الكلام الختامي إنه يعني الستاندرد أوف لكشرينج إز فيري هاي أحسن من حتى من اليولار والأي سي آر يعني الشباب يعني اجتهدوا they wanted to show up their best يعني في الكونتنت كانت عالية عالية جدا فـ وهذا اللي انا يعني سو فار عرفته من الفيدباك على مستوى رؤساء الجمعيات والناس اللي اعرفهم هكذا بس نحن دائما صاحب البضاعه دائما يخاف ان بضاعته ما زينه يعني اللي صارت بسيطة جدا لان انا حضرت الفيرشوال مال يولار والاي سي ار بالعكس يعني تتبهدل الين الين تشوف السشن وكذا يتقطع عنك وتصير مشاكل وهكذا وهم على مستوى يعني عالمي ويكلفوا كثير اللي واحد يحضر يعني نحن على الاقل ما كلفنا حد من الحضور اي اي ثمن يعني و يعني شكرا لجهودكم انكم يعني تواصلتوا مع الشركات المموله ومسكتوا اعصابكم وكذا في في اوقات يعني صعبه ما نعرف ايش نعمل بنسوي المؤتمر ولا ما بنسويه ولا بيكون فيرتشوال ولا فيزيكال يعني اشياء كثيره عملناها نحن من جهتي ومن جهتكم يعني ما انتهت يعني بس رميناها بعدين في الزباله الاتصال مع شركات الطيران والاتصال مع الفنادق ومدري ايش وتجميع الاشياء كان يعني كل هذا ما انحسب لان التغى فيزيكلي فبصراحه اشكركم يعني شكرا ان شاء الله تسووا تعملوا تعملوا اوفيس هني في مسقط ويعني ترى ممكن يعني يكون مسقط الان 
ريجنال سنتر في الكوميونيكيشن باي ذا واي كل الكابلات uh, اللي تروح ايست اسيا uh, واللي تكروس انتو يوروب ولا تروح افريكا كلها تجي عندنا عمان تل انفستد سو ماتش في هذا في النتورك انترناشونال نتورك ف يعني هيوج اماونت اوف داتا جوز ثرو اس فما عندنا مشكله في الكواليتي اوف كوميونيكيشنز وهذه الاشياء ف يعني وي كان سبورت يو ايفن اف يو and be partnered with you to if you wanted to make uh, an office in Muscat. Yeah. Uh, and silent or mass mag. Had khalak. Mass mass mag. Had mass mag the tasfiq. And ران كل ال يعني البنات صراحة ما قصرتوا ماريا ولين وسيدي ومن بعد كلكم بصراحة يعني يوير مبرسف يعني ف. واشتغلتوا ايضا مسكتوا اعصابكم يعني بعض الاحيان انا ارسل رسائل انتقادي شويه صعبه تو 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 انت هين انت هين انت هين لا هو هو دكتور طارق مشى معاكم حتى هذا يكلمكم باللهجه العاميه هي يقولكم هي مضروبة. انت اريدك تقرا القران يوم ذيك اليوم قلت لي انا سوره النخل ها اريدك تقرا شوي بالعربي هذيك سوره النحل يعني مش النخل اور تكنيكال تكنيكال دايركتور من End, yeah. It showed in the end. Exactly, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, the recording, Abud. بالنسبة للrecording. أنت قلت بتبقى هذه في فترة كذا معينة. Okay. صوتك صوتك. ممتاز وبالنسبه لل الويب سايت مال الاو اس ار انا ما شفته از ات ناو لايف فل وهكذا يس دكتور اوكي شكرا جزيلا شكرا لو كنتوا هنا كنا عزمناكم على عشاء على حسابنا لكن ترى انتم في لبنان شكرا
قولي يا عاد بروح اوكي شادي هلا اه نعم ده شاء I was on my toes uh, all the time, uh, <laughs> uh, which was uh, quite an experience. Yeah, and it's just my same. Thanks for working day and night. Uh, yeah, and it's just my. I've been having great comments about the conference. Uh, if, uh, you know, to work shows up. <laughs> Uh, I'm just so happy. Alhamdulillah, uh, it, it uh, end up with a good product. <coughs> <laughs> next week next week <laughs> okay, just introduce me to the, and I know Maria, you know, I, I know Leah very well.
السفريه ما يتعبها يو نو ما تسمعوني لا هلا عم نسمع هلا ماريا معي I know I did. Okay, but I really wanted a great product. I wanted to push you really hard. And then, uh, you know, it wasn't meant anything personal at all. It was to push you really hard to get this great product. So, you know, I think today we should all of us celebrate. Uh, you know, I'm getting great comments. The WhatsApp is almost about to explode. So, uh, you know, we're, we're so happy. But then videos are uh, really good. صراحة, يعني, the introductory videos. Uh, I think, you know, maybe the first day there was... هلا Who did the design? CME credit. My you friend, know? it's your team, yeah. it's the teamwork. And the last the job they give me <laughs> is to stop you a little bit. <laughs> Where the... I had to push. I had to push. I had to push. We have to push, right? Like, you know, yes. we need to push as much as we can, right? Uh, Akid. Akid. As I said. Akid.
Merci beaucoup, merci beaucoup. Oui. Et je t'aime beaucoup, je t'aime beaucoup. Je veux le coucher avec le. Marc, I hope you're not. Je veux le coucher avec moi ce soir. Je t'aime et je t'adore. I don't know what it is. Anyways.